Chapter 15, Part 2 of Gilbert Keith Chesterton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Candace Tuttle. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Macy Ward. Chapter 15, Part 2. A keen observer, often added to the Beaconsfield community in those days, was Father, now Monsignor, John O'Connor, close friend of both Gilbert and Francis, and inspirer of Father Brown, of detective fame. They had first become friends in 1904, when they met at the house of a friend in Keithley, Yorkshire, and walked back over the moors together to visit Francis Steinthal at Ilkley. This Jew of Frankfurt descent was a great friend of the Chestertons, and on their many visits to him, the friendship with Father O'Connor ripened. With both Francis and Gilbert, it was among the closest of their lives. Their letters to him show it. The long talks and companionable walks over the moors have an atmosphere of intimacy that is all the more convincing because so little stressed in his book. Father O'Connor has a pardonable pride in the idea that their talks suggested ideas to Gilbert. He takes pleasure in his character of Father Brown, but he reveals the atmosphere of unique confidence and intimacy by the very absence of all parade of it. Both he and Gilbert have told the story of how the idea of the detective priest first dawned. On their second meeting, Father O'Connor had startled, indeed almost shattered Gilbert, with certain rather lurid knowledge of human depravity, which he had acquired in the course of his priestly experience. At the house to which they were going, two Cambridge undergraduates spoke disparagingly of the cloistered habits of the Catholic clergy, saying that to them, it seemed that to know and meet evil was a far better thing than the innocence of such ignorance. To Gilbert, still under the shock of a knowledge compared with which these two Cambridge gentlemen knew about as much of real evil as two babies in the same perambulator. The exquisite irony of this remark suggested a thought. Why not a whole comedy of cross purposes based on the notion of a priest with a knowledge of evil deeper than that of the criminal he is converting? He carried out this idea in the story of the Blue Cross, the first Father Brown detective story. Father O'Connor's account adds the details that he had himself once boasted of buying five sapphires for five shillings, and that he always carried a large umbrella and many brown paper parcels. At the Steinthal dining table, an artist friend of the family made a sketch of Father O'Connor which later appeared on the wrapper of The Innocence of Father Brown. Beyond one or two touches of this sort, the idea had been a suggestion for a character, not a portrait, and in the autobiography, and in the Dickens, Gilbert had a good deal to say of interest to the novelist about how suggestions come and are used. He never believed that Dickens drew a portrait, as it were, in the round, Nature just gives hints to the creative artist. And it used to amuse Father Brown to find that such touches of observation as noting where an ashtray had got hidden behind a book seemed to Gilbert quasi-miraculous. Left to himself, he merely dropped ashes on the floor from his cigar. He did not smoke a pipe, and cigarettes were prone to set him on fire in one place or another. A frequent visitor, Father O'Connor noted his fashion of work and reading, and the abstracted way he often moved and spoke. Call it mooning, but he never mooned. He was always working out something in his mind. And when he drifted from his study to the garden, and was seen making deadly passes with his sword stick at the dahlias, he knew that he had got to a dead end in his composition, and was getting his thoughts into order. He played often, too, with a huge knife, which he had for twenty-four years. He took it abroad with him, took it to bed, 
Francis had to retrieve it often from under his pillow in some hotel. Once, at a lecture in Dublin, he drew it absent-mindedly to sharpen a pencil. As it was seven and a half inches long shut and fourteen open, the amusement of the audience may be imagined. In origin, it was, Father O'Connor relates, a Texan or Mexican general utility implement. It was with this knife that he won my daughter's heart many years later, when she, aged three, had not seen him for some time and had grown shy of him. A little scared of his enormousness, she stood far off. He did not look in her direction, but began to open and shut the vast blade. Next, she was on his knee. A little later, we heard her remark, Uncle Gilbert, you make jokes just like my daddy. And from him came, I do my best. The prototype of Father Brown tells of the easy job in detection when Gilbert had been reading a book. He had just been reading a shilling pamphlet by Dr. Horton on the Roman menace or some such fearful wild fowl. I knew he had read it because no one else could when he had done. Most of his books, as and when read, had gone through every indignity a book may suffer and live. He turned it inside out, dog-eared it, penciled it, sat on it, took it to bed and rolled on it, and got up again and spilled tea on it, if he were sufficiently interested. So Dr. Horton's pamphlet had a refuted look when I saw it. Father O'Connor was not the only friend who was added to the Beaconsfield group with some frequency. It was easy enough to run down from London, or over from Welwyn, home of GBS, or from Oxford, or Cambridge. It was most conveniently central. Gilbert's brethren of the pen were especially apt to appear at all seasons, and always found friendly welcome. For he continued to call himself neither poet, nor philosopher, but journalist. Father O'Connor had tried to persuade him, as he neatly puts it, to begin to print on handmade paper with gilt edges. But Francis begged him to drop the idea. You will not change Gilbert. You will only fidget him. He is bent on being a jolly journalist to paint the town red, and he does not need style to do that. All he wants is buckets and buckets of red paint. Journalists coming down from London describe the jolly welcome. Beer poured, the sword stick flourished, conversation flowing as freely as the beer. It meant a pleasant afternoon, and it meant good copy. They visited him in the country. They observed him in town. One interviewer returned with a photo which showed Chesterton in a somewhat negligee condition. The result, as he admitted, of reading W.W. Jacobs, rolling about on the floor, waving his legs in the air. He was seen working a swan boat at the White City. He collapsed it, and the placid lake became a raging sea. He was seen thinking, and even reading under the strangest weather conditions. One man saw him under a gas lamp in the street, in pouring rain, with an open book in his hand. Reading in Fleet Street one day, Gilbert discovered suddenly that the Lord Mayor's show was passing. He began to reflect on the show so deeply that he forgot to look at it. Over Rhodes, I remember, as a little triangular house, much too small for the sort of fun the Chestertons enjoy. Francis bought a field opposite to it, and there built a studio. The night the studio was opened, Father O'Connor remembers a large party at which charades were acted. He himself, as Canon Cross Keys, gave away the word so that Belfry was loudly shouted by the opposition group. The rival company, acting torture, got away with it successfully, especially, complains our Yorkshire priest, as Ur was pronounced yaw in the best southern manner. On that night, returning to the house, Father O'Connor offered his arm to Gilbert, who refused it with a finality foreign to our friendship. Father O'Connor went on ahead and Gilbert, following in the dark, stumbled over a flower pot and broke his arm. Perhaps because his size made him self-consciously aware of his awkwardness, Gilbert hated being helped. 
Father Ignatius Rice, another close friend, says the only time he ever saw Gilbert annoyed was when he offered him an arm going upstairs. Gilbert and Francis would both visit Father O'Connor in his Yorkshire parish of Heckmondwike. One year they took rooms at Ilkley, and he remembers Gilbert adorning with huge frescoes the walls of the attic, and Francis sitting in the window singing, Oh, Swallow, Swallow, Flying South, while Gilbert did a blazon of some fantastic coat of arms. The closeness of the intimacy is seen in a letter quoted by Father O'Connor, in which Gilbert explained why Francis and he were unable to come to Heckmondwike for a promised visit. July 3rd, 1909. I would not write this to anyone else, but you combine so unusually in your own single personality the characters of one, priest, two, human being, three, man of the world, four, man of the other world, five, man of science, six, old friend, seven, new friend, not to mention Irishman and picture dealer, that I don't mind suggesting the truth to you. Francis has just come out of what looked bad enough to be an illness, and is just going to plunge into another one of her recurrent problems of pain and depression. The two may just be a bit too much for her, and I want to be with her every night for a few days. There's an Irish bull for you. One of the mysteries of marriage, which must be a sacrament, and an extraordinary one too, is that a man evidently useless like me can become, at certain instants, indispensable. And a further oddity, which I invite you to explain on mystical grounds, is that he never feels so small as when he knows that he is necessary. But sometimes she would send him off, whether she was well or ill, and on Father O'Connor would rest the heavy responsibility of getting him on to his next destination, or safe back home. He tells of one such experience. He was most dutiful and obedient to orders, but they had to be written ones and backed by the spoken word. He brought his dress suit, oh, with what loving care, to Bradford on Sunday, for Sheffield on Monday. But a careful host found it under the bed in Bradford, just as his train left for Sheffield. Sent at once it was to Beaconsfield, where it landed at 5 p.m. on Thursday, just allowing him 10 minutes to change and in train for London. Scene at Beaconsfield. What on earth have you done with your dress suit, Gilbert? I must have left it behind, darling, but I brought back the ties, didn't I? Another time he came back without his pajamas. They had been lost early in the journey. Why didn't you buy some more? His wife asked. I didn't know pajamas were things you could buy, he said, surprised. Probably, if one were Gilbert, one couldn't. Father O'Connor, arriving at Overroads without baggage, found that Gilbert's pajamas went round him exactly twice. Lecturing engagements had, of course, not come to an end with the moon, although they had mercifully somewhat lessened. What increased with the distance from London was the problem never fully solved, of getting Gilbert to the right place, at the right time, and in clothes not too wildly wrong. When he lectured in Lancashire, they stayed at Crosby with Francis Blundell, my brother-in-law, and my sister remembers Francis as incessantly looking through her bag for letters and sending telegrams to confirm engagements that had come unstuck or to refuse others that were in debate. The celebrated, and now almost legendary, telegram from Gilbert to Francis, told as from a hundred different cities, was really sent, Am in Market Harbor, where ought I to be? Desperate, she wired, home, because as she told me later, it was easier to get him home and start him off again. That day's engagement was lost past recall. Charles Rowley, of the Ancoats Brotherhood, received a wire, reply paid, from Snow Hill Station, Birmingham. Am I coming to you tonight or what? Reply. Not this Tuesday, but next Wednesday. 
So, home he came again to Overroad. The Chestertons made a host of friends in Beaconsfield, but the children always held pride of place. The doctor's little boy, running along the top of the wall, looked down at Gilbert and remarked to his delight, I think you're an ogre. But when the nurse was heard threatening punishment if he did not get down that minute, the child was told by the ogre, this wall is meant for little boys to run along. One child, asked after a party if Mr. Chesterton had been very clever, said, you should see him catch buns in his mouth. What was unusual, both with Gilbert and Francis, was the fact that they never allowed their disappointment in the matter of children to make them sour or jealous of others who had the joy that they had not. All through their lives, they played with other people's children. They chose on a train compartment full of children. They planned amusements. They gave presents to the children of their friends. Over my son's bed, hangs a silver crucifix, chosen with loving care by Francis after Gilbert had stood godfather to him, and he was one of very many. Gilbert was, however, a complete realist as to the ways and manners of the species he so loved. Playing with children, he wrote at this time, is a glorious thing, but the journalist in question has never understood why it was considered a soothing or idyllic one. It reminds him, not of watering little budding flowers, but of wrestling for hours with gigantic angels and devils. Moral problems of the most monstrous complexity besiege him incessantly. He has to decide, before the awful eyes of innocence, whether, when a sister has knocked down a brother's bricks, in revenge for the brother having taken two sweets out of his turn, it is endurable that the brother should retaliate by scribbling on the sister's picture book, and whether such conduct does not justify the sister in blowing out the brother's unlawfully lit match. Just as he is solving this problem upon principles of the highest morality, it occurs to him suddenly that he has not written his Saturday article and that there is only about an hour to do it in. He wildly calls to somebody, probably the gardener, to telephone to somewhere for a messenger. He barricades himself in another room and tears his hair, wondering what on earth he shall write about. A drumming of fists on the door outside and a cheerful bellowing encourage and clarify his thoughts. He sits down desperately. The messenger rings at the bell. The children drum on the door. The servants run up from time to time to say the messenger is getting bored. And the pencil staggers along, making the world a present of 1,500 unimportant words and making Shakespeare a present of a portion of Gray's elegy, putting fantastic roots wreathed high instead of antique roots peep out. Then the journalist sends off his copy and turns his attention to the enigma of whether a brother should commandeer a sister's necklace because the sister pinched him at Little Hampton. In the notebook, he had written, North Berwick. On the sands I romped with children. Do you blame me that I did not improve myself by bottling anemones? But I say that these children will be men and women. And I say that the anemones will not be men and women. Not just yet, at least, let us say. And I say that the greatest men of the world might romp with children, and that I should like to see Shakespeare romping with children, and Browning and Darwin romping with children, and Mr. Gladstone romping with children, and Professor Huxley romping with children and all the bishops romping with children. And I say that if a man had climbed to the stars and found the secrets of the angels, the best thing and the most useful thing he could do would be to come back and romp with children. MV, an almost elvish little girl, 
with loose brown hair doing needlework. I have spoken to her once or twice. I think I must get another book of the same size as this to make notes about her. From the Christmas party at Overrose, all adults were excluded. No nurses, no parents. The children would hang on Gilbert's neck in an ecstasy of affection, and he and Francis schemed out endless games for them. Gilbert had started a toy theater before he left London, cutting out and painting figures and scenery, and devising plots for plays. Two of the favorites were St. George and the Dragon and the Seven Champions of Christendom. The atmosphere of Overroads is perhaps best conveyed through Gilbert's theories concerning his toy theater and the other theatricals, such as charades sometimes played there. When it came to the toy theater set up to amuse the children, he frankly felt that he was himself child number one and got the most amusement out of it. He felt, too, that the whole thing was good enough to be worth analyzing in its rules and its effects. And so he drew up a paper of rules and suggestions for its use. I will not say positively that a toy theater is the best of theaters, though I have had more fun out of it than out of any other. But I will say positively that the toy theater is the best of all toys. It sometimes fails, but generally because people are mistaken in the matter of what it is meant to do and what it can or cannot be expected to do, as if people should use a toy balloon as a football or a skipping rope as a hammock. Now the first rule may seem rather contradictory, but it is quite true and really quite simple. In a small theater, because it is a small theater, you cannot deal with small things. Because it is a small theater, it must only deal with large things. You can introduce a dragon, but you cannot really introduce an earwig. It is too small for a small theater. And this is true, not only of small creatures, but of small actions, small gestures, and small details of any kind. All your effects must be made to depend on things like scenery and background. The sky and the clouds and the castles and the mountains and so on must be the exciting things, along with other things that move all of a piece, such as regiments and processions. Great and glorious things can be done with processions. In a real comedy, the whole excitement may consist in the nervous curate dropping his teacup, though I do not recommend this incident for the drama of the drawing room. But if he were nervous, let us say, about a thunderstorm, the toy theater could hardly represent the nervousness, but it might manage the thunderstorm. It might be quite sensational and yet entirely simple, for it would largely consist of darkening the stage and making horrible noises behind the scenes. The second and smaller rule that really follows from this is that everything dramatic should depend not on a character's action, but simply on his appearance. Shakespeare said of actors that they have their exits and their entrances, but these actors ought really to have nothing else except exits and entrances. The trick is to so arrange the tale that the mere appearance of a person tells the important truth about him. Thus, supposing the drama to be about St. George, let us say, the mere abrupt appearance of the dragon's head, if of a proper ferocity, will be enough to explain that he intends to eat people. And it will not be necessary for the dragon to explain at length, with animated gestures and playful conversation, that his nature is carnivorous and that he has not merely dropped in to tea. There is some further discussion on color effects. I like very gay and glaring colors, and I like to give them a good chance to glare. The paper concludes on a more serious note. It is an old story, and for some a sad one, that in a sense these childish toys are more to us than they can ever be to children. 
We never know how much of our after imaginations began with such a peep show into paradise. I sometimes think that houses are interesting because they are so like dollhouses. And I am sure that the best thing that can be said for many large theaters is that they may remind us of little theaters. I do not look back. I look forward to this kind of puppet play. I look forward to the day when I shall have time to play with it. Someday, when I am too lazy to write anything, or even to read anything, I shall retire into this box of marvels, and I shall be found still striving, hopefully, to get inside a toy theater. Adults as well as children enjoyed this toy, and it was often described by interviewers. Like the sword stick, the great cloak and flapping hat, it was felt by some to be Gilbert's way of attracting attention. But it was just one of Gilbert's ways of amusing himself. A small nephew of Francis was living with them at the time, and it was funny to watch him fencing with his huge uncle, who was obviously enjoying himself rather the more of the two. On my first visit to Overroads, I noticed how as we talked, my host's pencil never ceased. One evening, I collected and kept an imposing red Indian and a caricature of Chesterton himself in a wheelbarrow being carried off to a bonfire. I came in, too, for one of the grown-up parties in which guessing games were a feature. Lines from the poets were illustrated, and we had to guess them. At another party, Dr. Pocock told me G.K. did the Inns of Beaconsfield of which the most successful drawing was that of a sadly dilapidated dragon being turned away from the inn door. Dragon discovers with disgust that he cannot put up at the George. Sometimes these drawings were the prize of whoever guessed the line of verse they illustrated. Sometimes they were sold for a local charity. The baby's convalescent home was a favorite object, and one admirable picture reproduced in the colored lands, shows the despair of King Herod at discovering children convalescing from the massacre. The two closest friendships of early Beaconsfield life were with the rector, Mr. Comerline, and his wife, who are now dead, and Dr. and Mrs. Pocock. Dr. Pocock was the Chesterton's doctor, as well as their friend, and he tells me that his great difficulty in treating Gilbert lay in his detachment from his own physical circumstances. If there was anything wrong with him, he usually didn't notice it. He was the most uncomplaining person. You had to hunt him all over to find out if anything was wrong. This detachment from circumstances still extended to his appearance, and Francis one day begged Dr. Pocock to take him to a good tailor. It was a huge success, he had never looked so well as he did now, for a few weeks. And then the tailor said to Dr. Pocock, Mr. Chesterton has broken my heart. It took twice the material and twice the time to make for him, but I was proud of it. His tailor, like his doctor, was apt to become a friend. Mrs. Pocock recalls how he would go to a dinner of the tradesmen of Beaconsfield and come back intensely interested and wanting to tell her all about it. You always went away, Dr. Pocock said, chuckling over something. And he summed up the years of their friendship, saying, you never saw him without getting delight from his presence. Sometimes he would grow abstracted in the train of his own thought. And Father Ignatius Rice remembers an occasion when he was one of a group discussing really bad lines of poetry. Gilbert broke into something Francis was saying with the words, that irritating person Milton. Then realizing that he had interrupted her, he broke off and apologized profusely. When she had finished, he went on, that irritating person Milton. I can't find a single bad line in him. Francis one day came in rather suddenly when Dr. Pocock was there, and Gilbert exclaimed, oh, you've broken it. She looked round, thinking she must have knocked something over. No, he said, it was an idea. It will come back, Francis said. 
No, he said. It got broken. More usually, he was indifferent to interruptions. Sometimes he welcomed them as grist for his mind's mill. Daily life went on around him, and often in his articles, one can find traces of Francis's daily activities, as well as his own. Attending him for his broken arm, Dr. Pocock told him at a certain stage to write something, anything, to see if he could use a pen again. After an instant's thought, Gilbert headed his paper with the name of a prominent Jew and wrote, I am fond of Jews. Jews are fond of money, never mind of whose. I am fond of Jews. Oh, but when they lose, damn it all, it's funny. The name at the head, which wild horses would not drag from me, is the key to this impromptu. It was really true that Gilbert was fond of very many Jews. In his original group of JDC friends, four Jews had been included, and with three of these, his friendship continued through life. Lawrence Solomon and his wife were among the Beaconsfield neighbors, and he saw them often. There was another kind of Jew he very heartily disliked, but he was at great pains to draw this distinction himself. Speaking at the Jewish West End Literary Society in 1911, he put the question of what the real Jewish problem was. The Jews, he said, were a race born civilized. You never met a Jewish clod or yokel. They represented one of the highest of civilized types. But while all the other races had local attachments, the Jews were universal and scattered. They could not be expected to have patriotism for the countries in which they made their homes. Their patriotism could be only for their race. In principle, he believed in the solution of Zionism. And then the reporter in large letters made a headline. Mr. Chesterton said that speaking generally, as with most other communities, the poor Jews were nice and the rich were nasty. Many years later, in Palestine, he was to be driven around the country, as he described in the New Jerusalem, by one of these less wealthy Jews who had sacrificed his career in England to his national idealism. And later yet, after G.K.'s death, Rabbi Wise, a leader of American Jewry, paid him a tribute. In a letter to Cyril Clements, dated September 8, 1937, Indeed, I was a warm admirer of Gilbert Chesterton. Apart from his delightful art and his genius in many directions, he was, as you know, a great religionist. He as Catholic, I as Jew, could not have seen eye to eye with each other. And he might have added, particularly seeing that you are cross-eyed. But I deeply respected him. When Hitlerism came, he was one of the first to speak out with all the directness and frankness of a great and unabashed spirit. Blessing to his memory. By Dick Bourgeois Doyle. Chapter 16. A Circle of Friends. In the last chapter, this chapter, and to a considerable extent those that follow, down to the break made by Gilbert's illness and the War of 1914, it is unavoidable that the same years should be retraced to cover a variety of aspects, for their home was, for both Gilbert and Francis, the center of a widening circle. Although I visited Overroads, it seems to me, looking back, I saw them just then much more frequently in London and elsewhere. Several times they stayed at Lotus, our Surrey home. The first time, it was a weekend of blazing summer weather. Lady Blenner Hassett was there, formerly Countess Layden and a favorite disciple of Dollinger, I remember she delighted Gilbert by her comment on modernism. I must, she said, have the same religion as my washerwoman, and Father Tyrrell's is not the religion for my washerwoman. We sat on the terrace in the sunshine, and Lady Blenner Hassett asked suddenly whether the soles of our boots were, like hers, without hole or blemish. We all looked very odd, as we stuck out our feet and tried to see the soles. Gilbert, offered a wicker chair, preferred the grass, because, he said, 
There was grave danger he might unduly modify the chair. After a meeting of the Westminster Dining Society, the predecessor of the Wiseman, he wrote my mother an unnecessary apology. Dear Mrs. Wilfred Ward, I have wanted for some days past to write to you, but could not make up my mind whether I was making my position worse or better. But I do want to apologize to you for the way in which I threw out your delightful Catholic Dining Society affair the other day. I behaved badly, dined badly, debated badly, and left badly. Yet the explanation is really simple. I was horribly worried, and I do not worry well. When I am worried, I am like a baby. My wife was that night just ill enough to make a man nervous, a stupid man, and I had sworn to her that I would fulfill some affairs that night on which she was keen. As she is better now and only wants to rest, I feel normal and realize what a rotter I must have looked that night. As Belloc wrote in a beautiful epitaph, he frequently would flush with fear when other people paled. He tried to do his duty, but how damnably he failed. This is the epitaph of yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. My father and mother were hardly less excited than I at the discovery of the greatest man of the age, for so we all felt him to be. Gilbert later described my father as strongly cooperative with another's mind, and this was perhaps his own chief characteristic in conversation. The two men did not agree on politics, but on religion their agreement was deep and constantly grew deeper as they cooperated in exploring it. Our headquarters were in Surrey, but when we came up to London every spring my parents wanted to bring the Chestertons in touch with all their friends. They tended to think of their luncheon table as Chesterton supported by those most worthy of the honor. One of the first was, of course, George Wyndham, already a friend and admirers of Gilbert's. At this luncheon, they discussed the modern press, 18th century lampoons, the ingredients of a good English style, the lawfulness of revolution, the causes of Napoleon, scripture criticism, Joan of Arc, public executions, how to bring about reforms. It was absurd, G.K. said, to think that gaining half a reform led to the other half. Supposing it was agreed that every man ought to have a cow, but you say, we can't manage that just yet. Give him half a cow. He doesn't care for it, and he leaves it about, and he never asks for the other half. Talking of the Eastern and Western races, Gilbert said it was curious that while the Easterns were so logical and clear in their religion, they were so unpractical in everyday life. The religion of the Westerns is mystical and full of paradoxes, yet they are far more practical. The Eastern says, Fate governs everything, and he sits and looks pretty. We believe in free will and predestination, and we invent Babbage's calculating machine. As the group grew into one another's thought, the talk intensified, and we got from considering East and West to considering our own countrymen. What makes a man essentially English? Dickens had it. Johnson had it. You couldn't, said G.K. Imagine a Scotch Johnson or an Irish Johnson or a French or a German Johnson. George Wyndham told us, as we got onto the topic of patriotism, that he had a fear he hardly liked to utter. As we urged him, he said he feared a big war might come, or he might be defeated. Gilbert agreed that he too had felt that fear, but, he said, if you were to say that in the House, or I to write it in a paper, we should be denounced as unpatriotic. Small wonder the talk had time to range, for these scrappy notes are all that remain of a meeting beginning about one o'clock and lasting until five. At that hour, two little old sisters, the Miss Blunts, known to our family as the Little Bees, happened to call on Mother. I shall never forget their faces as they looked at the huge man in the armchair, and the other guests all absorbed and animated and realized that they were interrupting a luncheon party. A swift glance at the little old ladies, another at the clock, and the party broke up to remain my most cherished memory for months, until my next visit to their home, when Gilbert and I arrived at the use of each other's Christian names, an agreement that he insisted on calling the Pact of Beaconsfield. How deep he saw when, in his defense of hermits, he analyzed a chief joy of human intercourse. The best things that happen to us are those we get out of what has already happened. If men were honest with themselves, they would agree that actual social engagements 
even with those they love, often seem strangely brief, breathless, thwarted, and inconclusive. Mere society is a way of turning friends into acquaintances. The real profit is not in meeting our friends, but in having met them. Now, when people merely plunge from crush to crush and from crowd to crowd, they never discover the positive joy of life. They are like men always hungry, because their food never digests. Also, like those men, they are cross. The Well in the Shadows, pages 104 to 105. There is time in the country for the food of social intercourse to digest. I noticed, too, that in the list of Gilbert's friends, quiet-voiced men stood high. Max Beerbaum, Jack Fillimore, Monsignor O'Connor, Monsignor Knox, his own father, Morris Baring. All these represent a certain spaciousness and leisureliness, which was what he asked for of friendship. Even if they were in a hurry, they never seemed so. Jack Fillimore, both he and we, saw on and off at this time, but had often to enjoy in anticipation or in retrospect. Professor, at one time of Greek, at another of Latin, at Glasgow University, he was the kind of man Gilbert specially appreciated. He wrote of Fillimore after his death something curiously like what he wrote of his own father. He was a supreme example of unadvertised greatness, and the thing which is larger inside than outside. At Oxford, Fillimore had been known as one of Belloc's lands. He was very much one of the group who were to run the eyewitness and the new witness, but though he always adored Belloc, no one who knew him in the fullness of his powers could think of him as anyone's lamb. He was a quiet, humorous, deeply intelligent man, a scholar of European repute, whose knowledge of medieval Latin verse equaled his classical scholarship. Gilbert's keen observation of his friends is never shown better than in what he wrote of Fillimore. Like a needle pricking a drum, his quietude seemed to kill all the noise of our loud plutocracy and publicity. In all this, he was supremely the scholar, with not a little of the satirist. And yet there was never any man alive who was so unlike a don. His religion purged him of intellectual pride, and certainly of that intellectual vanity which so often makes a sort of seething fuss underneath the acid sociability of academic centers. He had none of the tired omniscience which comes of intellectual breeding in and in. He seemed to be not so much a professor as a practicer of learning. He practiced it quietly but heartily and humorously, exactly as if it had been any other business. If he had been a sailor like his father, the Admiral, he would have minded his own business with exactly the same smile and imperceptible gesture. Indeed, he looked much more like a sailor than a professor. His dark square face and clear eyes and compact figure were of a type often seen among sailors. And, in whatever academic enclave he stood, he always seemed to have walked in from outside, bringing with him some of the winds of the world and some light from the ends of the earth. GK's Weekly, November 27, 1926. To return to my own notes, it is horribly characteristic that I wrote them in an undated notebook. But I think that luncheon, which lasted so long, must have been in 1911, the same year my father persuaded both the Synthetic Society to elect Chesterton and Chesterton to attend the Synthetic. Of his first meeting, my father wrote to George Wyndham, Had you been at the Synthetic last night, you would have witnessed a memorable scene. Place, Westminster Palace Hotel, time 9.40. AGB, Arthur Balfour, leader of the Conservative Party, is speaking persuasively and in carefully modulated tones to an attentive audience. Suddenly a crash as though the door were blown open. AGB brought to a halt. The whole company looked round and in rushes a figure exactly like the pictures of Mr. Wind when he blows open the door and forces an entrance in the German child story, Mr. Wind and Madame Rain. A figure enormous and distended, a kind of walking mountain with large rounded corners. It was GKC, who enveloped in a huge Inverness cape of light color, thus made his debut at the synthetic. He rushed, not walked, to a chair and was dragged chair and all by wagon and me as near as might be to the table, where, with a fresh crash, he deposited his stick and then his hat. 
And there he sat, eager and attentive, forgetting all about his stick and hat and coat, filling up the whole space at the bottom of the table, drawing caricatures of the company on a sheet of fool's cap, a memorable figure, very welcome to me, but arousing the fury of the conventional and the dreary and well-informed, well represented by Bailey Saunders, who has been at me here half the morning, trying to convince me that he will ruin the society and ought never to have been elected. Some of the reactions to this new recruit have been touched on in his autobiography. There I met old Haldane, yawning with all his Hegelian abysses, who appeared to me as I must have appeared to a neighbor in a local debating club, when he dismissed metaphysical depths and pointed at me, saying, There is that Leviathan, whom thou hast made to take his sport therein. There also I met Balfour, obviously preferring any philosophers with any philosophies to his loyal followers of the Tory party. Perhaps religion is not the opium of the people, but philosophy is the opium of the politicians. My father belonged to another group besides the synthetic society for which it seemed to him that Gilbert was even more ideally fitted. The club was founded by Dr. Johnson, the home of the best talk in the land. For Garrick and Goldsmith were at times shouted down by the great lexicographer, a sign, said Chesterton, of his modesty and his essential democracy. Johnson was too democratic to reign as king of this company. He preferred to contend with him as an equal. The old formula still in use had informed my father. You have had the honor to be elected, but Wilford Ward felt the election of modern Dr. Johnson would be an honor to the club. To his intense disgust, he found that only George Wyndham could be relied upon for wholehearted support. What may be called the social element in the club had become too strong to welcome a man who boasted in all directions of belonging to the middle classes and whose friends merely urged the claim that he was one of the few today who could talk as well as Johnson. Gilbert met many politicians in other ways, but only with one of them did he feel a real close harmony. Of George Wyndham's opinions, he said in the autobiography, that they were of the same general color as my own. And he went on to stress that the word color is significant of the whole man. To depict him in political cartoons as St. George had not in it the sort of absurdity of the pictures of the more frigid and philosophic Balfour as Prince Arthur. George really did suggest the ages of chivalry. He had huge sympathy with gypsies and tramps. There was about him an inward generosity that gave a gusto or relish to all he did. The Chesterton's appreciation of George Wyndham was deepened for them both by an affection, indeed almost a reverence, for the deep mysticism of his wife, a woman not to be forgotten by anyone who ever knew her, and still less to be merely praised by anyone who adequately appreciated her. For a period at any rate, Gilbert and Francis were much in contact with the extreme Anglo-Catholic group in the Church of England. In the best of that group, and many of them, were very, very good, there is a sense of taking part in a crusade to restore Catholicism to the whole country. Canon Scott Holland led a campaign for social justice, and many of the same group mixed this with devotion to Our Lady, belief in the real presence, and a profound love of the Catholic past of England. George Wyndham's wife, Lady Grosvenor, was one of this group, and also her friend, Father Philip Waggett of the Cowley Fathers. Father Waggett, a member of the Synthetic Society and an intimate with my parents, became also intimate with the Chestertons. Ralph Adams Cram described his own meeting with Chesterton arranged by Father Waggett. Father Waggett asked my wife and myself once, when we were staying in London, whom we would like best to meet, anyone from the King downward. We chose Chesterton, who was a very particular friend of Father Waggett. At that time, we put on a dinner at the Buckingham Palace Hotel, in those days the haunt of all the county families, and in defiance of fate, had this dinner in the public dining room. We had as guests Father Waggett, GKC, and Mrs. Chester. The entrance into the dining room of the short processional created something of a sensation amongst the aforesaid county families there assembled. Father Waggett, thin, crop-headed monk in cassock and robe, GKC, vast and practically globular, little Mrs. Chesterton, very South Kensington in moss green velvet, my wife and myself. The dinner was a riot. I have the clearest recollection of GKC seated 
ponderously at the table drinking champagne by magnets, continually feeding his face with food, which, as he was constantly employed in the most dazzling and epigrammatic conversation, was apt to fall from his fork and rebound from his corporosity until the fragments disappeared under the table. He and Father Waggett egged each other on to the most preposterous amusements. Each would write a triolet for the other to illustrate. They were both as clever with the pencil as with the pen, and they covered the backs of the menus with the most astonishing literary and artistic productions. I particularly remember G.K.C. suddenly looking out the dining room window towards Buckingham Palace and announcing that he was now prepared to write a disloyal triolet. This was during the reign of King Edward VII, and the result was convincing. I have somewhere the whole collection of these literary productions with their illustrations. Where they are, I do not know. Chesterton by Cyril Clemens, pages 36 to 37. On a second visit of the Chestertons to Lotus, George Wyndham was there. He had told us of his habit of shouting the ballad of the white horse to submissive listeners, and we had hoped for the same treat. But Gilbert got the book and kicked it under his chair, defying us to recover it. We had at the time a vast German cook of a girth almost equal to his own and possessed an unbounded curiosity in the matter of our guests. Gilbert declared that as he sat peacefully in the drawing room, she approached him holding out a paper which he supposed to be a laundry list and then started back exclaiming that she had thought him to be Mrs. Ward. It was on this visit that he remarked to a lady who happened to be the granddaughter of a duke you and I, who belong to the jolly old upper middle classes. Had he been told about her ancestry, he would, I imagine, have felt that he had paid her an implied compliment by not being aware of it. For into the world of the aristocracy, he and Francis had been received in London, and he viewed it with the same calm humor and potential friendliness as he had for all the rest of mankind. When Francis, in her diary, pitied the Duchess of Sutherland, and felt that a single day of such a life as the Duchess lived would drive her crazy, she was expressing Gilbert's taste as well as her own for a certain simplicity of life. Social position neither excited nor irritated him. He liked or disliked an aristocrat exactly as he liked or disliked the postman. Gilbert and Cecil Chesterton really were, as Conrad Noel said, personally unconcerned about class. They had, however, a principle against the position of the English aristocracy, which will be better understood in the light of their general social and historical outlook. What might be called the social side of it was often expressed by G.K. when lecturing on Dickens. Thus speaking at Manchester for the Dickens centenary, he was reported as saying, The objection to aristocracy was quite simple. It was not that aristocrats were all black guards, it was that in an aristocratic state, people sat in a huge darkened theater and only the stage was lighted. They saw five or six people walking about and they said, that man looks very heroic striding about with a sword. Plenty of people outside in the street looked more heroic striding about with an umbrella, but they did not see these things, all the lights being turned out. That was the really philosophic objection to an aristocratic society. It was not that the Lord was a fool, he was about as clever as one's own brother or cousin. It was because one's attention was confined to a few people that one judged them as one judged actors on the stage, forgetting everybody else. Just that not everybody should be remembered, whether suburban, proletarian, aristocrat, or pauper. Shortly after the removal to Beaconsfield, he was summoned to give evidence before a parliamentary commission on the question of censorship of the theater. Keep it, he said, to the surprise of many of his friends, but change the manner of its exercise. Let it no longer be censorship by an expert, but by a jury, by twelve ordinary men. These will be the best judges of what really makes for morality and sound sense. He had come to give evidence, he said, not as a writer, but as the representative of the gallery, and he was concerned only with the good and happiness of the English people. One bewildered commissioner was understood to murmur that their terms of reference were not quite so wide as that. The chapter in the autobiography entitled Friends and Foolery ends suddenly with a reference to the war. Like the whole book, it leaps wildly about. One point in it is interesting and links up with the introduction to Titterton's drinking songs, 
that Gilbert later wrote. The shout of chorus is natural to mankind, and G.K. claims that he had done it long before he heard of community singing. He sang when out driving or walking over the moors with Father O'Connor. He sang in Fleet Street with Titterton and his journalist friends, and he sang the red flag on trade union platforms in England Awake and revolutionary groups. There was, he claims, a legend that in Oberon Herbert's rooms, not far from Buckingham Palace, we sang Drake's drum with such passionate patriotism that King Edward VII sent in a request for the noise to stop. Yet it was all but impossible to teach Gilbert a tune, and Bernard Shaw felt this, as we have seen, a real drawback to his friend's understanding of his own life and career. Music was to Shaw what line and color were to Chesterton. But to Chesterton, singing was just making a noise to show he felt happy. Once he wrote a poem called Music. But only as one more flower in the wreath he was always weaving for Francis, who was, says Monsignor Knox, the heroine of all his novels. The Listener, June 1941. Sounding brass and tinkling cymbal, he that made me sealed my years, and the pomp of gorgeous noises, waves of triumph, waves of tears. Thundered empty round and past me, shattered, lost forevermore. Ancient gold of pride and passion, wrecked like treasure on a shore. But I saw her cheek and forehead, change as at a spoken word. And I saw her head uplifted, like a lily to the Lord. Not as lost, but all transmuted. Ears are sealed, yet eyes have seen. Saw her smiles, O oh soul, be worthy. Saw her tears, O oh heart, be clean. Collected Poems, page 129. Against the background of all these activities, the books went on pouring out as fast from Overroads as they had from Overstrand. A town full of friends, 40 minutes journey from London, was not exactly the desert into which admirers had advised Gilbert to flee, but he would never have been happy in a desert. He needed human company. He also needed to produce. Artistic paternity, he once said, is as wholesome as physical paternity, and certainly he never ceased to bring forth the children of his mind. Within two years of the move, seven books were published. The Ball and the Cross, February 1910. What's Wrong with the World, June 1910. Alarms and Discursions, November 1910. Blake, November 1910. Criticisms and Appreciations of Dickens, January 1911. Innocence of Father Brown, August 1911. Ballad of the White Horse, August 1911. Of these books, Alarms and Discursions and the Dickens Criticisms are collections and arrangements of already published essays. Meanwhile, other essays were being written to become, in turn, other books at a later date. The Blake is a brilliant short study of art and mysticism. After reading it, you feel you understand Blake in quite a new way. And then you wonder, is this illumination light on Blake or simply light on Chesterton? It must never be forgotten that the writer was himself a spoiled artist, which means a man with almost enough art in him to have been in the ranks of men consecrated for life to art service. Father Brown had first made his appearance in magazines, and these detective stories became the most purely popular of Gilbert's books. It was a new genre, detection in which the mind of a man means more than his footprints or cigar ash, even to the detective. The one reproduced in most anthologies, The Invisible Man, depends for its solution on the fact that certain people are morally invisible. To the question, has anyone been here? The answer, no, does not include the milkman or the postman. Thus, the postman is the morally invisible man who has committed the crime. A thread of this sort runs through all the stories, but they are, like all of his romances, full too of escape and peril and wild adventure. Life on several occasions imitated Gilbert's fancies. Thus, the Asaph revelations have followed his fantastic idea in The Man Who Was Thursday of the anarchists who turn out to be detectives in disguise. The technique of Father Brown himself was imitated by a man in Detroit who recovered a stolen car by putting himself imaginatively in the thief's place and driving an exactly similar car around likely corners till he came suddenly upon his own left in a lonely road. He wrote to tell Gilbert of this adventure. From Chicago came an even odder example. It is extremely difficult, wrote the Tribune, to determine the proper relationship of the Chiesa Prudente di Casato duels in Mr. Gilbert K. Chesterton's book, The Ball and the Cross. 
The flight in search of the dueling ground, the pursuit by the police, the friendly intervention of the anarchist wine shopkeeper, Volpe, the offer of his backyard for fighting purposes, the unfriendly intervention of the police, the friendly intervention of the reporters, the renewed and insistently unfriendly intervention of the police commissioner, the disgust of the duelists, the extreme disgust of the anarchist, the renewed flight of the fighters, seconds, physicians, reporters, and the anarchist over the back fences, all these and other incidents are essentially Chestertonian. The Di Cosato affair was carried off with fully as much spirit and dash, with fully as many automobiles, seconds, physicians, reporters, and police all scampering over the country roads until the artistic deputy and the aged veteran of the War of 1859, out distancing their pursuers, could find opportunity in comparative peace to cut the glorious gashes of satisfied honor in each other's faces. Chicago Tribune, 12th of March, 1910. Two months after this, an interviewer from the Daily News visited Beaconsfield and splashed headlines in the paper to the effect that the spirit of Chesterton was inspiring a fight between the leaseholders in Edwards Square and a firm which had brought up their garden to erect a super garage. Barricades were erected by day and destroyed in the night. A wild-eyed beetle held the fort with a garden roller and said GK, the creatures of my Napoleon of Notting Hill have entered into the bodies of the staid burghers of Kensington. In none of these cases was there any likelihood, as the Chicago Tribune noted, of the actors in life having read the books they were spiritedly staging. Ideas have a life of their own, the Daily News interviewer tentatively ventured, but he may have been puzzled as GK agreed heartily in the words, I am no dirty nominalist. Chesterton kept the reviewers busy, as well as the interviewers, and in all his stories, they noted one curiosity. If time and space or any circumstances interfere with the cutting of his Gordian knots, he commands time and space to make themselves scarce, and circumstances to be no more heard of. About time and space, this is true in a unique degree. For him, time seems to have had no existence, or perhaps rather to have been like a telescope elongating and shortening at will. As a young man, it may be remembered, he gave in the course of one letter two quite irreconcilable statements of the length of time since events in his school days. He had indeed the same difficulty about time as about money. He mentions in the autobiography that after his watch was stolen during a pro-Boer demonstration, he never bothered to possess another. In his stories, this oddity became more marked. In The Ball on the Cross, he relates adventures performed in leaping on and off an omnibus in such a fashion that the bus must have covered several miles of ground. And then we are suddenly told it had gone a few score yards from the bottom of Ludgate Hill to the top. Still stranger are the records in The Man Who Was Thursday and Man Alive of the happenings of a single day while in the return of Don Quixote, a new organization of society is described as though many years old, and then suddenly announced as having been on foot some weeks. But to return for one moment to the more serious aspects of the work of these years. While what's wrong with the world, discussed in some detail in the next chapter, is the first sketch of his social views, a kind of blueprint for a sane and humane sort of world, the other books, with all their foolery, hold a serious purpose. They should be read as illustrations of the philosophy of orthodoxy. Both the book he had written and the thing of which he had said God and humanity made it and it made me. This row of shapeless and ungainly monsters which I now set before the reader, he says of his essays in the introduction on gargoyles and alarms and discursions, does not consist of separate idols cut out capriciously in lonely valleys or various lands. These monsters are met for the gargoyles of a definite cathedral. I have to carve the gargoyles, because I can carve nothing else. I'll leave to others the angels and the arches and the spires. But I am very sure of the style of the architecture and the consecration of the church. The story of the ball and the cross, already indicated to the reader by the American-Italian duel, which seemed like a parody of it, has the double interest of its bearing on the world of Chesterton's day and its glimpses at a stranger world to come. A young Highlander, coming to London, sees in an atheist bookshop an insult to Our Lady. He smashes the window and challenges the owner to a duel. Turnbull, the atheist, is more than ready to fight, but the world, caring nothing for religious opinions, regards anyone ready to fight for them as a madman and is mainly concerned with keeping the peace. 
Pursued by all the resources of modern civilization, the two men spend the rest of the book starting to fight, being interrupted and arrested by the police, escaping and arguing and fighting again. They end up in an asylum with a garden, where again they talk endlessly and where the power of Lucifer, the prince of this world, has enclosed everyone who has been concerned in their wild flight, so that no memory of it may live on the earth. The two sides of Chesterton's brain are engaged in the duel of minds in this book, and some of his best writing is in it, both in the description of the wild rush across sea and land and in the discussions between the two men. G.K.'s affection for the sincere atheist is noteworthy, and his hatred is reserved for the shuffler and the compromiser. It was grand to have such a man as Turnbull to convert, one of those men in whom a continuous appetite and industry of the intellect leave the emotions very simple and steady. His heart was in the right place, but he was quite content to leave it there. His head was his hobby. This might be Chesterton himself. In fact, it is Chesterton himself, and the climax belongs to a later world than that of 1911. For pointing to the ball bereft of the cross, the Highlander calls out, it staggers Turnbull, it cannot stand by itself. You know it cannot. It has been the sorrow of your life. Turnbull, this garden is not a dream, but an apocalyptic fulfillment. This garden is the world gone mad. About the time this book appeared, Gilbert was asked by an Anglican society to lecture at Coventry. He said, what shall I lecture on? They answered, anything from an elephant to an umbrella. Very well, he said, I will lecture on an umbrella. He treated the umbrella as a symbol of increasing artificiality. We wear hair to protect the head, a hat to protect the hair, an umbrella to protect the hat. Gilbert said once he was willing to start anywhere and develop from anything the whole of his philosophy. In the notebook, he had written, bootlaces. Once I looked down at my bootlaces. Who gave me my bootlaces? The bootmaker? Bah! Who gave the bootmaker himself? What did I ever do that I should be given bootlaces? After the lecture on the umbrella, two priests saw him at the railway bookstall and asked him if the rumor was true that he was thinking of joining the church. He answered, it's a matter that is giving me a great deal of agony of mind, and I'd be very grateful if you would pray for me. The following year, he broached the subject to Father O'Connor when they were alone in a railway carriage. He said he had made up his mind, but he wanted to wait for Francis, as she had led him into the Anglican Church out of Unitarianism. Francis told Father O'Connor, when he came to Overroads later, at the beginning of Gilbert's illness, that she could not make head or tail of some of her husband's remarks, especially one about being buried at Kendall Green. When Father O'Connor told her what had been on Gilbert's mind, she was half amused at the hints he had been dropping. She recognized his reluctance to move without her, but I think she probably realized too that even to himself his conviction in those years at times more absolute, at times less. We shall see in the later chapter his own analysis of his very slow progress. Meanwhile, in his books, he was at once deepening and widening his vision of the faith. Fragments of verse used in the Ballad of the White Horse had come to Gilbert in his sleep. A great white horse had been the romance of his childhood. The beginning of his honeymoon under the sign of the white horse at Ipswich had been a trip to fairyland. But it's hard to say when the motif of the white horse, the verses ringing in his head, and the ideas that make the poem came together in what many think the greatest work of his life. In Father Brown on Chesterton, we are told of the long time the poem took in the making. They talked of it on the Yorkshire Moors in 1906, and Father O'Connor noted how Francis cherished it. I could see she was more in love with it than anything else he had in hand. Father O'Connor also gives some interesting illustrations of the way to talk ministers to a work of genius. He had begun one day by saying lightly that none of us could become great men without learning on the little ones. Could not well begin our day, but for those who started theirs first for our sake. Lighting the fire and cooking the breakfast. This was said just before the dressing bell rang, and between the bell and dinner, Gilbert had written about nine verses beginning with King Alfred's meditation. And well may God, with the serving folk, cast in his dreadful lot. Is not he too a servant, and is not he forgot? In 1907, Gilbert published in the Albany Review a fragment from a ballad epic of Alfred, which evoked the comment, Mr. Chesterton certainly has in each eye a special Rotgen Ray attachment. He wrote The White Horse, guided by his favorite theory, that to realize history, we should not delve into the details of research, but try only to see the big things, for it is those that we generally overlook. 
People talk about features of interest, but the features never make up a face. They will toil wearily off to the tiniest inscription or darkest picture that is mentioned in a guidebook as having some reference to Alfred the Great or William the Conqueror. But they care nothing for the sky that Alfred saw or the hills on which William hunted. In the King Alfred country especially can be found the far-flung titanic figure of the giant Albion, whom Blake saw in visions spreading to our encircling seas. GK's Weekly, April 16th, 1927. Gilbert wrote a sketch for the Daily News about this time, telling how an old woman in a donkey cart, whom they had left far behind on the road, went driving triumphantly past when a car they were in broke down. For this expedition, as so often later, he made full use of the modern invention he derided. In an open touring car hired for the occasion, Gilbert in Inverness cape and shapeless hat, Francis beside him snugly wrapped up, they saw the smoke-hued hamlets quaint with Westland King and Westland Saint, and watched the western glory faint along the road to foam. The note struck in the dedication and recurring throughout the poem is that of the Christian idea which had made England great and which he had learned from Francis. Wherefore I bring these rhymes to you who brought the cross to me, since on you flaming without flaw I saw the sign that Guntram saw when he let break his ships of awe and laid peace on the sea. In the poem, Christian men, whether they be Saxon or Roman or Briton or Celt, are banded together to fight the heathen Danes in defense of the sacred things of faith, in defense of the human things of daily life, in defense even of the old traditions of pagan England, because it is only Christian men who guard even heathen things. Gilbert constantly disclaimed the idea that he took trouble over anything. Taking trouble has never been a weakness of mine, but in what might be termed a large and loose way, he really did take immense trouble over what interested him. King Alfred is not an almost mythical figure like King Arthur, and an outline of his story with legendary fringes can be traced in the Wessex country and confirmed by literature. Gilbert wanted this general story. He did not want antiquarian exactness of detail. In the mouths of Guthrum and of King Alfred, he put the expression of the pagan and the Christian outlook. Nor did he hesitate to let King Alfred prophecy at large concerning the days of G.K. Chesterton. The poem is a ballad in the sense of the old ballads that were stirring stories. It is also an expression of the threefold love of Gilbert's life, his wife, his country, and his faith. And as in all great poetry, there is a quality of eternity in this poem that has made it serve as an expression of the eternal spirit of man. During the First World War, many soldiers had it with them in the trenches. I want to tell you, the widow of a sailor wrote, that a copy of the Ballad of the White Horse went down into the Humber with the R-38. My husband loved it as his own soul, never went anywhere without it. Almost 30 years have passed and today the poem still speaks. Greeting Jacques Maritain on the occasion of his 60th birthday, Dorothy Thompson quoted King Alfred's assertion of Christian freedom against the pagan Nazi conquerors of his day. After Crete, the Times had the shortest first leader in its history. Under the heading, Sursum Corda, was a brief statement of the disaster, followed by the words of Our Lady to King Alfred. I tell you not for your comfort, yea, not for your desire, save that the sky grows darker yet, and the sea rises higher. Night shall be thrice night over you, and heaven an iron coat. Do you have joy without a cause? Yea, faith without a hope. The unbreakable strength of that apparently faint and tenuous thread of faith appeared in the sequel. Many had the ballad in hand in those dark days. Many others wrote to the Times asking the source of the quotation. Months later, when Winston Churchill spoke of the end of the beginning, the Times returned to the White Horse and gave the opening of Alfred's speech at Effendoon. The high tide, King Alfred cried, the high tide, and the turn. Recording by Buchernard. Chapter 17. The Disillusioned Liberal. The English were not wrong in loving liberty. They were only wrong in losing it. G.K.'s Weekly, June 1, 1933. One main difficulty in writing biography lies in the various strands that run through every human life. 
It is, as I have already said, impossible to keep a perfect chronological order with anyone whose occupations and interests were so multifarious. In the present chapter, and the two that follow, we shall consider the movement of Chesterton's mind upon politics and sociology. This will involve going back to the general election of 1906 and forward to the Marconi trial of 1913. For those who are interested in his poetry or his humor, or his philosophy or his theology, but not at all in his sociological and political outlook, I fear that these three chapters may loom a little uninvitingly. If they are tempted to skip them altogether, I shall not blame them, yet they will miss a great deal that is vital to the understanding of his whole mind and the course his life was to take. These are not the most entertaining chapters in the book, but if we are really to know Chesterton, the events they cover must be considered most carefully. As a boy, Gilbert Chesterton spoke of politics as absorbing, quote, for every ardent intellect. And during these years, he was himself deeply concerned with the politics of England. The ideal liberalism sketched in his letter to Hammond during the Boer War, chapter 10, had appeared to him, if not perfectly realized, at least capable of realization, in the existing Liberal Party. The Tory party was in power, and all its acts, to say nothing of its general ineptitude, appeared to liberals as positive arguments for their own party. At this date, so convinced a Tory as Lord Hugh Cecil could describe his own party as, quote, to mix metaphors and eviscerated ruin. Several letters and postcards from Mr. Belloc announcing his own election as liberal member for South Salford show the high hope with which young liberalism was viewing the world in 1906. Undated. I have, as you will have seen, pulled it off by 852. It is huge fun. I am now out against all vermin, notably South African Jews. The devil is let loose. Let all men beware. H.B. Written across top of letter. Tomorrow, Monday, meet the Manchester train arriving Euston 610 and oblige your little friend, H.B., St. Hilary's Day. Don't fail to meet that train. Stamps are cheap. H.B. I beg you, I implore you, meet that 610 train. H.B. Stamps are a drug in the market. 852. Meet that train. Stamps are given away now in Salford. From 1902, when the general election left the Conservatives still in power, until 1906, the Liberal Party had been, as Chesterton described it, quote, in the desert. And the younger members of the party were deeply concerned with hammering out a positive philosophy which might inspire a true program for their own party. A group of them wrote a book called England, a Nation, with the subtitle, Papers of a Patriots Club. The Patriots Club had no real existence. But I imagine that Lucien Aldershaw, who edited the book, believed that its publication might create the club. Belloc was not one of the contributors, but Hugh Law wrote ably on Ireland, J. L. Hammond on South Africa, and Conrad Knoll, Henry Nevinson, and C. F. G. Masterman on other aspects of the political scene. The whole book is on a fairly high level, but Chesterton's essay was the only one much noticed by reviewers. It was the introductory chapter, far longer than any of the others, and gave the key to the whole book. Entitled, The Idea of Patriotism, it was, like Napoleon of Notting Hill, which it does much to illumine, a plea for patriotism that really was for England and not for the British Empire. Such a patriotism recognizes the limitations proper to nationality and admits, nay admires, other patriotisms for other nations. Thus, in Chesterton's eyes, a true English patriot should also be an ardent home roller for Ireland, since Ireland too was a nation. He stressed the danger that the nationhood of England should be absorbed and lost in the imperial idea. The claim that in an empire the various races could learn much from one another, he considered a bit of a special pleading on the part of imperialists. England had learned much from France and Germany, but, although Ireland had much to teach, we had not learned from Ireland. The real patriotism of the Englishman had been dimmed both by the emphasis on the imperial idea and by the absence of roots in his own land. The governing classes had destroyed those roots and had almost forgotten the existence of the people. From the dregs and off-scourings of the population, a vast empire had been created, 
but the people of England were not allowed to colonize England. The Education Bill of 1902, brought in by the Conservatives and giving financial support to church schools, saw Gilbert in general agreement with the liberal attacks. He did not yet appreciate the Catholic idea that education must be of one piece, and he did not think it fair that the country should support specifically Catholic schools. Parents could give at home the religious instruction they wanted their children to have. But with that fairness of mind which made it so hard for him to be a party man, he saw why the liberal compromise of simple Bible teaching for all in the state schools could not be expected to satisfy Catholics. He wrote to the Daily News, The Bible compromise is certainly in favor of the Protestant view of the Bible. The thing, properly stated, is as plain as the nose on your face. Protestant Christianity believes that there is a divine record in a book, that everyone ought to have free access to that book, that everyone who gets hold of it can save his soul by it, whether he finds it in a library or picks it off a dust cart. Catholic Christianity believes that there is a divine army or league upon earth called the Church, that all men should be induced to join it, that any man who joins it can save his soul by it without ever opening any of the old books of the Church at all. The Bible is only one of the institutions of Catholicism, like its rites or its priesthood. It thinks the Bible only efficient when taken as part of the church. This being so, a child could see that if you have the Bible taught alone, anyhow, by anybody, you do definitely decide in favor of the first view of the Bible and against the second. Discussing a few years later whether it was possible or satisfactory to teach the Bible simply as literature, he put his finger on the Catholic objection. Quote, I should not mind, he said, children being told about Mohammed, because I am not a Mohammedan. If I were a Mohammedan, I should very much want to know what they were told about him. While as for the unfortunate teacher, in case a child should ask if the things in the Bible happened, quote, either the teacher must answer him insincerely, and that is immorality, or he must answer him sincerely, and that is a sectarian education or he must refuse to answer him at all, and that is the first of all bad manners and a sort of timid tyranny. Chesterton's liberalism received a further shock from the fact that liberals, in attacking the bill, were attacking also the Catholic faith and raising the cry of no popery. In a correspondence with Dr. Clifford, he reminded him of how they had stood together against popular fanaticism during the Boer War. Quote, there are two cries always capable of raising the English in their madness. One that the Union Jack is being pulled down, and one that the Pope is being set up. And upon the man who raises one of them, responsibility will lie heavy till the last day. For when they are raised, the best are mixed with the worst. Every rational compromise is dashed to pieces. Every opponent is given credit for the worst that the worst of his allies has by his worst enemy been said to have said. That horror of darkness swept across us when the war began. Beyond all question this is true, that if we choose to fight on the no popery cry, we may win. But I can imagine something of which I should be prouder than of any victory, the memory that we had shown our difference from Mr. Chamberlain simply and finally in this, that to our hand had lain, as it once laid to his, an old, an effectual, an infallible, and a filthy weapon, and that we let it lie. Yet it was fairly easy to be a liberal in opposition. At the elections of 1902, which the Liberals lost, and 1906, which they won, Chesterton canvassed for the Liberal Party. Charles Masterman used to tell a story of canvassing a street in his company. Both started at the same end on opposite sides of the road. Masterman completed his side and came back on the other to find Chesterton still earnestly arguing at the first house, for he was passionately serious in his belief that the Liberal Party stood for a real renewal, even revolution, in the life of England. Quote, At the present moment of victory, says the report of a speech by Gilbert following the great swing of the Liberal Party into power in 1906, he called for, quote, that magnanimity towards the defeated that characterized all great conquerors. It was important that all should develop, even the Tory. It needed the experience of seeing the Liberal Party in power to shake his faith. In the new House of Commons, the Conservatives were in a minority. Against them were the two old parties, the Liberals and the Irish members, who were in general allied to them, and the small group forming a new party known as Labour. 
the Labour members who got into Parliament in 1906 and 1909 were regarded by Conservatives as being a kind of left-wing extension of the Liberal Party. Such a Liberal as Chesterton saw them there with delight, the and although he would still have called himself a Liberal, he at first hoped in the Labour men as something more truly expressive of the people's wishes. In an introduction to From Workhouse to Westminster, A Life of Will Crooks, Gilbert expressed a good deal of his own political philosophy. As a Democrat, he believed in the ideal of direct government by the people. But obviously, this was only possible in a world that was also his ideal, a world consisting of small and even of very small states. The Democrats' usual alternative, representative government, was, Gilbert said, symbolic in character. Just as religious symbolism, quote, may for a time represent a real emotion, and then for a time cease to represent anything, so representative government may for a time represent the people, and for a time cease to represent anything. Further, the very idea of representation itself involved two perfectly distinct notions. A man throws a shadow, or he throws a stone. Quote, In the first sense, it is supposed that the representative is like the thing he represents. In the second case, it is only supposed that the representative is useful to the thing he represents. Workmen, like conservatives, sent men to Parliament not to show what they themselves were like, but to attack the other party in their name. Quote, the labor members as a class are not representatives, but missiles. Working men are not all like Mr. Fair Hardy. If it comes to likeness, working men are more like the Duke of Devonshire. But they throw Mr. Fair Hardy at the Duke of Devonshire, knowing that he is so curiously shaped as to hurt anything in which he is thrown. In the same way, Mr. Balfour was entirely unlike the Tory squires who used him as a weapon. To this rule, that men do not choose to be represented by their like, Chesterton took Will Crooks as one exception. Quote, you have not seen the English people in politics. It has not yet entered politics. Liberals do not represent it. Tories do not represent it. Labour members, on the whole, represent it rather less than Tories or Liberals. When it enters politics, it will bring with it a trail of all things that politicians detest. Prejudices, as against hospitals. Superstitions, as about funerals. A thirst for respectability passing that of the middle classes a faith in the family which will knock to pieces half the socialism of Europe. If ever that people enter politics, it will sweep away most of our revolutionists as mere pedants. It will be able to point only to one figure, powerful, pathetic, humorous, and very humble, who bore in any way upon his face the sign and star of its authority. It was sad enough after this to see Will Crooks fathering one of those very bills for the interference with family life which Chesterton most hated. But, indeed, the years that followed the 1906 election are a story of steadily growing disillusionment with the realities of representative government in England. Chesterton wrote regularly for the Daily News, and was regarded as one of their most valuable contributors. But when, following an attack in the House of Commons on the liberal leader Campbell Bannerman over the sale of peerages, he sent in an article on the subject. The editor, A.G. Gardner, wrote, July 12, 1907, quote, I have left your article out tonight, not because I do not entirely agree with its point of view, but because just at this moment it would look like backing Lee's unmannerly attack on CB. I am keeping the article in type for a later occasion when the general question is not complicated with a particularly offensive incident. It was a test case, and it seemed to Chesterton not a question of good manners, but of something far more fundamental. The assertion had been made in the House of Commons that peerages were being sold and that the price of such sales was the cheap support of the secret party funds. But the Daily News was a liberal paper, and this was an attack on the Liberal Party. Chesterton replied, July 11, 1907, quote, I am sure you know by this time that I never resent the exclusion of my articles as such, and I should always trust your literary judgment if it were a matter of literature only and I dare say you have often saved me from an indiscretion and your readers from a bore. Unfortunately, this matter of the party funds is not one of that sort. My conscience does not often bother you, but just now the animal is awake and roaring. Your paper has always championed the rights of conscience, so mine naturally goes to you. If you disagreed with me, it would be another matter. But since you agree with me, as I was sure you would, 
it becomes simply a question of which is the more important, politeness or political morality. I agree that Lee did go to the point of being unmannerly. So did Plimsoll, so did Bradlaugh, so did the Irish members. But surely it would be a very terrible thing if anyone could say, the Daily News suppressed all demands for the Plimsoll line, or the Daily News did not join in asking for Bradlaugh's political rights. I am sure that this is not your idea. You think that this matter can be better raised later on. I am convinced of its urgency. I am so passionately convinced of its urgency that if you will not help me to raise it now, I must try some other channel. They are going on Monday to raise a breach of privilege, which is simply an aristocratic censorship of the press, in order to crush this question through the man who raised it, and to crush it forever. I have said that I think Lee's questions violent and needless, but they are not attacking his questions, they are attacking his letter, which contains nothing that I do not think probably nothing that you do not think. Lee is to be humiliated and broken because he said that titles are bought, as they are, because he said that poor members are reminded of their dependence on the party funds, as they are, because he said that all this was hypocrisy of public life, as it is. One thing is quite certain. Unless some liberal journalists speak on Monday or Tuesday, the secret funds and the secret powers are safe. These parliamentary votes mark eras. They are meant to. And that vote will not mark a defense of CB. The letter had nothing to do with CB. It will mark the final decision that any repetition of what Lee said in his letter is an insult to the House. That is, any protest against bot titles will be an insult to the House. Any protest against secret funds will be an insult to the House. I would willingly burn my article if I were only sure you would publish one yourself tomorrow on the same lines. But if not, here is at least one thing you can do. An article, even signed, may perhaps commit the paper too much. But your paper cannot be committed by publishing a letter from me stating my opinions. It might publish a letter from Joe Chamberlain stating his opinions. I therefore send you a short letter pointing out the evil and disassociating it as far as possible from the indiscretions of Lee. I am sure you will publish this, for it is the mere statement of a private opinion, and as I am not an MP, I can say what I like about Parliament. You will not mind my confessing to you my conviction and determination in this matter. I do not think we could quarrel, even if we had to separate. The letter was published, and was quoted in the House of Commons by Lord Robert Cecil amid general applause, but it was twenty years before a bill was passed that forbade this particular unpleasantness. While political corruption stirred Chesterton deeply, I think his outlook was even more affected by the progressive socialism of liberal legislation. He had honestly believed that the Liberal Party stood, on the whole, for liberty. He found that it stood increasingly for daily and hourly interferences with the lives of the people. He found, too, that the Liberal papers, which he held should have been foremost in criticism of these measures, were as determined to uphold measures brought in by a Liberal government as they had been to attack that the Tories brought forward. It had been well said by Mr. Belloc that Chesterton could never write as a party man. But to the ordinary party newspaper, such an attitude was utterly incomprehensible. I think that we can see also at this point how alien his fundamental outlook was from that even of the best members of his own party. A great admirer said to me the other day that it had taken her a long time to appreciate Chesterton's sociology. Quote, you see, I was brought up to think that it was quite right for the poor to have their teeth brushed by officials. This is undoubtedly the normal socialistic outlook, and the outlook most abhorrent to Chesterton. The philanthropist, he once said, is not a brother, he is a supercilious aunt. The five years of liberal government had been disillusioning to many others besides Belloc and the Chesterton brothers. Probably many men in newspaper offices and elsewhere continued vaguely to support the party to which their own paper belonged. But there were others who were in those days going through a struggle between principles and party, which became increasingly acute. Gilbert has described his own feelings in a review of Galsworthy's play, Loyalties, written several years later during the First World War. Quote, the author of Loyalty offers one simple and amazing delusion. He imagines that in those pre-war politics, liberalism was on the side of labor, on this point, at least, I can correct him from the most concrete experience. In the newspaper office where his hero lingered, wondering how much longer he could stand its pacifism, 
I was lingering and wondering how much longer I could stand its complete and fundamental capitalism, its invariable alliance with the employer, its invariable hostility to the striker. No such scene as that in which the liberal editor paced the room raving about his hopes of a revolution ever occurred in the liberal newspaper office that I knew. The least hint of a revolution would have caused quite as much horror there as in the offices of the Morning Post. On nothing was the pacifist more pacifist than upon that point. No workman so genuine as the workman who figures in loyalty ever figured among such liberals. The fact is that such liberalism was in no way whatever on the side of labor. On the contrary, it was on the side of the Labor Party. Both Chesterton and Belloc had begun to point out that a free press had almost disappeared from England. The revenue of most of the newspapers depended not on subscriptions, but on advertisement. Therefore, nothing could be said in them which was displeasing to their wealthy advertisers. Nor was this the worst of it. Very rich men were often owners of half a dozen papers or more and dictated their policy. An outstanding example was Alfred Harmsworth, Lord Northcliffe, whose newspapers ranged from the Times to the Daily Mail to Answers. Thus, to every section of the English people, Harmsworth was able to convey day by day such news as he thought best together with his own outlook and philosophy of life such as it was. Still worse, the Times had not lost in the eyes of Europe, to say nothing of America, that reputation it had held so long of being the official expression of English opinion. It was still the Jupiter of Trollope's day, the maker of ministries or their undoing. In the days of a free press, a paper held such a position in virtue of the talents of its staff. Editors were then powerful individuals and would brook little interference. But today the editor was commonly only the mouthpiece of the owner. It is surprising that Gilbert and the official liberal press so long tolerated one another. The Daily News and other papers owned by Mr. Cadbury of Cadbury's Cocoa were often referred to as the Cocoa Press, and it happened that it was not in the end political disagreement alone that brought the Chesterton-Cadbury alliance to an end. In one of Gilbert's poems in praise of wine are the lines, Coco is a cad and coward. Coco is a vulgar beast. In the autobiography, he tells us that after he had published the poem, he felt he could no longer write for the Daily News. He went from the Daily News to the Daily Herald, to the editor of which he wrote that the news, quote, had come to stand for almost everything I disagree with, and I thought I had better resign before the next great measure of social reform made it illegal to go on strike. G.K. was a considerable asset to any paper and had recently been referred to by Shaw in a debate with Bella as, quote, a flourishing property of Mr. Cadbury's. Politically, the break was bound to come, for even when Dickens was published, Gilbert Chesterton had reached the stage of saying, quote, as much as I ever did, more than I ever did, I believe in liberalism, but there was a rosy time of innocence when I believed in liberals. At this time, too, he infuriated an orthodox liberal journalist by saying of the party leaders, quote, Some of them are very nice old gentlemen, some of them are very nasty old gentlemen, and some of them are old without being gentlemen at all. An orthodox church journalist in a periodical charmingly entitled Church Bells got angrier yet. Quote, a certain Mr. G.K. Chesterton, he wrote, had, when speaking for the CSU in St. Paul's Chapter House, remarked, the best of His Majesty's ministers are agnostics, and the worst, devil worshippers. Church Bell cries out, We only mention this vulgar falsehood because we regret that an association, with which the names of many of our respected ecclesiastics are connected, should have allowed the bad taste and want of all gentlemanly feeling displayed by the words quoted to have passed unchallenged. Vulgar falsehood is surely charming. But perhaps even deeper than his disillusionment with any party was his growing sense of the unreality of the political scene. He has described it in the autobiography, quote, I was finding it difficult to believe in politics because the reality seemed almost unreal as compared with the reputation or the report. I could give 20 instances to indicate what I mean, but they would be no more than indications because the doubt itself was doubtful. I remember going to a great liberal club and walking about in a large crowded room, somewhere at the end of which a bald gentleman with a beard was reading something from a manuscript in a low voice. It was hardly unreasonable that we did not listen to him, because we could not in any case have heard, but I think a very large number of us did not even see him. It is possible, though not certain, 
that one or other of us asked carelessly what was supposed to be happening in the other corner of the large hall. Next morning I saw across the front of my liberal paper in gigantic headlines the phrase, Lord Spencer unfurls the banner. Under this were other remarks, also in large letters, about how he had flown the trumpet for free trade and how the blast would ring through England and rally all the free traders. It did appear, on careful examination, that the inaudible remarks which the old gentleman had read from the manuscript were concerned with the economic arguments for free trade, and very excellent arguments too, for all I know. But the contrast between what the orator was to the people who heard him and what he was to the thousands of newspaper readers who did not hear him was so huge a hiatus and disproportion that I do not think I ever quite got over it. I knew henceforward what was meant, or what might be meant, by a scene in the house, or a challenge from the platform, or any of those sensational events which take place in the newspapers and nowhere else. As in orthodoxy Chesterton had formulated his religious beliefs, so in What's Wrong with the World he laid the foundations of his sociology. It will be remembered that, giving evidence before the commission on the censorship, Chesterton declared himself to be concerned only with the good and happiness of the English people. Where he differed from nearly every other social reformer was that he believed that they should themselves decide what was for their own good and happiness. Quote, the body of ideas, says Monsignor Knox of Gilbert's sociology, which he labeled rather carelessly, distributism, is a body of ideas which still lasts, and I think will last, but it is not exactly a doctrine or a philosophy, it is simply Chesterton's reaction to life. Chapter 17 the disillusioned liberal. It may be said that a man's philosophy is in the main a formulation of his reaction to life. Anyhow, life seems to be the operative word, for it is the word that best conveys the richness of this first book of Chesterton's sociology. All the wealth of life's joys, life's experiences, is poured into his view of man and man's destiny. Already developing manhood to its fullest potential, he found in this book a new form of expression. To quote Monsignor Knox again, I call that man intellectually great, who is an artist in thought. I call that man intellectually great, who can work equally well in any medium. The poet philosopher worked surprisingly well in the medium of sociology. He had intended to call the book, What's Wrong? And it begins on this note of interrogation. The chapter called, The Medical Mistake, is a brilliant attack on the idea that we must begin social reform by diagnosing the disease. Quote, it is the whole definition and dignity of man that in social matters we must actually find the cure before we find the disease. The thing that is most terribly wrong with our modern civilization is that it has lost not only health, but the clear picture of health. The doctor called in to diagnose a bodily illness does not say, we have had too much scarlet fever, let us try a little measles for a change. But the sociological doctor does offer to the dispossessed proletarian a cure which, says Chesterton, is only another kind of disease. We cannot work towards a social ideal until we are certain what that ideal should be. We must, therefore, begin with principles, and we are to find those principles in the nature of man, largely through a study of his history. Man has had historically, and man needs for his fulfillment, the family, the home, and the possession of property. The notion of property has, for the modern age, been defiled by the corruptions of capitalism. But modern capitalism is really a negation of property because it is a denial of its limitations. He summarizes this idea with one of his most brilliant illustrations, quote, It is the negation of property that the Duke of Sutherland should have all the farms in one estate, just as it would be the negation of marriage if he had all our wives in one harem. But property in its real meaning is almost the condition for the survival of the family. It is its protection, it is the opportunity of its development. God has the joy of unlimited creation, he can make something out of nothing. But he has given to man the joy of limited creation, man can make something out of anything. Quote, Fruitful strife with limitations, self-expression with limits that are strict and even small. All this belongs to the artist but also to the average man, quote, property is merely the art of the democracy. The family, protected by the possession of some degree of property, will grow by its own laws. What are these laws? 
Clearly, there are two sets of problems, one concerned with life within the family, the other with the relation of the family to the state. These two sets of problems provide the subject matter of the book. On both, Chesterton felt that there had been insufficient thinking. Thus, he says of the first, quote, There is no brain work in the thing at all, no root query of what sex is, of whether it alters this or that. And of the second, quote, It is quite unfair to say that socialists believe in the state but do not believe in the family, but it is true to say that socialists are especially engaged in strengthening and renewing the state, and they are not especially engaged in strengthening and renewing the family. They are not doing anything to define the functions of father, mother, and child. As such, they have no firm instinctive sense of one thing being in its nature private and another public. It is precisely this kind of group thinking that the book does. In the free family, there will be a division of the two sides of life between the man and the woman. The man must be, to a certain extent, a specialist. He must do one thing well enough to earn the daily bread. The woman is the universalist. She must do a hundred things for the safeguarding and development of the home. The modern fad of talking of the narrowness of domesticity especially provoked Chesterton. Quote, I cannot, he said, with the utmost energy of imagination conceive what they mean. When domesticity, for instance, is called drudgery, all the difficulty arises from a double meaning in the word. If drudgery only means dreadfully hard work, I admit the woman drudges in the home as a man might drudge at the Cathedral of Amiens or drudge behind a gun at Trafalgar. But if it means that the hard work is more heavy because it is trifling, colorless, and of small import to the soul, then as I say, I give it up. I do not know what the words mean. To be Queen Elizabeth within a definite area, deciding sales, banquets, labors, and holidays, to be whitely within a certain area, providing toys, boots, sheets, cakes, and books, to be Aristotle within a certain area, teaching morals, manners, theology, and hygiene, I can understand how this might exhaust the mind, but I cannot imagine how it could narrow it. How can it be a large career to tell other people's children about the rule of three, and a small career to tell one's own children about the universe? How can it be broad to be the same thing to everyone, and narrow to be everything to someone? No, a woman's function is laborious, but because it is gigantic, not because it is minute. I will pity Mrs. Jones for the hugeness of her task, but I will never pity her for its smallness. While he was writing these pages, and after their appearance in print, G.K. was constantly asked to debate the question of woman's suffrage. He was an anti-suffragist, partly because he was a Democrat. The suffrage agitation in England was conducted by a handful of women, mainly of the upper classes, and it gave Cecil Chesterton immense pleasure to head articles on the movement with the words, Vote for Ladies. G.K. too felt that the suffrage agitation was really doing harm by dragging a red herring across the path of necessary social reform. If the vast majority of women did not want votes, it was undemocratic to force votes upon them. Also, if rich men had oppressed poor men all through the course of history, it was exceedingly probable that rich women would oppress poor women. But in What's Wrong with the World, and in debating on the subject, Chesterton brushed aside as absurd and irrelevant the suggestion that women were inferior to men, and what was called the physical force argument. But he did maintain that if the vote meant anything at all, which it probably did not in the England he was living in, it meant that side of life which belongs to masculinity, and which the normal woman dislikes and rather despises. Quote, all we men had grown used to our wives and mothers and grandmothers and great aunts, all pouring a chorus of contempt upon our hobbies of sport, drink, and party politics. And now comes Miss Pankhurst with tears in her eyes, owning that all the women were wrong and all the men were right. We told our wives that Parliament had sat late on most essential business, but it never crossed our minds that our wives would believe it. We said that everyone must have a vote in the country. Similarly, our wives said that no one must have a pipe in the drawing room. In both cases, the idea was the same, quote, It does not matter much, but if you let those things slide, there's chaos. We said that Lord Huggins or Mr. Buggins was absolutely necessary to the country. We knew quite well that nothing is necessary to the country except that the men should be men and the women women. We knew this, we thought the women knew it even more clearly, and we thought the women would say it. Suddenly, without warning, 
that women have begun to say all the nonsense that we ourselves hardly believe when we said it. All the agitated reformers who were running about and offering their various nostrums were prepared to confess that something had gone very wrong with modern civilization. But they suggested that what was wrong with the present generation of adults could be set right for the coming generation by means of education. In the last part of the book, Education, or The Mistake About the Child, he put the unanswerable question, how are we to give what we have not got? Quote, to hear people talk, one would think education was some sort of magic chemistry by which out of a laborious hodgepodge of hygienic meals, baths, breathing exercises, fresh air, and freehand drawing, we can produce something splendid by accident. We can create what we cannot conceive. The social reformers who were talking about education seem not to have seen very clearly what they meant by the word. They argued about whether it meant putting ideas into the child or drawing ideas out of the child. In any case, as Chesterton pointed out, you must choose which kind of ideas you are going to put in or even which kind you are going to draw out. Quote, there is indeed in each living creature a collection of forces and functions, but education means producing these in particular shapes and training them for particular purposes, or it means nothing at all. But to decide what they were trying to produce was altogether too much for the men who were directing education in our board schools. The public schools of England were often the target of Chesterton's attacks, but they had, he declared, one immense superiority over the board schools. The men who directed them knew exactly what they wanted, and were on the whole successful in producing it. Those responsible for the board schools seemed to have no idea excepting that of feebly imitating the public schools. One disadvantage of this was that, at its worst and at its best, the public school idea could only be applicable to a small governing class. The other disadvantage was that whereas in the public schools, the masters were working with the parents and trying to give the boys the same general shape as their homes would give them, the board schools were doing nothing of the kind. The schoolmaster of the poor never worked with the parents. Often he ignored them. Sometimes he positively worked against them. Such education was, Chesterton held, the very reverse of that which would prevail in a true democracy. Quote, we have had enough education for the people. We want education by the people. Chesterton felt keenly that while the faddists were perfectly prepared to take the children out of the hands of any parents who happened to be poor, they had not really the courage of their own convictions. They would expatiate upon methods. They could not define their aims. They would take refuge in such meaningless terms as progress or efficiency or success. They were not prepared to say what they wanted to succeed in producing, towards what goal they were progressing, or what was the test of efficiency and part of this inability arose from their curious fear of the past. Most movements of reform have looked to the past for the great part of their inspiration. To reform means to shape anew, and he pointed out that every revolution involves the idea of a return. On this point, G.K. attacked two popular sayings. One was, you can't put the clock back, but he said, you can, and you do constantly. The clock is a piece of mechanism which can be adjusted by the human finger. Quote, there is another proverb, as you have made your bed, so you must lie in it, which again is simply a lie. If I have made my bed uncomfortable, please God, I will make it again. It is easy to understand that this sort of philosophy should be out of tune with the socialist who looked with contempt on the wisdom of his forefathers. It is less easy to understand why it was unacceptable also to most of the Tories, one reviewer asked whether Mr. Chesterton was the hoariest of conservatives or the wildest of radicals, and with none of his books are the reviews so bewildered as they are with this one. Quote, the universe is ill-regulated, said the Liverpool Daily Post, according to the fancy of Mr. Chesterton, but we are inclined to think that if the deity were to talk over matters with him, he would soon come to see that a Chestertonian cosmos would be no improvement on things as they are. On the other hand, the Toronto Globe remarks, quote, His boisterous optimism will not admit that there is anything to sorrow over in the best of all possible worlds. The Observer suggested that Chesterton would find no disciples because, quote, His converts would never know from one week to another what they had been converted to. While the Yorkshire Post felt that the chief disadvantage of the book was that, quote, a shrewd reader can pretty accurately anticipate Mr. Chesterton's point of view on any subject whatsoever. 
It seems almost incredible that so definite a line of thought, so abundantly illustrated, should not have been clear to all his readers. Some reviewers, one supposes, had not read the book. But surely the Daily Telegraph was deliberately refusing to face a challenge when it wrote, quote, His whole book is an absurdity, but to be absurd for 300 pages on end is itself a work of genius. That particular reviewer was shirking a serious issue. He was the official Tory. But those whom I might call the unofficial Tories, such men for instance as my own father, received much of this book with delight, and yet declined to take Chesterton's sociology seriously, and I think it is worth trying to see why this was the case. In a letter to the Clarion, G.K. outlines his own position. Quote, if you want praise or blame for socialists, I have enormous quantities of both. Roughly speaking, one, I praise them to infinity because they want to smash modern society. Two, I blame them to infinity because of what they want to put in its place. As the smashing must, I suppose, come first, my practical sympathies are mainly with them. Such a confession of faith seemed shocking to the honest old-fashioned Tory, and because it shocked him, he made the mistake of calling it irresponsible. Chesterton frequently urged revolution as the only possible means of changing an intolerable state of things. But the word revolution suggested streets running with blood, and on the other hand, they had not the very faintest conception of how intolerable the state of things was against which Chesterton proposed to revolt. I think it must be said, too, that he was a little hazy as to the exact nature of the revolution he proposed. He certainly hoped to avoid the guillotine, and even when urging the restoration of the common lands to the people of England, he appended a note in which he talked of a land purchase scheme similar to that which George Wyndham had introduced in Ireland. But besides this tinge of vagueness in what he proposed, there was another weakness in his presentment of the sociology which I think was his chief weakness as a writer. It would be hard to find anyone who got so much out of words, proverbs, and popular sayings. He wrung every ounce of meaning out of them. He stood them on their heads. He turned them inside out. And everything he said he illustrated with the extraordinary wealth of fancy. But when you come to illustration by way of concrete facts, there is a curious change. In his sociology, he did the same thing that his best critics blamed in his literary biographies. He would take some one fact and appear to build upon it an enormous superstructure, and then, very often, it would turn out that the fact itself was inaccurately set down, and the average reader, discovering the inaccuracy, felt that the entire superstructure was on a rotten foundation and had fallen with it to the ground. Yet the ordinary reader was wrong. The fact had not been the foundation of his thought, but only the thing that had started from thinking. If the fact had not been there at all, his thinking would have been neither more nor less valid, but most readers could not see the distinction. It is a little difficult to make the point clear, but anyone who has read Browning and the Dickens and then read the reviews of them will recognize what I mean. It was universally acknowledged that Chesterton might commit a hundred inaccuracies and yet get at the heart of his subject in a way that most painstaking biographer and critic could not emulate. The more deeply one reads Dickens or Browning, the more one studies their lives, the more one is confirmed as to the profound truth of the Chesterton estimate and the genius of his insight. A superficial glance sees only the errors, a deeper gaze discovers the truth. It is exactly the same with the sociology. But here we are in a field where there is far more prejudice. When Chesterton talked of state interference and used again and again the same illustration, that of children whose hair was forcibly cut short in the board school, two questions were asked by socialists. Was this a solitary incident? Was it accurately reported? When a paying doctor wrote to the papers saying the incident had been merely one of a request to parents who had gladly complied for fear their children should catch things from other and dirtier children, it appeared as though G.K. had built far too much on this one point. It was not the case. He was not building on the incident. He was illustrating by the incident but it must be admitted that he was incredibly careless in investigating such incidents and quite indifferent as to his own accuracy. And this was foolish, for he could have found in police court records and the pages of John Bull and later of the eyewitness itself abundance of well-verified illustrations of his thesis. In the same way, when he talked of the robbery of the people of England by the great landlords, 
he did not take the slightest trouble to prove his case to the many who knew nothing of the matter. It must be remembered that the sociological side of English history was only just beginning to be explored to any serious extent. In The Village Laborer, Mr. and Mrs. Hammond point out to what an extent they had to depend on the Home Office papers and contemporary documents for the mass of facts which this book and the town laborer brought for the first time to the knowledge of the general public. Chesterton had worked with Hammond and the speaker for some years. Just as with his book about Shaw, so too with the background of the sociology, he could have got round the corner and got the required information. He knew the thing in general terms. He would not be bothered to make the knowledge convincing to his readers. If to his genius for expounding ideas had been added an awareness of the necessity of marshalling and presenting facts, he must surely have convinced all men of goodwill. For in this matter, the facts were there to marshal. It was less than a hundred years since the last struggle of the English yeomen against a wholesale robbery and confiscation that catastrophically altered the whole shape of our country. And it seems to have left no trace in the memory of the English poor. In Northanger Abbey, Jane Austen describes Catherine Morland finding the traces of an imaginary crime. But Chesterton comments that the crime she failed to discover was the very real one that the owner of Northanger Abbey was not an abbot. The ordinary Englishman, however, thinks little of a crime that consisted in robbing a lot of lazy monks. That they had possessed so much of the land of England merely seemed to make the act a more desirable one, yet it was a confiscation, not so much of the monks' lands as of the people's land administered by the monasteries. What is even less realized is how much of the structure of the medieval village remained after the Reformation, and how widespread was small ownership nearly to the end of the 18th century, when enclosures began, estimated by the Hammonds, at five million acres. This land ceased in effect to be the common property of the poor and became the private property of the rich. This business of the enclosures must be treated at some little length because it had the same key position in Chesterton's sociological thinking as the Marconi case, shortly to be discussed, had in his political. In every village of England had been small freeholders, copyholders, and cottagers, all of whom had varying degrees of possession in the common lands which were administered by a manorial court of the village. These common lands were not mere stretches of heath and gorse, but consisted partly of arable, cultivated in strips with strict rules of rotation, partly of grazing land, and partly of wood and heath. Most people in the village had a right to a strip of arable, to cut firing of brushwood and turf, and rushes for thatch, and to pasture one or more cows, their pigs, and their geese. A village cowherd looked after all the animals and brought them back at night. Cobbett, in his cottage economy, to a new edition of which Chesterton wrote a preface, reckoned that a cottager with a quarter acre of garden could well keep a cow on his own cabbages plus common land grazing, could fatten his own pig, and have to buy very little food for his family except grain and hops for home baking and brewing. He puts a cottager's earning, working part-time for a farmer, at about ten shilling a week. This figure would vary, but the possession of property in stock and common rights would tide over bad times. A man with fire and wood could be quasi-independent, and indeed some of the larger farmers, witnessing before enclosure and quarry committees, complained of this very spirit of independence as producing idleness and sauciness. The case for the enclosures was that improved agricultural methods could not be used in the open fields. More food was grown for increasing town populations, much wasteland plowed, livestock immeasurably improved. Only later was the cost counted when cheap imported food for these same towns had slain English agriculture. The compensation, in small plots or sums of money, could not for the smaller commoners replace what they had lost, even when they had succeeded in getting it. Claims had to be made in writing, and few cottagers could write. How difficult, too, to reduce to its money value a claim for cutting turf or pasturing pigs and geese. A commissioner who had administered twenty enclosure acts lamented to Arthur Young that he had been the means of ruining two thousand poor people. But the gulf was so great between rich and poor that all the commons had meant to the poor was not glimpsed by the rich. Arthur Young had thought the benefits of common perfectly contemptible, but by 1801 he was deeply repentant and trying in vain to arrest the movement he had helped to start. Before enclosure, the English cottager had had milk, butter, and cheese in plenty, homegrown pork and bacon, home-brewed beer, and home-baked bread. 
his own vegetables, although Cobbett scorned green rubbish for human food, and advised it to be fed to cattle only, his own eggs, and poultry. After enclosure, he could get no milk, for the farmers would not sell it, no meat, for his wages could not buy it, and he no longer had a pig to provide the fat bacon commended by Cobbett. Working long hours, he lived on bread, potatoes, and tea, and insufficient even of these. Lord Winchelsea, one of the very few landowners who resisted the trend of the time, mentioned in the House of Lords the discovery of four laborers starved to death under a hedge and said this was a typical occurrence. At the beginning of the enclosure period, the Industrial Revolution was barely in its infancy. A large part of the spinning, weaving, and other manufactures was carried on in the cottages of men who had gardens they could dig in and cows and pigs of their own. The invention of power machines, the discovery of coal, wherewith those machines could be worked, led to the concentration of factories in the huge cities, but it was the drift from the villages of dispossessed men, together with the cheap child labor provided by poor law guardians, that made possible the starvation wages and the tyranny of the factory system. And here the tyrants were largely of a different class. There were some landowners who also had factories, and more who possessed coal mines, but many of the manufacturers had themselves come from the class of the dispossessed. Successful manufacturers made money, a great deal of money. Many of the men's appeals gave the figures at which the goods were sold in contrast with their rate of wages, and the contrast is startling. So as the towns grew, the masters left the smoke they were creating and bought country places and became country gentlemen, preserved their own game, and judged their own tenants and thus disappeared yet another section of the ancient country folk. For the large landowners would seldom sell, and the land bought by the new men was mostly the land of small farmers and yeomen. This was the age of new country houses with a hundred rooms, and the vast offices that housed an army of servants. Labor was cheap, the descendants of those who built just then will tell you, as they gazed as consulent at their unwieldy heritage. Old and new families alike built or rebuilt, added and approved. Cobbett rode roarily and angrily through the ruins of a better England, described a century earlier by another horseman, Daniel Defoe. Goldsmith mourned an early example in his deserted village, but they are the only voices in an abundant literature. Jane Austen is indeed the perfect example of what Chesterton always realized, the ignorance that was almost innocence, with which the wealthy had done their work of destruction. He did not account them as evil, as they would seem by a mere summary of events. And what he saw at the root of those events was in his eyes still present. England was still possessed and still governed by a minority. The conservatives were, quote, a minority that was rich. The liberals, quote, a minority that was mad. And those two minorities tended to join together and rob and oppress the ordinary man in the name of some theory of progress and perfection. Thus the Protestant Reformation had closed the monasteries, which were the poor man's inns, in the name of a purer religion. The economists had taken away his land and driven him into the factories with a promise of future wealth and prosperity. These had been the experts of their day. Now the new experts were telling him with equal eagerness that hygienic flats and communal kitchens would bring about for him the new Jerusalem. But never did the expert think of asking Jones, the ordinary man, what he himself wanted. Jones just wanted the, quote, divinely ordinary things, a house of his own and a family life, and that was still denied him as is related in the chapter called The Homelessness of Jones. In a debate in the Oxford Union, G.K. maintained that the House of Lords was a menace to the state because it failed precisely in what was supposed to be its main function, that of conservation. It had not saved, it had destroyed the church lands, and the common lands, and was ready to pass any bill that affected only the lower classes. Quote, We are all socialists now, Sir William Harcourt had lately said, and Chesterton saw that socialism would mean merely further restriction of liberty and continued coercion of the poor by the experts and the rich. So, looking at the past, Chesterton desired a restoration, which he often called a revolution. There were two forms of government that might succeed, a real monarchy, in which one ordinary man governed many ordinary men, or a real democracy, in which many ordinary men governed themselves. Aristocracy may have begun well in England, when it was an army protecting England, 
when the Duke was a Ducks, now it was merely a plutocracy, and it had become a, quote, an army without an enemy billeted on the people. All this and more formed the background of Chesterton's mind, but what he wrote was a comment on the scene, not a picture of it. He wrote of the terrible irony whereby, quote, the commons were enclosing the commons. He spoke of the English revolution of the 18th century, quote, a revolution of the rich against the poor. He mourned with Goldsmith the destruction of England's peasantry. He cried aloud like Cobbett, for he too had discovered the murder of England, his mother. But his cry was unintelligible, and his hopes of a resurrection unmeaning to those who knew not what had been done to death. Recording by Candace Tuttle. Chapter 18 The Eyewitness. The publication of What's Wrong with the World brings us to 1910. Gilbert had, as we have seen, originally intended to call the book What's Wrong laying some emphasis on the note of interrogation. It amused him to perplex the casual visitor by going off to his study with the muttered remark, I must get on with what's wrong. The change of name and the omission of the note of interrogation, both changes the act of his publishers, represented a certain loss. For indeed, Gilbert was still asking himself what was wrong when he was writing this book. Although he was very certain what was right, his ideals were really a clear picture of health. His doubts about the achievement of those ideals in the present world and with his present political allegiance were, as he suggests in the autobiography, vague but becoming more definite. Did this mean that he ever looked hopefully towards the other big division of the English political scene? The Tory or Conservative Party to which his brother had once declared he belonged without knowing it? That would be a simpler story than what really happened in his mind. And I confess that I myself am sufficiently vague and doubtful about part of what the Chester Bellock believed they were discovering to find it a little difficult to describe it clearly. Cecil Chesterton and Bellock set down their views in a book called The Party System. Gilbert made his clear in letters to the liberal press. The English party system had often enough been attacked for its obvious defects. And indeed, the new witness's even livelier contemporary John Bull was shouting for its abolition. But Bellock and Cecil Chesterton had their own line. Their general thesis was that not only did the people of England not govern, Parliament did not govern either. The cabinet governed, and it was chosen by the real rulers of the party. For each party was run by an oligarchy, and run roughly on the same lines. Lists were given of families whose brothers-in-law and cousins, though not yet their sisters and their aunts, found place in the ministry of one or other political party. Moreover, the governing families on both sides were in many cases connected by birth or marriage, and all belonged to the same social set. But money too was useful. Men could buy their way in. Each party had a fund, and those who could contribute largely had of necessity an influence on party policy. The existent liberal government had brought to a totally new peak the art of swelling its fund by the sale of titles, which in many instances meant the sale of hereditary governing powers since those higher titles, which carry with them a seat in the House of Lords, were sold like the others, at a higher rate, naturally. For the rank-and-file member, a political career no longer meant the chance for talents and courage to win recognition in an open field. A man who believed that his first duty was to represent his constituents stood no chance of advancement. Certainly a private member could not introduce a bill as his own and get it debated on its merits. None of this was new, though the book did it rather exceptionally well. What was new was the theory that the two party oligarchies were secretly won, that the fights between the parties were little more than sham fights. The ordinary party member was unaware of this secret conspiracy between the leaders and would obey the call of the party whip, 
and accept a sort of military discipline with the genuine belief that the defeat of his party would mean disaster to his country. Belloc had discovered for himself the impotence of the private member. He had, as we have seen, been elected to Parliament by South Salford in 1906 as a Liberal. In Parliament, he proposed a measure for the publication of the names of subscribers to the party funds. Naturally enough, the proposal got nowhere. Also naturally enough, the party funds were not forthcoming to support him at the next election. He fought and won the seat as an independent. At the second election of 1910, he declined to stand, having lucidly explained to the House of Commons in a final speech that a seat there was of no value under the existing system. Thus, Bellock's own experience, and a thousand other things, went to prove the stranglehold the rulers of the party had on the party. But did it prove, or did the book establish, the theory of a behind-scenes conspiracy between the small groups who controlled each of the great historical parties, which was the theme not only of the party system, but also of Bellock's brilliant political novels, notably Mr. Clutterbuck's Election and Pongo and the Bull. Of the stranglehold, there was no doubt, and Gilbert soon found it too much for his own allegiance to the Liberal Party or any other. At the election of 1910, he addressed a Liberal meeting at Beaconsfield and dealt vigorously with constant Tory questions and interjections from the back of the hall. He obviously enjoyed the fight, and a little later he spoke for the League of Young Liberals and was photographed standing at the back of their van. But although he went to London to vote for John Burns in Battersea and would probably have continued to vote Liberal or Labour, he showed at a women's suffrage meeting in 1911 a growing skepticism about the value of the vote. He was reported as saying, If I voted for John Burns now, I should not be voting for anything at all. Laughter. It must have been irritating that this interpolation, laughter, was liable to occur when Chesterton was most serious. He did not change quickly, but in the alteration of his outlook towards his party, his growing doubt whether it stood for any real values, he was very serious. In the years that followed the coming into power of liberalism, there were a multitude of acts described as of little importance and passed into law after little or no discussion. At the same time, private members complained that they could get no attention for really urgent matters of social reform. The nation, as a party paper, defended the state of things and talked of official business and of want of time. Their attitude was vigorously attacked by Gilbert, whose first letter, January 17, 1911, ended with this paragraph. Who ever dreamed of getting perfect freedom and fullness of discussion, except in heaven? The case urged against cabinets is that we have no freedom and no discussion, except that laid down despotically by a few men on front benches. Your assurance that Parliament is very busy is utterly vain. It is busy on things the dictators direct. That small men and small questions get squeezed out among big ones, that is a normal disaster. With us, on the contrary, it is the big questions that get squeezed out. The party was not allowed, really, to attack the South African War, for fear it should alienate Mr. Asquith. It was not allowed to object to Mr. Herbert Gladstone, or is it Lord Gladstone? This blaze of democracy blinds one. When he sought to abolish the Habeas Corpus Act, and leave the poorer sort of pickpockets permanently at the caprice of their jailers. Parliament is busy on the aristocratic fads, and mankind must mark time with a million stamping feet, while Mr. Herbert Samuel searches a gutter boy for cigarettes. That is what you call the congestion of Parliament. The editor of the nation was so rash as to append to this letter the words, we must be stupid for we have no idea what Mr. Chesterton means. 
This was too good an opening to be lost. GK returned to the charge, and I feel that this correspondence is so important in various ways that the next two letters should be given in full. Sir, in a note to my last week's letter, you remark, we must be stupid, but we have no idea what Mr. Chesterton means. As an old friend, I can assure you that you are by no means stupid. Some other explanation of this unnatural darkness must be found, and I find it in the effect of that official party phraseology which I attack, and which I am by no means alone in attacking. If I had talked about true imperialism or our loyalty to our gallant leader, you might have thought you knew what I meant, because I meant nothing. But I do mean something, and I do want you to understand what I mean. I will, therefore, state it with total dullness in separate paragraphs, and I will number them. 1. I say a democracy means a state where the citizens first desire something and then get it. That is surely simple. 2. I say that where this is deflected by the disadvantage of representation, it means that the citizens desire a thing and tell the representatives to get it. I trust I make myself clear. 3. The representatives, in order to get it at all, must have some control over detail, but the design must come from popular desire. Have we got that down? 4. You, I understand, hold that English MPs today do thus obey the public in design, varying only in detail. This is a quite clear contention. 5. I say they don't. Tell me if I am being too abstruse. 6. I say our representatives accept designs and desires almost entirely from the cabinet class above them, and particularly not at all from the constituents below them. I say the people does not wield a parliament which wields a cabinet. I say the cabinet bullies a timid parliament which bullies a bewildered people. Is that plain? 7. If you ask why the people endure and play this game, I say they play it as they would play the official games of any despotism or aristocracy. The average Englishman puts his cross on a ballot paper as he takes off his hat to the king, and would take it off if there were no ballot papers. There is no democracy in the business. Is that definite? 8. If you ask why we have thus lost democracy, I say from two causes. A. The omnipotence of an unelected body, the cabinet. B. The party system, which turns all politics into a game like the boat race. Is that all right? 9. If you want examples, I could give you scores. I say the people did not cry out that all children whose parents lunch on cheese and beer in an inn should be left out in the rain. I say the people did not demand that a man's sentence should be settled by his jailers instead of by his judges. I say these things came from a rich group, not only without any evidence, but really without any pretense that they were popular. I say the people hardly heard of them at the polls, but here I do not need to give examples, but merely to say what I mean. Surely I have said it now. Yours, G.K. Chesterton. January 26th, 1911. Editor's Note. Mr. Chesterton is precise enough now, but he is precisely wrong. There are grains of truth in his premises, a bushel of exaggeration in his conclusions. We have not lost democracy. The two instances which he alleges, both of which we dislike, are too small to prove so large a case. To this, G.K. replied, Sir, I want to thank you for printing my letters, and especially for your last important comment in which you say that the Crimes and Children's Acts were bad, but are too small to support a charge of undemocracy. And I want to ask you one last question. Which is the question? 
Why do you think of these things as small? They are really enormous. One alters the daily habits of millions of people. The other destroys the public law of thousands of years. What can be more fundamental than food, drink, and children? What can be more catastrophic than putting us back in the primal anarchy in which a man was flung into a dungeon and left there till he listened to reason? There has been no such overturn in European ethics since Constantine proclaimed the cross. Why do you think of these things as small? I will tell you, unconsciously no doubt, but simply and solely because the front benches did not announce them as big. They were not first-class measures. They were not full-dress debates. The governing class got them through in the quick, quiet, secondary way in which they pass things that the people positively detest. Not in the pompous, lengthy, oratorical way in which they present measures that the people merely bets on, as it might on a new horse. A first-class measure means, for instance, tinkering for months at some tottery compromise about a religious education that doesn't exist. The reason is simple. Sound church teaching and dogmatic Christianity both happen to be hobbies in the class from which the cabinets come. But going to the public houses and going to prison are both habits with which that class is, unfortunately, quite unfamiliar. It is ready, therefore, at a stroke of the pen, to bring all folly into the taverns and all injustice into the jails. Yours, G.K. Chesterton, February 2nd, 1911. It was not only in the nation that such letters as these appeared. We can't write in every paper at once, runs a letter in the new age. We do our best. We meant Gilbert, Cecil, and Hilaire Bella. And G.K. goes on to answer four questions which have been put by a correspondent, signing himself political journalist. First, in whose eyes but ours has the party system lost credit? I say in nearly everybody's. If this were a free country, I could mention offhand a score of men within a stone's throw, an innkeeper, a doctor, a shopkeeper, a lawyer, a civil servant. As it is, I may put it this way. In a large debating society, I proposed to attack the party system, and for a long time, I could not get an opposer. At last, I got one. He defended the party system on the ground that people must be bamboozled, more or less. Second, he asks if the party system does not govern the country to the content of most citizens. I answer, that Englishmen are happy under the party system, solely and exactly as Romans were happy under Nero. This is not because government was good, but because life is good, even without good government. Nero's slaves enjoyed Italy, not Nero. Modern Englishmen enjoy England, but certainly not the British Constitution. The legislation is detested wherever it is even felt the other day, a Cambridge Don complained that, when out bicycling with his boys, he had to leave them in the rain while he drank a glass of cider. Count the whole series of human souls between a costermonger and a Cambridge Don, and you will see a nation in mutiny. Third, what substitute, etc., etc. Here again, the answer is simple, and indeed traditional. I suggest we should do what was always suggested in the riddles and revolutions of the recent centuries. In the 17th century phrase, I suggest that we should call a free parliament. Fourth, is democracy compatible with parliamentary government? God forbid. Is God compatible with church government? Why should he be? It is the other things that have to be compatible with God. A church can only be a humble effort to utter God. A parliament can only be a humble effort to express man. But for all that, there is a deal of common sense left in the world, 
and people do know when priests or politicians are honestly trying to express a mystery, and when they are only taking advantage of an ambiguity. G.K. Chesterton Encouraged by the excitement that had attended the publication of the party system, its authors decided to attempt a newspaper of their own. This paper is still in existence, but it has, in the course of its history, appeared under four different titles. To avoid later confusion, I had better set these down at the outset. The Eyewitness, June 1911 through October 1912. The New Witness, November 1912 through May 1923. G.K.'s Weekly, 1925 through 1936. The Weekly Review, 1936 till today. During the first year of its existence, the eyewitness was edited by Belloc. Cecil Chesterton took over the editorship after a short interregnum during which he was assistant editor. Charles Granville had financed it. When he went bankrupt, the title was altered to The New Witness. When Cecil joined the army in 1916, G.K. became editor. In 1923, the paper died, but two years later rose again under the title G.K.'s Weekly. After Gilbert's own death, Belloc took it back. Today, as the Weekly Review, it is edited by Reginald Jeff, Belloc's son-in-law. With all these changes of name, the continuity of the paper is unmistakable. Its main aim may be roughly defined under two headings. One, to fight for the liberty of Englishmen against increasing enslavement to a plutocracy. Two, to expose and combat corruption in public life. The fight for liberty appears in the letters quoted above in the form of an attack on certain bills. Belloc unified and defined it with real genius in the articles which became two of his most important books, The Servile State and the restoration of property. If these two books be set beside Chesterton's What's Wrong with the World and The Outline of Sanity, the Chester Bellock sociology stands complete. In his Cobbett, G.K. was later to emphasize the genius with which Cobbett saw the England of today, a hundred years before it was there to be seen. Bellock, in the same way, saw both what was coming and the way in which it was coming. Especially far-sighted was his attitude to Lloyd George's Compulsory Health Insurance Act. It was the first act of the kind in England, and the scheme and outline was, every week, every employed person must have a stamp stuck on a card by his employer, of which he paid slightly less, and the employer slightly more than half the cost. The money thus saved gave the insured person free medical treatment and a certain weekly sum during the period of illness. Agricultural laborers were omitted from the act, and a ferment raged on the question of domestic servants, who were eventually included in its operation. It was practically acknowledged that this was done to make the act more workable financially. For domestic servants were an especially healthy class, and moreover, in most upper and middle class households, they were already attended by the family doctor without cost to themselves. The company in which the eyewitness found itself in opposing this act was indeed a case of strange bedfellows. For the opposition was led by the conservatives on the ground that the act was socialism. Many a mistress and many a maid did I hear in those days in good conservative homes declaring they would rather go to prison than lick Lloyd George's stamps. Most liberals, on the other hand, regarded the act as an example of enlightened legislation for the benefit of the poor. The eyewitness saw in it the arrival of the servile state. Their main objections cut deep. As with compulsory education, but in much more far-reaching fashion, 
This act took away the liberty and the personal responsibilities of the poor, and in doing so, put them into a category, forever ticketed and labeled, separated from the other part of the nation. As people for whom everything had to be done, they were increasingly at the mercy of their employers, of government inspectors, of philanthropic societies, increasingly slaves. What was meant by the servile state? It was, said Belloc, an arrangement of society in which so considerable a number of the families and individuals are constrained by positive law to labor for the advantage of other families and individuals as to stamp the whole community with the mark of such labor. It was, quite simply, the return of slavery as the condition of the poor. And the Chester Belloc did not think, then or ever, that any increase of comfort or security was a sufficient good to be bought at the price of liberty. In a section of the paper called Lex versus the Poor, the editor made a point of collecting instances of oppression. A series of articles attacked the mentally deficient bill, whereby poor parents could have their children taken from them. Those children who most needed them and whom they often loved and clung to above the others. And a Jewish contributor to the paper, Dr. Ader, pointed out in admirable letters how divided was the medical profession itself on what constituted mental deficiency and whether family life was not far more likely to develop the mind than segregation with other deficients in an institution. To the official harriers of the poor, were added further inspectors sent by such societies as the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. Cruelty to children, as Gilbert often pointed out, is a horrible thing, but very seldom proved of parents against their own children. The word was stretched to cover anything that these inspectors called neglect. Lately, we have read of a case, and many like it were reported in The New Witness, where failure to wash children adequately was called cruelty. And what was the remedy? To take away the father, the breadwinner, to prison. For insufficient food and clothes, to substitute destitution. For insufficient care, to remove the only one the child had to care for them at all. Always to break up the family. Worst of all was the question of school attendance. While a child of three was dying of starvation, the mother was at the police court, where she was fined for not sending an older child to school. As she could not pay the fine, her husband was sent to prison for a week. A child died of consumption. The parents said at the inquest they had not dared to keep her at home when she got sick for fear of the school inspector. As he had, in What's Wrong with the World, been fired by the thought of the landless poor of England, so now these stories stirred Gilbert deeply. He saw the philanthropists, like the Pharisees, unheeding the wisdom learned by the wise men at Bethlehem, saw them with their busy pencils, peering at the mother's omissions, while the vast crimes of the state went unchallenged. He wrote a poem called The Neglected Child, and dedicated in a glow of Christian charity to a philanthropic society. The teachers in the temple, they did not lift their eyes for the blazing star of Bethlehem or the wise men grown wise. They heeded jot and tittle, they heeded not a jot, the rending voice and Rama and the children that were not. Or how the panic of the poor choked all the fields with flight or how the red sword of the rich ran ravening through the night. They made their notes well naked and monstrous and obscene, a tyrant bathed in all the blood of men that might have been. But they did chide Our Lady and tax her for this thing, that she had lost him for a time and sought him sorrowing. To most of the eyewitness group, the fight for freedom was so bound up with the fight against corruption that all was but one fight. 
I think that when they looked back, they were much too inclined to see the shadow of Lloyd George behind them, as well as around them. That in fact, the Liberal Party of those years had brought with it a new descent in political decency, a descent which would have startled both Gladstone and the more cynical Disraeli. Of this more when we come to Marconi. Meanwhile, there was certainly a whole lot to fight about, and the group responsible for the witness, not content with the pen, formed a society entitled The League for Clean Government, with Mr. John Skurr as secretary. This league specialized in promoting the candidate of independent members of parliament for such vacancies as occurred between general elections, and in attacking party placement. Doubtless, other elements were present at some of these by-elections, but the League boasted its success on several occasions, notably in the three defeats sustained by C.F.G. Masterman. Charles Masterman had been with Gilbert and Cecil Chesterton, a member of the group of young Christian socialists that drew its inspiration in great part from Canon Scott Holland. He had gone further than most of them, in his practical sympathy and understanding for the destitute. With a friend, he had taken a workman's flat in the slums, and he had written a somewhat florid but very moving book, recording conditions experienced as well as observed. He was one of the young liberals who entered Parliament full of ardor to fight the battles of the poor. The sequel, as they saw it, may best be told by Bellant and Cecil Chesterton themselves. In the party system, they wrote, Mr. Masterman entered Parliament as a liberal of independent views. During his first two years in the House, he distinguished himself as a critic of the liberal ministry. He criticized their education bill. He criticized with especial force the policy of Mr. John Burns at the local government board. His conduct attracted the notice of the leaders of the party. He was offered office, accepted it, and since then has been silent, except for an occasional rhetorical exercise in defense of the government. One fact will be sufficient to emphasize the change. On March 13, 1908, Mr. Masterman voted for the Right to Work Bill of the Labor Party. In May of the same year, he accepted a place with a salary of 1,200 pounds a year. It has since risen to 1,500 pounds. On April 20th, 1909, he voted, at the bidding of the party whips, against the same bill which he had voted for in the previous year. Yet this remarkable example of the peril of change, the title of one of Masterman's books was In Peril of Change, does not apparently create any indignation or even astonishment in the political world which Mr. Masterman adorns. On the contrary, he seems to be generally regarded as a politician of exceptionally high ideals. No better instance need be recorded of the peculiar atmosphere it is the business of these pages to describe. At the succeeding general election, Masterman was not re-elected and he failed again in a couple of by-elections. In all these elections, the League for Clean Government campaigned fiercely against him. There was certainly in the feeling of Bellock and Cecil Chesterton towards Masterman a great deal of the bitterness that moved Browning to write, just for a handful of silver he left us. And I do not think there is anything in the history of the paper that created so strong a feeling against it in certain minds. There seemed something peculiarly ungenerous in the continued attacks after a series of defeats, in the insistence with which Masterman's name was dragged in, always accompanied by sneers. Replying to a remonstrance to this effect, Cecil Chesterton, then editor of The New Witness, stated that in his considered opinion, it was a duty to make a successful career impossible to any man convicted of selling his principles for success. I dwell on this matter of Masterman for two reasons. The first is that it was one of the rare occasions 
on which Gilbert Chesterton disagreed with his brother and Belloc. Gilbert was a very faithful friend. It would be hard to find a broken friendship in his life. He had, moreover, much of the power that aroused his enthusiasm in Browning of going into the depths of a character and discovering the virtue concealed there. And as with Browning, his explanation took account of elements that really existed but could find no place in a more narrowly adverse view. Many of my own best friends, he wrote of Masterman, entirely misunderstood and underrated him. It is true that as he rose higher in politics, the veil of the politician began to descend a little on him also. But he became a politician from the noblest bitterness on behalf of the poor. And what was blamed in him was the fault of much more ignoble men. But he was also an organizer and liked governing. Only his pessimism made him think that government had always been bad and was now no worse than usual. Therefore, to men on fire for reform, he came to seem an obstacle and an official apologist. After G.K. became editor of The New Witness, the attacks on Masterman ceased. But he did not differ from the two earlier editors in his views on the ethics of political action or the principles of social reform. The second reason for which the Masterman matter must be dwelt on is because it affords the best illustration of one curious fact in connection with the I and New Witness campaign. When the life of Masterman recently appeared, I seized it eagerly that I might read an authoritative defense of his position. I searched the index under Eyewitness, New Witness, Cecil Chesterton, and League for Clean Government. No one of them was mentioned. At last, I discovered under Belloc and Skur a faint allusion to their activities at a by-election in which Belloc was coupled with the Protestant alliance leader, Kensin, as part of a contemptible opposition. And the unnamed League for Clean Government, described as those working with Mr. Skur. Clearly, where it is possible to use against something powerful, the weapon of ignoring it, as though it were something obscure, that weapon is itself a powerful one. Against the new witness, it was used perpetually. A paper which included among its contributors Hilaire Bellet, G.K. Chesterton, J.S. Fillmore, E.C. Bentley, Wells, Shaw, Catherine Tynan, Desmond McCarthy, F.Y. Eccles, G.S. Street, to name only those who come first to mind, obviously stood high. Cecil Chesterton's own editorials Hugh O'Donnell's picturesque series, 20 Years After, the high level of the reviewing, and, oddly enough, considering the paper's outlook, the financial articles of Raymond Radcliffe were all outstanding. The sales, at sixpence, were never enormous, but the readers were on a high cultural level. The correspondence pages are always interesting. The eyewitness group, besides courage, had high spirits, and they had wits. Capulet's Rhymes, the series of ballads written by Baring, Bentley, Fillmore, Belloc, and G.K.C., Mrs. Markham's History, written by Belloc, there was little of this quality in the other weeklies. Side by side with the serious attacks was a line of satire and of sheer fooling. The silver deal in India was being attacked in the editorials. Well, Mrs. Markham explained to Tommy how good, kind Lord Swaveling, really a Samuel, had lent money to his brother, Mr. Montague, another Samuel, for the benefit of the poor people of India. The next week, Tommy and Rachel grew enthusiastic about the kindness of Lord Swaveling in borrowing money that the Indian government could not use. Mrs. Markham, too, made Rachel take a pencil and write out a list of Samuels, including the Postmaster General, now so busy over the Marconi case. The next lesson was about titles. Then came one about policemen, and finally about company promoters and investments. How a promoter guesses there is oil somewhere, 
how money is lent to dig for it. But Mama, how can money dig? How the company promoter may find no oil. How if they think he has cheated them, the rich men who lent their money can have him tried by 12 good men and true. Tommy, how do they know the men are good and true, Mama? Mrs. M. They do this by taking them in alphabetical order out of a list. Perhaps the combination of irony thinly veiling intensity of purpose, with humor sometimes degenerating into wild fooling, damned them in the eyes of many. But there was a more serious obstacle to the real effectiveness they might otherwise have had. When it was unavoidable to name the new witness, its opponents referred to it as though to a rag. Why was this possible? Principally, I think, because of the violence of its language. Most parliamentary matters to which it made reference were spoken of as instances of foul corruption or dirty business. Transactions by ministers were said to stink, while the ministers themselves were described as carrying off or distributing swag and boodle. In volume two of the eyewitness, for instance, we find the game of boodle, dirty trick, keep your eye on the railway bill, you are going to be fleeced, and stunt and ramp passing. Mr. Lloyd George and Sir Rufus Isaacs are always called George and Isaacs. The general of the Salvation Army is invariably Old Booth, while in the headlines, the word scandal constantly recurs. Even admirers were at times like Fox's followers, who groaned, what a passion he was in tonight. Men in a passion must be in the wrong, and heavens how dangerous when they're built so strong. Thus the great Whig, amid immense applause, scared off his clients and bawled down his cause, undid reform by lauding revolution, till cobblers cry, God save the Constitution. Recording by Dick Bourgeois Doyle. Chapter 19, Part 1, Marconi. In his autobiography, Gilbert Chesterton has set down his belief that the Marconi scandal will be seen by historians as a landmark in English history. To him personally, the revelations produced by it were a great shock and gave the death blow to all that still lingered of his belief in the Liberal Party. For the rest of his life, it may almost be called an obsession with him. In his eyes, it was so great a landmark that as others spoke of events pre or post-war, he divided the political history of England into pre and post Marconi. It meant as much for his political outlook as the enclosures for his social. It is necessary to know what happened in the Marconi case if we are to understand a most important element in Chesterton's mental history. The difficulty is to know what did happen. The main lines of a very complicated bit of history have never, so far as I know, been disentangled by anyone whose only interest was to disentangle them, and the partisans have naturally tangled them more. I wrote a draft chapter after reading the 2,000-page report of the Parliamentary Committee, the 600-page report of Cecil Chesterton's trial, and masses of contemporary journalism. Then, in the circumstances I have related in the introduction, I called in my husband's aid. The rest of this chapter is mainly his. 1. What the Ministers Did The Imperial Conference of 1911 had approved the plan of a chain of state-owned wireless stations to be erected throughout the British Empire. The post office, Mr. Herbert Samuel being the postmaster general, was instructed to put the matter in hand. After consideration of competing systems, the Marconi was chosen, the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company of London, of which Mr. Godfrey Isaacs was managing director, was asked to tender for the work. Its tender was accepted on March 7, 1912. The main terms of the tender were as follows. The company was to erect stations in various parts of the empire at a cost to the government of £60,000 per station. These were then to be operated by the governments of the United Kingdom and the dominions and colonies concerned. And the Marconi Company was to receive 10% of the gross receipts. Their agreement was for 28 years, though the Postmaster General might terminate it at the end of 18 years. But there was one further clause. Clause 10. 
allowing for termination at any time if the government should find it advantageous to use a different system. The acceptance of this tender was only the first stage. A contract had to be drawn up and nothing would be finalized till this contract had been accepted by Parliament. In fact, the contract was not completed till July 19th. On that day, it was placed on the table of the House of Commons. For the understanding of the Marconi case, the vital period is the four months of 1912 between March 7th, when the tender was accepted, and July 19th, when the contract was tabled. Let us concentrate upon that four-month period. The Postmaster General issued no statement whatever on the matter, but on March 8th, the company sent out a circular to its shareholders telling them the good news. But making the news look even better than it was by omitting all reference to Clause 10, which entitled the government to substitute some rival system at any time it pleased. The Postmaster General issued no correction because, as he said later, he had not been aware of the omission. Immediately after, Godfrey Isaacs left for America to consider the affairs of the American Marconi Company, capitalized at $1,600,000, of which he was a director. More than half its shares were owned by the English company. On behalf of the English company, he bought up the rights of the American company's principal rival and then sold these rights at a profit not stated but apparently very considerable to the American company for $1,400,000. To handle all this and allow for vast developments hoped for from this purchase and from a very favorable agreement, Godfrey Isaacs had negotiated with Western Union. The American company was to be reorganized as a $10 million company, 2 million shares at $5 each. The American company, whose own repute in America was too low for any hope of raising money on that scale from the American public, seems to have agreed to the Godfrey Isaacs plan only on condition that the English company should guarantee the subscription. And Godfrey Isaacs made himself personally responsible for placing 500,000 shares. It should be remembered that the pound was then worth just under $5. $5 share was worth one pound, one shilling, three pence, or one and a sixteenth pounds in English money. Godfrey Isaacs returned to England. On April 9th, he lunched with his brothers Harry and Rufus. Rufus, being attorney general in the British government, he told them of the arrangements he had made, arrangements which were not yet known to the public, and of the stock about to be issued, and offered them 100,000 shares out of the 500,000 for which he had made himself responsible, at the face value of one pound, one shilling, three pence. Rufus refused, one reason for his refusal being that the shares were not a good buy, as the prospects of the company did not warrant so large a new issue of capital. Harry took 50,000. We now come to the transactions which the public was to later lump together rather crudely as ministers gambling in Marconi's. A. On April 17th, roughly a week after the luncheon, Rufus Isaacs bought 10,000 of Harry's shares at two pounds. He made the point later that buying from Godfrey would have been improper as Godfrey was director of a company with which the government was negotiating. But it was all right to buy from Harry who had bought from Godfrey. Harry having paid one pound, uh, one shilling, three pence, was willing to let Rufus have them for the same price, but Rufus thought it only fair to pay the higher price. This is all the more remarkable because only a week earlier he had thought these same shares bad value at roughly half the price he was now prepared to pay. Of this 10,000 shares, Rufus immediately sold 1,000 to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, David Lloyd George, and 1,000 to the Master of Ellie Bank who was chief whip of the Liberal Party then in office. It is to be noted that no money passed at this time in any of those transactions. Rufus did not pay Harry, Lloyd George, and Ali Bank did not pay Rufus. Nor did the shares pass. Indeed, the shares did not as yet exist, as it was not till the next day, April 18th, that the American Marconi Company authorized the issue of the new capital. On the day after that, April 19th, the shares were put on the market at three pounds five shillings. That same day, they rose to four pounds. In the course of the day, Rufus Isaacs sold 700 shares at an average price of three pounds, six shillings, six pence, which on the face of it looks like clearing 3,000 more than he had paid for all the shares and still having 3,000 shares left. But he explained later that there had been pooling arrangements between himself and his brother and himself and his two friends. So that the upshot of his day's transactions was that he had sold 
2,856 of his own shares and 357 each for Lloyd George and Elibank. The triumvirate therefore still had 6,430 shares of which 1,286 belonged to Lloyd George and Elibank. Rufus' explanation boils down to this. He and Harry had arranged that whatever either sold in the course of the day should be totaled and divided in the proportion of their holdings. Rufus sold 7,000 shares, Harry 10,850, a total of 17,850. Rufus had taken one-fifth of Harry's 50,000 shares, so one-fifth of the shares sold were allotted to his, i.e. 3,570. Lloyd George and Ellie Bank had each taken a tenth of Rufus, therefore each was considered to have sold 357. On April 20th, these two sold a further 1,000 of their 1,286 shares at 3 pounds and 5 shillings for 32. B. On May 22nd, Lloyd George and Ellie Bank bought 3,000 more shares at 2 pounds and 5 shillings 32 as they were not due to deliver the shares previously sold by them at three pounds, six shillings, and six pence, and three pounds and five shillings, 32, till June 20th. This new purchase had something in the look of a fair transaction. C. In April and May, the Master of Ellie Bank bought 3,000 shares for the account of the Liberal Party, of whose funds he had charge. These three transactions are all that the three politicians ever admitted, and nothing more was ever proved against them. As we have seen, there was no documentary evidence of the principal transaction, the one I have called A, except that Rufus sold 7,000 shares on April 19th. In his acquiring of the shares, no broker was employed. Rufus did not pay Harry for the shares until the 6th of January 1913, some nine months later, when the inquiry was already on. There was no evidence other than his own word that 10,000 was the number he had agreed to take or two pounds the price that he agreed to pay, or that he had bought from Harry and not Godfrey, or that the 7,000 shares he had certainly sold at a huge profit on April 19th, half were sold to Harry. There was indeed no evidence that the shares were not a gift. Even on what they admitted, they had obviously acted improperly. The contract with the English Marconi Company was not yet completed. Parliament had not been informed of its terms. Parliament, therefore, had yet to decide whether it would accept or reject it. The three members of Parliament had committed two grave improprieties. One, they had purchased shares directly or at one remove from the managing director of a company seeking a contract from Parliament in circumstances that were practically equivalent to receiving a gift of money from them. They received shares which the general public could not have bought till two days later and then only at over 50% more than the politicians paid. On this count, the fact that the shares were American Marconi's made no difference. The point is that they were valuable shares sold to ministers at a special low price. This need not have been bribery. But it is a fact that one way of bribing a man is to buy something from him at more than it is worth, or sell something to him at less than it is worth. H.T. Campbell of Bullock, Campbell and Grenfell, the English Marconi Company's official brokers, gave evidence before the Parliamentary Committee that it would have been impossible for the general public to buy the shares before April 19th. And as we have seen, they opened on that day at three pounds and five shillings. Two. They, and through the chief whip section, the whole Liberal Party, though it did not know it, were financially interested in the acceptance by Parliament of the contract. For though they had not bought shares in the English company, with which the contract was being made, but with the American company, which had no direct interest in the contract, nonetheless, it would have lowered the value of the American shares if the British Parliament had rejected the Marconi system and chosen some other in preference. I may say at once that I feel no certainty that the transaction was a sinister effort to bribe ministers, but had it been, exactly the right ministers were chosen. They were the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who has charge of the nation's purse, the Attorney General, who advises upon the legality of actions proposed, the Chief Whip, who takes the party forces into the voting lobby. It was the same Chief Whip, the Master of Elibank, that had carried the sale of honors to a new height in his devotion to increase his party's funds. 2. The Parliamentary Inquiry On July 19, 1912, the contract was put on the table of the House of Commons. In the ordinary course, 
it would have come up for a vote sometime before the end of the parliamentary session. But criticism of the contract was growing on the ground that it was too favorable to the Marconi company, and rumors were flying that members of the government had been gambling in Marconi shares, which, as we have seen, they had, though not in English Marconis. Even before the tabling of the contract, members of Parliament, notably Major Archer Shee, a Conservative, had been harrying Mr. Herbert Samuel, the Postmaster General. On July 20th, and in weekly articles following, it was attacked as a thoroughly bad contract by a writer in the Outlook, Mr. W. R. Lawson. On August 1st, a Labour member asked a question in the House about the rising price of Marconi's. The feeling that inquiry was needed was so strong that on August 6th, the last day but one of the session, the Prime Minister, who knew something of his colleague's purchase of Marconi's but never mentioned it, promised the House that the Marconi agreement would not be rushed through without full discussion. In spite of this, Herbert Samuel and Ellie Bank both tried hard to get the contract approved that day or next. When it was quite clear that Parliament would not allow this, Herbert Samuel insisted on making a general statement on the contract. He too knew of the minister's dealings in American Marconis, but did not mention them. There was no debate or division. The question of ratification or rejection was postponed till the House should meet again in October. The argument he put to Major Archer Shi, MP, was that the stations were urgently needed for Imperial defense. On August 8th, Cecil Chesterton's paper, The New Witness, launched its first attack on the whole deal. Though without reference to ministerial gambling in Marconi's, under the headline, The Marconi Scandal, Isaac's brother is chairman of the Marconi Company. It has therefore been secretly arranged between Isaacs and Samuel that the British people shall give the Marconi Company a very large sum of money through the agency of the said Samuel and for the benefit of the said Isaacs. Incidentally, the monopoly that is about to be granted to Isaacs No. 2 through the ardent charity of Isaacs No. 1 and his colleague, the Postmaster General, is a monopoly involving antiquated methods, the refusal of competing tenders far cheaper and far more efficient, and the saddling of this country with corruptly purchased goods, which happen to be inferior goods. The article went on to say that these swindles were apt to occur in any country, but that England alone lacked the will to punish them. It is the lack of even a minimum standard of honor, urging even honest men to protest against such villainy that has brought us where we are. In September, L.J. Max's National Review had a criticism of the contract by Major Archer Shi, MP, with editorial comment as well. In the same month, the Morning Post and the Spectator pressed for further inquiry. The October number of the National Review contained a searching criticism of the whole business and called special attention to the stock exchange gamble in American Marconi's. A few days later, on October 11th, the reassembled House of Commons held the promised debate. In the light of what we know, it is fascinating to read how nobody told a lie exactly and truth was concealed all the same. Here is Sir Rufus Isaacs. He begins by formulating the rumors against Mr. Herbert Samuel and Mr. Lloyd George and himself, but he is careful to formulate them in such a way that he can truthfully deny them. The rumors, he says, were that the ministers had dealt in the shares of a company with which the government was negotiating a contract. Never from the beginning have I had one single transaction with shares of that company. Literally true, as you see. The contract was with the English company. The shares he had bought were in the American company. He made no allusion to that purchase. Mr. Herbert Samuel, who is not accused of having purchased shares himself, but who knew of what his colleagues had done, treads the same careful line. I say that these stories that members of the cabinet, knowing the contract was in contemplation and feeling that possibly the price of shares might rise, themselves directly or indirectly bought any of those shares or took any interest in this company through any other party whatever, have not one syllable of truth in them. Neither I, myself, nor any of my colleagues have at any time held one shilling's worth of shares in this company, directly or indirectly, and have derived one penny profit from the fluctuations in their prices. However, he promised a parliamentary committee to inquire into the whole affair. Isaacs had denied any transactions with that company, Samuel with this company. Neither had ventured to say the English company, for that would instantly have raised the question of the American company. It is an odd truth that has to be phrased so delicately. 
Lloyd George, the first of the ministers to speak, managed better. He flew into a rage with an interjector. The honorable member said something about the government, and he has talked about rumors. I want to know what these rumors are. If the honorable gentleman has any charge to make against the government as a whole or against individual members of it, I think it ought to be stated openly. The reason why the government wanted a frank discussion before going to committee was because we wanted to bring here these rumors, these sinister rumors that have been passing from one foul lip to another behind the backs of the house. He sat down, still in a white heat, without having denied anything. The master of Ellie Bank did not deny anything either. He was not there. He was indeed no longer in the House of Commons. He had inherited the title of Lord Murray of Ellie Bank. He had left England in August and did not return till the inquiry was over, nor did he send any communication of any sort. As we have seen, no literal lie was told, but Parliament in the country assumed that the ministers had denied any gambling in Marconi's of any sort, and the ministers must have known that this was what their denials had been taken to mean. Rufus Isaac's son mentions a theory held by some, though he thinks there are strong arguments against it, that Rufus' silence was due to instructions from the Prime Minister, Mr. Asquith, who was not anxious to have the connection of Lloyd George with the matter disclosed. Fearing that his personal unpopularity would lead to such an exasperation of the attacks that the prestige of the whole government might be seriously impaired. Rufus Isaacs, 1st Marcus of Reading, pages 248. To 249. On October 29th, the names were announced of the members appointed to the promised committee of inquiry. As usual, they represented the various parties in proportion to their numbers in the House. The Liberals were in office, supported by Irish nationalists and Labour members. Nine members of the committee, including the chairman, were from these parties. Six were Conservatives. One might have expected that the careful evasions in the House would have meant only a brief respite for the ministers who had been so economical of the truth. They would appear before the committee and then the whole thing would emerge. But though the committee was appointed at the end of October and met three times most weeks thereafter, five months went by and no minister was called. The plain fact is that Mr. Samuel's department, the post office, slanted the inquiry in a different direction right at the start by putting in evidence a confidential blue book and suggesting that Sir Alexander King, Secretary to the Post Office, be heard first. On the question of the goodness or badness of the contract itself, the committee uncovered much that was interesting. It emerged that the Polson system had offered to erect stations at a cost of about 36,000 pounds less per station than the Marconi, and that the Admiralty itself had estimated a cost if they were undertaking the work, had about the same as the Polson offer. But by a confusion as to whether their figure did or did not include freight charges, the Admiralty estimate had been put down at 10,000 higher than it was. Nor was this the only confusion. When Sir Alexander King spoke of concessions made to the government by the Marconi Company, he admitted under cross-questioning that there was no written record of these concessions. He spoke of various vitally important conversations and was not able to produce a minute. Letters referred to were found to have been lost from the post office files. Further, it appeared that while most rigid tests were to be required of the other systems, the Marconi people had been constantly taken almost on their own word alone. Mr. Isaacs and Mr. Marconi both told us, said Sir Alexander King at one point, when asked whether he had any technical advice on the point of working. You will excuse me, said Mr. Harold Smith, if for the moment I ignore the opinion of Mr. Marconi and Mr. Isaacs. I ask you, who was the expert who gave you this information? Then too, as to the terms. The government had proposed 3% on the gross takings. Godfrey Isaacs had held out for 10% and got it. Moreover, the royalty was to be paid as long as a single Marconi patent was in use at the stations. Considering that by the Patents Act, the government had the legal right to take over any invention while paying reasonable compensation, the provision which gave so high a royalty to the Marconi Company was severely criticized. Again, the right was given to the Marconi Company to advise on any fresh invention that should be offered to the post office, which meant that any invention made by their rivals was entirely at their mercy. Naturally enough, the question was pressed home whether the post office had really sought the advice of its own technical experts. It transpired that a technical subcommittee had been called once, 
and had recommended a further investigation of the Polson system. The report of this subcommittee had been shelved and the members never summoned for a second meeting. Early in January 1913, the Parliamentary Committee, against the advice of Herbert Samuel, asked for a special subcommittee of experts to go into the merits of the various wireless systems and report within three months at latest. It is not surprising that the new witness commented on this as a surrender of the most decided type, where it proposes to do what Samuel himself clearly ought to have done before he entered into the contract. The report of this technical subcommittee showed that there had been a good deal of exaggeration in the first attack by the new witness on the worth of the Marconi system. If one single system was to be used, it was the only one capable of carrying out the government's requirements. But the subcommittee held that as wireless was in a state of rapid development, it would be better not to be tied to any one system. And they added that while the nature of the contract itself was not within their terms of reference, they must not be held to approve it. From its examination of the contract, the committee passed on to examine journalists and others as to the rumors against the ministers. And still, the ministers were not called. On February 12, 1913, L.J. Max, editor of the National Review, was being examined by the committee. Suddenly, he put his finger on the precise spot. Having expressed surprise at the non-appearance of the ministers, he went on. One might have conceived that they would have appeared at its first sitting, clamoring to state in the most categorical and emphatic manner that neither directly nor indirectly, in their own names or in other people's names, have they had any transactions whatsoever, either in London, Dublin, New York, Brussels, Amsterdam, Paris, or any other financial center, in any shares in any Marconi company throughout the negotiations with the government. Any shares in any Marconi company. The direct question was at last put. On February 14th, just two days later, something very curious happened. Le Matin, a Paris daily newspaper, published a story to the effect that Mr. Max had charged that Samuel, Rufus Isaacs, and Godfrey Isaacs had bought shares in the English Marconi Company at 50 francs, about two pounds in those days, before the negotiations with the government were started and had resold them at 200 francs, about eight pounds, when the public learnt that the contract was going through. It was an extraordinary piece of clumsiness for any paper to have printed such a story. Certainly Mr. Max had made no such charge. It was an extraordinary stroke of luck if the ministers wanted to tell their story in court that they should have this kind of clumsy libel to deny. And it is at least a coincidence that Rufus Isaacs happened, as his son tells us, to be in Paris when Le Matin printed the story. Samuel and Rufus Isaacs announced that they would prosecute and that Sir Edward Carson and F.E. Smith were their counsel. This decision to prosecute a not very important French newspaper while taking no such step against papers in their own country caused Gilbert Chesterton to write a Song of Cosmopolitan Courage, The New Witness, Volume 1, page 655. I am so swift to seize affronts, my spirit is so high. Whoever has insulted me, some foreigner must die. I brought a libel action, for the times had called me thief, against a paper in Bordeaux, a paper called Le Juif. The nation called me cannibal, I could not let it pass. I got a retraction from a journal in Alsace. And when the Morning Post raked up some murders I devised, a Polish organ of finance at once apologized. I know the charges varied much. At times I am afraid the Frankfurt Frank withdrew a charge the outlook had not made. And what the true injustice of the standards words had been was not correctly altered in the Young Turks magazine. I know it sounds confusing, but as Mr. Lamel said, the anger of a gentleman is boiling in my head. The hearing of the case against Limitan came on March 19th. As that paper had withdrawn and apologized only three days after printing the story, there was no actual necessity for statements by Rufus Isaacs and Samuel, but they had decided to answer Max's question, to admit the dealings in American Marconis, which they had not mentioned in the House of Commons or rather to get their lawyer to tell the story and then answer his questions on the matter in a court case where there could be no cross-examination because the defendants were not contesting the case. Sir Edward Carson mentioned the American purchase at the end of a long speech, almost as an afterthought. 
really the matter is so removed from the charges made in the libel that I only go into it at all because of the position of the Attorney General and because he wishes in the fullest way to state this deal so that it may not be said that he keeps anything whatsoever back. As the Times remarked, 9th of June, 1913, the fact was stated casually as though it had been a matter at once trifling and irrelevant. Only persons of the most scrupulous honor who desired that nothing whatsoever should remain hid would, it was suggested, have thought necessary to mention it at all. The statement was not really as full as Carson's phrasing would seem to suggest. The court was told that Rufus Isaacs had bought 10,000 shares, but not from whom he had bought them, that he had paid market price, but not what the price was, nor that the shares were not on the market, that he had sold 1,000 shares each to Lloyd George and Ellie Bank, and had sold some on their behalf but not that these two had had further buyings and sellings on their own. It was stated for Sir Rufus and reiterated by him that he had lost money on the deal, the reason being that while he had gained on the shares sold, the shares he still had had slumped. It is difficult to see why Rufus Isaacs and later Lloyd George made such a point of the loss on their Marconi transactions. They can hardly have bought the shares in order to lose money on them, and their initial sellings showed a very large profit. Indeed, Rufus Isaac's loss depended on his having paid his brother two pounds for the shares, and again upon the 7,000 shares he sold on the opening day being only partly on his behalf. And there was only his word for these two statements. If Rufus lost, he lost to his brother, who had been willing to sell at cost price, with whom he had a pooling arrangement and who made an enormous profit. If Rufus lost, the loss remained within the family. A week after the hearing of the Matank case, Rufus Isaacs appeared for the first time before the Parliamentary Committee, almost five months after its formation. His problem was not so much to explain his dealings in American Marconis as to account for his silence in the House of Commons. His one desire that day in Parliament, it seems, had been to answer the foul lies being uttered against him, which he was quite unable to find any foundation for, quite unable to trace the source of, quite unable to understand how they were started. Obviously, his dealings in American Marconis could have no possible bearing on these rumors, so he did not mention them. I confined my speech entirely to dealing with the four specific charges which I formulated. The chairman, Sir Albert Spicer, suggested that one way to scotch the rumors would have been to mention his investment in American Marconis because both being Marconis, you could easily understand one might get confused with the other. This question always drove Rufus Isaacs into a rage, and indeed he met all difficult questions with rages, which to this day, across the gulf of 30 years, seem simulated and not convincingly. Why had he not earlier asked the committee to hear the story of the American shares? I took the view that I had no right to claim any preferential position, and it seemed to me that it might almost savor of presumption if I had asked the committee to take my evidence, or any minister's evidence, out of the ordinary turn in which the committee desired it. All the same, he had once written a letter to the committee asking to be heard, but on consideration did not send it. During his examination, the element of strain between the two parties on the committee, which had been evident throughout the inquiry, was very much intensified. Lord Robert Cecil and the Conservatives courteously but tenaciously trying to get at the truth. The ministerialists determined to shield their man. There is a most unpleasing contrast between the earlier bullying of the journalists, who, after all, were not on trial, and the deference the majority now showed to ministers who were. Rufus Isaacs twisted and turned incredibly, but he did admit to Lord Robert Cecil that he obtained the shares before they were available to the general public, and at a price lower than that at which they were afterwards introduced to them. He tried later to modify his admission by saying that he had been told of dealings by others before April 17th, but he could give no details, and the evidence of the Marconi Company's broker, quoted above, is decisive. Two points of special interest emerged from this evidence. The first was that he had not told the whole story in the Matan case. He now mentioned that Lloyd George and Ellie Bank had sold a further 1,000 shares he held for them on the second day, July 20th, and went on to tell of the purchase of 3,000 shares by the same pair, the so-called bear transaction of May 22nd. The second was more unpleasing still. He admitted that he had told the story of the American Marconis privately to two friends on the committee, Messrs. Falconer and Booth. 
who had kept the matter to themselves and had, or at least appeared to have, continually steered the committee away from this dangerous ground. Rufus Isaac's son actually says that his father had informed Mr. Falconer and Mr. Handel Booth privately of these transactions in order that they might be forearmed when the journalists came to give evidence. On March 28th, Lloyd George appeared before the committee. Mrs. Charles Masterman gives an account of Rufus Isaacs grooming Lloyd George before the event. There was a really very comic, though somewhat alarming, scene between Rufus and George on the following Sunday. George had to give evidence on the Monday, the following day, and Rufus discovered that George was still in a perfect fog as to what his transaction really had been and began talking about buying a bear. I have never seen Rufus so nearly lose his temper and George got extremely sulky while Rufus patiently reminded him what he had paid, what he still owed, when he had paid it, who to, and what for. It was on that occasion also that Charlie and Rufus tried to impress upon him with all the force in their power to avoid technical terms and to stick as closely as possible to the plainest and most ordinary language. As is well known, George made a great success of his evidence. C.F.G. Masterman, page 255. I cannot imagine why she thought so. Hugh O'Donnell's description in the new witness of Isaacs and Lloyd George as they appeared before the committee accords perfectly with the impression produced by a reading of the evidence. While the simile of a panther at bay, anxious to escape, but ready with tooth and claw, might be applied to Sir Rufus Isaacs, something more like a rat in a corner might be suggested by the restless, snapping, furious little figure which succeeded. Let us compromise by saying that Mr. Lloyd George was singularly like a spitting, angry cat, which had got, perhaps, out of serious danger from her pursuers, but which caterwauled and spat and swore with vigor and venomousness quite surprising in that diminutive bulk. Dastardly, dishonorable, disgraceful, disreputable, sulking, cowardly. Asked why he had not mentioned his Marconi purchases in the House of Commons, Lloyd George gave two answers. One, there was no time on a Friday afternoon. Two, I could not get up and take time when two ministers had already spoken. Why had he not asked to be heard sooner by the committee? He understood that Sir Rufus had expressed the willingness of all the accused ministers to be heard. Like Sir Rufus, Lloyd George mentioned that he had lost money on his Marconi transactions. The obstruction within the committee continued to the end. A question had arisen whether Godfrey had had the right to sell his shares at his own price or for his own profit. He had sold a considerable number of shares to relations and friends at one pound, one shilling, three pence, where his shares were sold to the general public at three pounds, five shillings. Others of his shares he sold on the stock exchange at varying prices, all high. But were the shares his, or did they belong to the English company? If they were his, he was entitled to sacrifice vast profits on some by selling at cost to his relations, and to take solid profits on others by selling at what he could get in the open market. But if he was simply selling as an agent of the company, he had no right to make so fantastic a present of one lot of shares and was bound to hand over to the company profits made on the others. He told the committee that the 500,000 shares had been sold to him outright, but that he passed on 46,000 pounds of profits to the company. He said that a record of this sale of 500,000 shares to him would be found in the minutes of the English company. The books of the company were inspected and it was found that no such minute existed. Lord Robert Cecil naturally wished to recall Geoffrey Isaacs to explain the discrepancy between his statements and the records. The usual eight to six majority decided that there was no need to recall Godfrey. It looked rather as if the shares Godfrey had sold to Harry and Harry to Rufus at such favorable prices belonged to and should have been sold for the profit of the company. On May 7th, the committee concluded its hearings and its members were marshalling their ideas for the report but there was one fact for them and the public still to learn. Early in June, they were recalled to hear about it. A London stockbroker had absconded. A trustee was appointed to handle his affairs, and it was discovered that the fleeing stockbroker had acted for the still absent Ellie Bank, had indeed bought American Marconi's for him, a total of 3,000, and, as it later appeared, these had been bought for the funds of the Liberal Party. Comment of the Times, June 9, 1913, on the totally unnecessary difficulty which has been placed in the way of getting at the truth seems moderate enough. 
Chapter 19, Part 2, Marconi. 3. The Trial of Cecil Chesterton. Meanwhile, the new witness had not been neglecting its self-appointed task of striking at every point that looked vulnerable. On January 9, 1913, an article appeared attacking the city record of Mr. Godfrey Isaacs and listing the bankrupt companies, there were some 20 of them, of which he had been a promoter or a director. Some more ardent spirit in the new witness office sent sandwichmen to parade up and down in front of Godfrey Isaac's own office, bearing a placard announcing his ghastly failures. Cecil Chesterton said later that he had not ordered this to be done, but he refused to disclaim responsibility. The placard was the last straw. Godfrey's solicitors wrote to Cecil saying that Godfrey would prosecute unless Cecil promised to make no further statement reflecting on his honor till both had given evidence before the parliamentary committee. Cecil replied, I am pleased to hear that your client, Mr. Godfrey Isaacs, proposes to bring an action against me. And in the new witness, February 27, 1913, he wrote, We are up against a very big thing. You cannot have the honor and the fun of attacking wealthy and powerfully entrenched interests without the cost. We have counted the cost. We counted it long ago. We think it good enough. Much more than good enough. The case came on at the Old Bailey on May 27th. It is worth recalling the exact position at this time. The Parliamentary Committee had concluded its hearings three weeks earlier and was now preparing its report. Cecil Chesterton had not given evidence before it, for though he had frequently demanded to be summoned, when at last the summons came, he excused himself on the plea of ill health and the further plea that he wished to reserve his evidence for his own trial. The Matan case had been heard a couple of months earlier. Everything that was ever to be known about ministerial dealings in Marconi's was by now known, except for Ellie Banks' separate purchase on behalf of the party funds, which was made public just at the end of the trial. Sir Edward Carson and F.E. Smith were again teamed as in the Matan case. The charge was criminal libel. Cecil insisted on facing the charge alone. Its various contributors had joined in the attack, but Cecil would not give the names of the authors of unsigned articles and took full responsibility as editor. Carson's opening speech for the prosecution divided the six alleged libels under two main heads. One set, said Carson, charged Godfrey Isaacs with being a corrupt man who induced his corrupt brother to use his influence with the corrupt Samuel to get a corrupt contract entered into. The opening attack under this head has already been quoted. Later attacks did not diminish in violence. The swindle, or rather theft, impudent and barefaced as it is. When Samuel was caught with his hand in the till, or Isaacs, if you prefer to put it that way. The second set charged that Godfrey Isaacs had had transactions with various companies which, had the Attorney General not been his brother, would have got him prosecuted. There is the same violence here. This is not the first time in the Marconi affair that we find these two gentlemen, Godfrey and Rufus, swindling. And again, the files at Somerset House of the Isaacs companies cry out for vengeance on the man who created them, who manipulated them, who filled them with his own creatures, who worked them solely for his own ends, and who sought to get rid of some of them when they had served his purpose by casting the expense of burial on the public purse. There is no need to describe the case in detail. On the charges concerned with the contract and ministerial corruption, the same witnesses, with the notable exception of Lloyd George, gave much the same evidence as before the Parliamentary Committee. Very little that was new emerged. The contract looked worse than ever after Cecil Chesterton's counsel, Ernest Wilde, had examined witnesses, but Mr. Justice Fillimore insisted that it had nothing to do with the case, whether the contract was badly drawn or improvident. But, indeed, all this discussion of the contract was given an air of unreality by the extraordinary line the Chesterton defense took. It distinguished between the two sets of charges, offering to justify the second concerning Godfrey Isaac's business record by claiming that the first set brought accusation of corruption not against Godfrey but against Rufus and Herbert Samuel, who were not the prosecutors. It was an impossible position to say that ministers were fraudulently giving a fraudulent contract to Godfrey Isaacs, but that this did not mean that he was in the fraud. 
Cecil showed up unhappily under cross-examination on this matter, but from the point of view of his whole campaign, worse was to follow. For Cecil withdrew the charges of corruption he had leveled at the ministers. Here are extracts from the relevant sections of the cross-examination by Sir Edward Carson. Carson, and do you now accuse him, Godfrey Isaacs, of any abominable business, I mean in relation to obtaining the contract? Cecil Chesterton, yes, certainly. I now accuse Mr. Isaacs of very abominable conduct between March 7th and July 19th. Carson, do you accuse the Postmaster General of dishonesty or corruption? C. Chesterton, what I accused the Postmaster General of was of having given a contract which was a byword for laxity and thereby laying himself open reasonably to the suspicion that he was conferring a favor on Mr. Godfrey Isaacs because he was the Attorney General's brother. Carson, I must repeat my question. Do you accuse the Postmaster General of anything dishonest or dishonorable? C. Chesterton. After the Postmaster's denials on oath, I must leave the question. I will not accuse him of perjury. Carson, and therefore you do not accuse him of anything dishonest or dishonorable. After some further questioning, Judge, that is evasion. Do you or do you not accuse him? C. Chesterton, I have said no. Later, C. Chesterton, my idea at the time was that Sir Rufus Isaacs had influenced Mr. Samuel to benefit Godfrey Isaacs. Carson, you have not that opinion now? C. Chesterton, Sir Rufus has denied it on oath, and I accepted his denial. Cecil still insisted that though the ministers had not been corrupted, what had come to light about Godfrey's offer of American Marconi shares to his brother showed that Godfrey had tried to corrupt them. Godfrey could not have enjoyed the case very much. There was much emphasis on his concealment of Clause 10, allowing the government to terminate at any time, and Sir Alexander King, secretary to the post office, admitted that Godfrey Isaacs had asked that it be kept quiet, but this was not among the accusations Cecil had leveled at him. In his summing up, Mr. Justice Fillimore indicated the possibility that the shares Godfrey had so gaily sold belonged not to himself, but to the English Marconi Company, merely adding that this question was not relevant to the present case. Further, the record of his company failures was rather ghastly. Here is a section of his cross-examination as to the companies he had been connected with before the Marconi Company. Remember that there were 20 of them. Wow. I'm trying to discover a success. Judge, it is not an imputation against the man that he has been a failure. Wild, here are cases after cases of failure. Isaacs, that is my misfortune. Judge, you might as well cross-examine any speculative widow. Wild, a speculative widow would not be concerned in the management. Wild, can you point to one success except Marconi in the whole of your career? Isaacs, in the companies. Wow, yes. Isaacs, a complete success? No. I should not call any one of them a complete success, but I may say that each of them was an endeavor to develop something new. But Carson had made the point in his opening speech that though Godfrey Isaacs had been connected with so many failures, he had not been accused by the shareholders of anything dishonorable. In his closing speech, he pointed out that not one single city man had been brought forward to say that he had been deceived to the extent of one sixpence by the representations of Mr. Isaacs. And indeed, the evidence called by the defense in this present case, however suspicious it may have made some of his actions appear, did not establish beyond doubt any actual illegality. The trial ended on June 9th. The judge summed up heavily against Cecil Chesterton. The jury was out for only 40 minutes. The verdict was guilty. Cecil Chesterton, says the Times, smiled and waved his hand to friends and relations who sat beside the dock. The judge preached him a solemn little homily and then imposed a fine of 100 pounds and costs. The Chestertons and all who stood with them held that so mild a fine instead of a prison sentence for one who had been found guilty of criminal libel on so large a scale was in itself a moral victory. 
It is a great relief to us, ran the first editorial in the New Witness after the conclusion of the trial, to have our hands free. We have long desired to restate our whole case about the Marconi disgrace in view of the facts that are now before us in the English people. When we began our attack, we were striking at something very powerful and very dangerous. We were striking at it in the dark. The politicians saw to that. Our defense is that if we had not ventured to strike in the dark, we and the people of England should be in the dark still. There can be no question of Cecil Chesterton's courage, but he may have exaggerated a little in saying that if the new witness had not struck in the dark, the nation would still be in the dark. Parliament had already refused to approve the contract without proper discussion, and the outlook was attacking vigorously before the first new witness attack. And there are grave drawbacks to the making of charges in the dark, which later have to be withdrawn. Cecil's withdrawal of his charges against the ministers and his failure to substantiate his charges against Godfrey's company record may have done more to hinder than help the cause of clean government. But his courage remains. And if one had to choose, one prefers the immoderate man who said more than he knew to the careful man who said so much less. Gilbert, giving evidence at the trial, had said that he envied his brother the dignity of his present position. With the Isaacs brothers in mind, one sees the point. Four, afterthoughts. Four days after the verdict against Cecil Chesterton, the Parliamentary Committee produced its report. There had been a draft report somewhat critical of the Marconi buying ministers by the chairman, Sir Albert Spicer, and another considerably more critical by Lord Robert Cecil. Lord Robert's report said that Rufus Isaacs had committed grave impropriety in making an advantageous purchase of shares upon advice and information not yet fully available to the public. By doing so, he placed himself, however unwittingly, in a position in which his private interests or sense of obligation might easily have been in conflict with his public duty. Of his silence in the House, Lord Robert said, we regard that reticence as a grave error of judgment and as wanting in frankness and in respect for the House of Commons. Upon this, Rufus Isaac's son comments, the vehemence of this language was not calculated to command the draft to the majority of the committee. Vehemence seems hardly the word. But at any rate, the committee did not adopt either Lord Robert's report or Sir Albert Spicer's. By the usual party vote of eight to six, it adopted a report prepared by Mr. Falconer, one of the two whom Rufus Isaacs had approached privately, which simply took the line that the ministers had acted in good faith and refrained from criticizing them. Parliament debated the matter a few days later on a conservative motion that this House regrets the transactions of certain of its ministers and the shares of the Marconi Company of America and the want of frankness displayed by ministers in their communications on the subject to the House. Rufus Isaac's son speaks of the certain ruin of his father's career if, by some unpredictable misadventure, the motion had been carried. It would indeed have had to be an unpredictable misadventure, for the voting was on the strictest party lines, which means that the House did not express its real opinion at all. The motion was defeated by 346 to 268. Lloyd George and Rufus Isaacs expressed regret for any indiscretion there might have been in their actions. Rufus explained that he would not have bought the shares if I had thought that men could be so suspicious of any action of mine. In the debate, the leader of the opposition, Arthur Balfour, somewhat disdainfully refused to make political capital out of the business. Lloyd George and Isaacs were loudly cheered by their own party, though whether they were cheered for having bought American Marconis or for having concealed the purchase from the house, there is now no means of discovering. At any rate, their careers were not damaged. The one went on to become Lord Chief Justice of England and later Viceroy of India. The other became Prime Minister during the War of 1914 to 1918. One question arising from the episode is whether it meant what Cecil Chesterton and Belloc thought it meant in the world of party politics, or something entirely different. They seem throughout to have assumed that their thesis of collusion between the party leaders was proved by this scandal. It seems to me quite as easy to make the case that it was disproved. A conservative first raises the matter by inconvenient questions in the House. A group of young conservatives pay the costs of Cecil Chesterton's defense. When a parliamentary committee is appointed to inquire into the alleged corruption, 
The story of every session becomes one of a conservative minority trying hard to ferret out the truth and a ministerial majority determined to prevent their succeeding. Finally, the leading conservative commissioner, Lord Robert Cecil, issues a restrained but most damning report which is, as a matter of course, rejected by the Liberal majority. A Conservative MP told me he thought the great mistake made was that it had all been made too much of a party question. Unless you already disbelieved quite violently in the existence of the two parties, this would certainly be the effect upon you of reading the report of the Commission's sessions. And all that can be said against it is the fact that Mr. Balfour did, in the House of Commons, utter a conventional form of words which, as has been said, really amounted to a refusal to make political capital out of the affair. I do not say, for I do not pretend to know, if this is the correct interpretation, is certainly the obvious one. Douglas Gerald, in a brilliant article in Belloc, treats his theory of the party system as a false one and maintains that he mistook for collusion that degree of cooperation that alone could enable a country to be governed at all under a party system. A certain continuity must be preserved if, in the old phrase, the king's government is to be carried on. But such continuity did not spell a corrupt collusion. If at this distance of time such a view can be held by a man of Mr. Gerald's ability, it could certainly be held at the time by the majority. And it may be that the continual assumption of an unproved fact got in the way in the fight against more obvious evil. Hilaire Belloc and the counter-revolution in for Hilaire Belloc. For bound up with this question is another. The eyewitness seems so near success and yet never quite succeeded. Might it have done so had it been founded with a single eye to creative opportunity, to the attack on the servile state and the building of some small beginning of an alternative? GK's Weekly was a slight improvement from that point of view, for it did create the Distributist League. But both papers, I think, had from their inception a divided purpose that made failure almost inevitable. The fight against corruption, which had been placed equal with the fight for property and liberty at the start of the eyewitness, is a noble aim. But like the other, it is a life work. To do it, a man must have time to spend verifying rumors or exploding them following up clues, patiently waiting on events. I began to read the files with an assumption of the accuracy of the claims of the eye and new witness as to its own achievement in all this. But when the dates and facts in the Marconi case had been tabulated for me chronologically, I began to wonder. Again and again, the editor stated that the new witness had been first to unearth the Marconi matter, but it hadn't. As we have seen, questions in the House and attacks in other papers had preceded their first mention of the subject. So too, the statement that the Marconi affair had proved how little Englishmen cared about corruption seemed almost absurd when one read not only the conservative but also the liberal comment of the time. Political corruption is the Achilles heel of liberalism, said the outstanding liberal editor, while Hugh O'Donnell, in The New Witness, paraphrased the wail of the Cadbury Papers. "'Tis the voice of the cocoa, I hear it exclaim, O oh, Jordy, dear Jordy, don't do it again." Just how scandalous was the Marconi scandal? At this distance of time, it is difficult to arrive at any clear view. There are two main problems, the contract and the purchase of American Marconis. The contract seems very definitely to have been unduly favorable to the company. Clauses were so badly drawn that they had to be supplemented by letters which had no legal effect. Documents were lost, other tenders misinterpreted, other systems perhaps not fully examined, the report of a subcommittee shelved, Godfrey Isaacs allowed to issue a misleading report without correction from the post office. It all may spell corruption, but it need not. No one familiar with the workings of a government department is likely to be surprised at any amount of muddle and incompetence. Matters are forgotten, and then in the effort to make up for lost time, important steps are simply omitted. Officials are pig-headed and unreasonable. And as to lost documents, what of the minister's dealings and shares? Godfrey may have been using Rufus to purchase ministerial favor. If so, he could hardly have done so on the comparatively small scale of the dealings known to us. The few thousand involved could not have meant an enormous amount to Rufus. He had, it is true, begun his career on the stock exchange, found himself insolvent, and had been hammered. 
but he had gone on to make large sums at the bar, up to 30,000 pounds a year, and his salary as attorney general was 20,000 a year. There may, of course, have been far heavier purchases than we know about. The piece-by-piece -piece emergence of what we do know gives us no confidence that all the pieces ever emerged. We have only the word of the two brothers for most of the story, and one comes to feel that their word has no great meaning. But, allowing for all that, it is possible that Godfrey may have wanted Rufus to have the American shares out of family affection. Of the shares Godfrey personally disposed of, a very large number went to relations and close friends, mother, sisters, his wife's relations, who certainly could not help him to get his contract through Parliament. If this, the most charitable interpretation, is also the true one, Rufus and his political friends acted with considerable impropriety in snatching at this opportunity of quick and easy money. The rest of the story is of their efforts to prevent this impropriety being discovered. Had they mentioned it openly in Parliament on October 11th, the matter might have ended there, but they lacked the nerve. The occasion passed and nothing remained, especially for Rufus, but evasion, shiftiness, half-truth passing as whole truth, the farce of indignant virtue, a performance which left him not a shred of dignity and ought to have made it unthinkable that he should ever again be given public office. The perfect word on the whole episode was uttered not by either Gilbert or Cecil Chesterton or by any of their friends, but by Rudyard Kipling. The case had meant a great deal to him. On June 15th, a conservative neighbor of Kipling wrote to Gilbert, I cannot let the days pass without writing to congratulate you and your brother on the result of the Isaacs trial. I do feel, as many thousands of English people must feel, that the new witness is fighting on the side of English nationalism, and that is our common battle. My neighbor, Rudyard Kipling, has followed every phase of the fight with interest of such a kind that it almost precluded his thinking of anything else at all. And when he gets hold of the new witness, my copy, I never can get it back again. You see, however much we have all disagreed, do disagree, we are all in the same boat about a lot of things of the first rank. We can't afford to differ just now if we do agree. It's all too serious. When Isaacs was appointed Viceroy of India, Kipling wrote the poem, Gehazi. Whence comest thou, Gehazi, so reverent to behold, in scarlet and in ermine, and chain of England's gold, from following after Naaman, to tell him all is well, whereby my zeal has made me a judge in Israel. Well done, well done, Gehazi, stretch forth thy ready hand, thou barely scrape from judgment, take oath to judge the land, unswayed by gift of money, or privy bribe, or base or knowledge which is profit in any marketplace. Search out and probe, Gehazi, as thou of all canst try, the truthful, well-weighed answer that tells the blacker lie, the loud, uneasy virtue, the anger feigned at will, to overbear a witness and make the court keep still. Take order now, Gehazi, that no man talk aside, in secret with the judges, the while his case is tried, lest he should show them reason to keep the matter hid, and subtly lead the questions away from what he did. Thou mirror of uprightness, what ails thee at thy vows? What means the risen whiteness of skin between thy brows? The boils that shine and burrow, the sores that slough and bleed. The leprosy of Naaman, O thee and all thy seed. Stand up, stand up, Gehazi. Draw close thy robe and go. Gehazi judge in Israel, a leper white as snow. As the Times leading article of June 19, 1913 put it, a man is not blamed for being splashed with mud. He is commiserated. But if he has stepped into a puddle, which he might easily have avoided, we say that it is his own fault. If he protests that he did not know it was a puddle, we say that he ought to know better. But if he says that it was, after all, quite a clean puddle, then we judge him deficient in the sense of cleanliness. And the British public like their public men to have a very nice sense of cleanliness. That fundamentally was what troubled Gilbert Chesterton then and for the rest of his life. He was not himself an investigator of political scandals. In that field, he trusted his brother in Bellot. And on this particular matter, Cecil had certainly said more than he knew, and possibly more than was true. But it did not take an expert to know that some of the men involved in the Marconi case had no very nice sense of cleanliness. 
And these men were going to be dominant in the councils of England and to represent England in the face of the world for a long time to come. Chapter 20, The Eve of the War, 1911 to 1915, Part 1. During the earlier years of The New Witness, Gilbert had nothing to do with the editing and his contributions to it were only part of the continuing volume of his weekly journalism. It would be almost impossible to trace all the articles in papers and magazines that were never published. The volumes of essays appearing year by year probably contained the best among them. He was still, in 1911, writing for the Daily News, and every week until his death he continued to do Our Notebook for the Illustrated London News. I have found an unpublished ballad, he wrote on the subject. Ballad of a Periodical In icy circles by the Bering Strait, in moony jungles where the tigers roar, in tropic isles where civil servants wait and wonder what the deuce they're waiting for, in lonely lighthouses beyond the Nor, in English country houses jammed with Jews, men will still study, spell, pretend, and pour, and read the illustrated London news. Our fathers read it at the earlier date and twirled the funny whiskers that they wore ere little Levy got his first estate or Madame Patty got her first encore. While yet the canon of the Christian tour, the lords of Delhi in their golden shoes, men asked for all the news from Singapore and read the illustrated London news. But I, whose copy is extremely late and not to have been sent an hour before, I still sit here and trifle with my fate and idly write another ballad more. I know it is too late, and all is o'er, and all my writings they will now refuse. I shall be sacked next Monday, so be sure, and read the Illustrated London News. Envoy Prince, if in church the sermon seems a bore, put up your feet upon the other pews. Light a fabrica de Tobago's floor, and read the Illustrated London News. Debating and lecturing went on, and an amusing letter from Bernard Shaw shows the preparations for a three-star show, Shaw against Chesterton with Bellock in the chair, in 1911. An exactly similar debate years later was published in a slender volume entitled, Do We Agree? On both occasions, the crowd was enormous, and many had to be turned away. All three men were immensely popular figures, and all three were at their best debating in a hall of moderate size, where swift repartee could be followed by the whole audience. Gilbert always shone on these occasions. The challenge of a debate brought forth all his powers of wit and humor. His opponent furnished material on which he could work and how he enjoyed himself. Frank Swinnerton once heard him laugh so much that he gave himself hiccups for the rest of the evening. I heard him against Miss Cicely Hamilton and against Mr. Selfridge and felt the only drawback to be that the fight was so very unequal. The Selfridge debate in particular was sheer cruelty. So utterly unaware was the businessman that he was being intellectually massacred by a man who regarded all that Selfridge's stores stood for as the ruin of England. Occasionally Mr. Selfridge looked bewildered when the audience rocked with laughter at some phrase that clearly conveyed no meaning to him at all. But so complete was his failure to understand what it was all about that when the meeting was over, he asked if Chesterton would not write his name with a diamond on a window of his store, already graced with so many great names. For once, Chesterton was at a loss for words. Oh, how jolly, he murmured feebly. Very different was it when he debated with Bernard Shaw, with Bellock as third performer. Ayat St. Lawrence, Welwyn Hertz, 27th October, 1911. Don't be dismayed, this doesn't need a reply. My dear GKC, with reference to this silly debate of ours, what you have to bear in mind is this. I am prepared to accept any conditions. If they seem unfair to me from the front of the house, all the better for me. Therefore, do not give me the advantage unless you wish to, or are, as you probably are, as indifferent to the rules as I am. The old Hyman Bradlaugh and Shaw Foot debates, SF was a two-nighter, were arranged thus. Each debater made three speeches, one 30 minutes, one of 15, and one of 10. Strict time was kept. The audiences were intensely jealous of the least departure from the rules. 
and the chairman simply explained the conditions and called time without touching the subject of the debate. The advantages of this were a that the opponent or the opener could introduce fresh matter up to the end of his second speech and was tied up in that respect for the last 10 minutes only, and b that the debate was one against one and not one against two and with less time allowed for him and that, and it must have been held that the chairman dealt with the debate. The disadvantages for us are that we both want Bellock to let himself go. I simply thirst for the blood of his servile state. I'll servile him. And nobody wants to tie you down to matter previously introduced when you make your final reply. We shall all three talk all over the shop, possibly never reaching the socialism department, and Bellock will not trouble himself about the rules of public meeting and debate, even if there were any reason to suppose that he is acquainted with them. Do you recollect how Parnell and Vigor floored the house in the palmy days of obstruction by meanly getting up the subject of public order, which no one else suspected the existence of? I therefore conclude that we had better make it, to some extent, a clown's cricket match, and go ahead as in the debates with Sanders and MacDonald and Cicely Hamilton which were all wrong technically. In a really hostile debate, it is better to be as strict as possible, but as this is going to be a performance in which three Macs, who are on the friendliest terms in private, will belabor each other recklessly on wooden scalps and pillowed waistcoats and trouser seats, we need not be particular. Still, you had better know exactly what you are doing, hence this wildly hurried scrawl. Did you see my letter in Tuesday's Times? Magnificent. My love to Mrs. Chesterton and my distinguished consideration to Winkle. To hell with the Pope. Winkleton was the Chesterton's dog who preceded Coodle of the poem. Ever GBS. P.S. I told Sanders to explain to you that you would be entitled to half the gate, or a third of Bellock shares, and that you were likely to overlook this if you were not warned. I take it that you have settled this somehow. At the second of these debates, Bellock opened the proceedings by announcing to the audience, you are about to listen, I am about to sneer. His only contribution to the debate was to recite a poem. Our civilization is built upon coal. Let us chant in rotation our civilization, that lump of damnation, without any soul. Our civilization is built upon coal. Bernard Shaw was on the friendliest terms with the others and admired their genius but thought it ill-directed. Bellock, he had told Chesterton, was wasting prodigious gifts in the service of the Pope. I have not met GKC. Shaw always calls him a man of colossal genius, writes Lawrence of Arabia to a friend. As a lecturer, Chesterton's success was less certain than as a debater. Many of his greatest admirers say they have heard him give very poor lectures. He was often nervous and worried beforehand. As a lecturer, wrote the Yorkshire Weekly Post after a performance in this year, 1911, it was a fiasco, but as an exhibition of Chesterton, it was pleasing. Although his writing appeared almost effortless, he did in fact take far more pains about it than he did in preparing for a lecture. He seemed quite incapable of remembering the time or place of an appointment, or of getting there on time, if at all. Stories are told of his non-appearance on various platforms. My husband remembers a meeting in a London theater at which Chesterton had been billed as one of the speakers. The meeting, arranged by the Knights of the Blessed Sacrament, was well underway before he arrived, panting but unperturbed. His apology ran something like this. As knights, you will understand my not being here at the beginning. The whole point of knighthood was that the knight should arrive late, but not too late. Had St. George not been late, there would have been no story. Had he been too late, there would have been no princess. Even more annoying was his habit of beginning his lecture by saying he had not prepared it. Such a remark is not likely to please any audience, least of all an audience that has paid for admission and knows that the lecturer is receiving a large fee. But money, whether he was receiving it or giving it away, meant nothing to him. He had not a strong voice, and I've seen him, when a microphone was provided, holding a paper of notes between himself and it. An ardent admirer of his writing told me he had made far too many jokes about his size, yet how pleasing they sometimes were. When his chairman, for instance, after a long wait, said he had feared a traffic accident, I had met a tram car, Chesterton replied. 
It would have been a great, and if I may so, an equal encounter. He thought badly of his own lecturing and began once by saying, I might call myself a lecturer, but then again I fear some of you may have attended my lectures. Actually, in spite of the jokes, his thoughts were centered entirely on his subject, not on himself. An anonymous society diarist quoted by Cosmo Hamilton writes of an occasion when he was given rather foolishly a little gold period chair, and as he made his points, it slowly collapsed under him. He rose just in time and sinking into another chair that someone had put behind him began at the word he had last spoken. No acting could have secured such an effect of complete indifference. It was evident that he had barely noticed the incident. Ellis Roberts completes the picture. He knew Gilbert already as a brilliant talker and came to hear him from a platform. I remember the manner of his lecture. It seemed to be written on a hundred pieces of variously shaped paper, written in ink and pencil of all colors, and in chalk. All the pages were in a splendid and startling disorder. And I remember being at first a little disappointed. And the papers were abandoned, and GKC talked. From Reading for Pleasure, page 96. At this time, Bernard Shaw scored a victory over his friend, for besides lecturing, journalism, and the publication of three considerable and two minor books, Chesterton, between 1911 and the war, wrote the play that Shaw had been so insistently demanding. The books were Man Alive, 1911, A Miscellany of Men, Essays, 1912, The Victorian Age in Literature, February 1913, The Wisdom of Father Brown, 1914, the Flying Inn, 1914. The play was Magic, produced at the Little Theatre in October 1913. One who admired it was George Moore. He wrote to Forster Beauville, November 24, 1913. I followed the comedy of Magic from the first time to the last with interest and appreciation. And I am not exaggerating when I say I think of all modern plays, I like it the best. Mr. Chesterton wished to express an idea, and his construction and his dialogue are the best that he could have chosen for the expression of that idea. Therefore, I look upon the play as practically perfect. The prologue seems unnecessary. Likewise, the magician's love for the young lady. That she should love the magician is well enough, but it materializes him a little too much if he returns that love. I would have preferred her to love him more and he to love her less. But this spot, if it is to be a spot, is a very small one on a spotless surface of excellence. I hope I can rely upon you to tell Mr. Chesterton how much I appreciated his play, as I should like him to know my artistic sympathies. Artistic sympathies is not ungenerous, considering how Chesterton had written of George Moore in Heretics. It is rather comic that all the reviews hailing from Germany, where the play was very soon produced, compare Chesterton with Shaw and many of them say that he is the better playwright. He means more to it. A Munich paper was translated as saying, than the good old Shaw. Chesterton's superiority can hardly be entertained in the matter of technique. Actually, what the critic meant was that he preferred the ideas of Chesterton to the ideas of Shaw. Both men were chiefly concerned with ideas, but while Shaw excelled chiefly in presenting them through brilliant dialogue, G.K.'s deeper thoughts were conveyed in another fashion. The Duke might almost, it is true, have been a Shaw character. But the fun the audience got out of them was the least thing they received. Chesterton once said that he suspected Shaw of being the only man who had never written any poetry. Many of us suspect that Chesterton never wrote anything else. This play is a poem, and the greatest character in it is atmosphere. Chesterton believed in the love of God and man. He believed in the devil. Love conquers diabolical evil, and the atmosphere of this struggle is felt even in the written page, and was felt more vividly in the theater. After a passage of many years, those who saw it remember the moment when the red lamp turned blue as a felt experience. But as to popularity, in England at least, it would be absurd to compare GK with GBS. The play's run was a brief one, and it was years before he attempted another. Chesterton was fighting corruption, fighting the servile state. Above all things, he was fighting sterility, fighting it in the name of life, life with its riches, its variety, its sins and its virtues, with its positively outrageous sanity. 
thank you for being alive, wrote an admirer to him. Man Alive is above all things a hymn to life. It is the acid test of a Chestertonian. Reviewers became wildly enthusiastic or bitterly scornful. Borrowing from his own phrase about Pickwick, I'm inclined to say that men not in love with life will not appreciate Man Alive, nor, I should imagine, heaven. The ideas that make up the book had been long in his head. The story of White Wind, written while he was at the Slade School, tells one half of the story. An unpublished fragment of the same period entitled The Burden of Balaam, the other half. The great wind that blows Innocent Smith to Beacon House is the wind of life, and it blows through the whole story. Before an improvised court of law, Smith is tried on three charges. Homebreaking, but it was his own house that he broke into to renew the vividness of ownership. Bigamy, but it was his own wife with whom he repeatedly eloped to renew the ecstasy of first love murder with a large and terrifying revolver, but he dealt life, not death, from its barrel. For he used it only to threaten those who he said they were tired of life and that life was not worth living, and he forced them through fear of death to hymn the praises of life. The explanation given by Smith to Dr. Eames, the master of Breakspear College, of his ideas and his purpose gives the note of fooling and profundity filling the whole book. I want both my gifts to become virgin and violent, the death and the life after death. I'm going to hold a pistol to the head of the modern man, but I shall not use it to kill him, only to bring him to life. I begin to see a new meaning in being the skeleton at the feast. You can scarcely be called a skeleton, said Dr. Eames, smiling. That comes of being so much at the feast, answered the massive youth. No skeleton can keep his figure if he is always dining out. But that is not quite what I meant. What I meant is that I caught a kind of glimpse of the meaning of death and all that, the skull and the crossbones, the memento mori. It isn't only meant to remind us of a future life, but to remind us of a present life too. With our weak spirits, we should grow old in eternity if we were not kept young by death. Providence has to cut immortality into lengths for us, as nurses cut the bread and butter into fingers. Man Alive appeared in 1911. Next year came what is perhaps his best-known single piece of writing, The Battle of Lepanto. In the spring of 1912, he had taken part in a debate at Leeds, affirming that all wars were religious wars. Father O'Connor supported him with a magnificent description of the Battle of Lepanto. Obviously, it seized Gilbert's mind powerfully. Well, while he was still staying with Father O'Connor, he had begun to jot down lines, and by October of that year, the poem was published. One might fill a book with the tributes it has received from that day to this. Perhaps none pleased him more than the note from John Buchan, June 21, 1915. The other day in the trenches, we shouted your Lepanto. The Victorian age in literature made many of his admirers again express the wish that he would stay in the field of pure literature. His characterizations of some of the Victorian writers were sheer delight. Ruskin had a strong right hand that wrote of the great medieval ministers in tall harmonies and traceries as splendid as their own, and also, so to speak, a weak and feverish left hand that was always fidgeting and trying to take the pen away and write an evangelical tract about the immorality of foreigners. It is not quite unfair to say of him that he seemed to want all parts of the cathedral except the altar. Tennyson was a provincial Virgil. He tried to have the universal balance of all the ideas at which the great Roman had aimed, but he hadn't got hold of all the ideas to balance. Hence, his work was not a balance of truths like the universe. It was a balance of whims, like the British Constitution. He could not think up to the height of his own towering style. While Emily Bronte was as unsociable as a storm at midnight, and while Charlotte Bronte was at best like the warmer and more domestic thing, a house on fire, they do connect themselves with the calm of George Eliot as the forerunners of many later developments of feminine advance. Many forerunners, if it comes to that, would have felt rather ill if they had seen the things they foreran. 
The best and most profound part of the book was, however, the working out of certain generalizations. The effect on the literature of the period of the Victorian compromise between religion and rationalism. Macaulay, it is said, never talked about his religion. Huxley was always talking about the religion he had from God. The breakup of the compromise between Victorian Protestantism and Victorian rationalism simultaneously destroyed one another. The uniqueness of the nonsense writing of the later Victorian period. In one illuminating passage, Chesterton defends what seems at first sight merely his own habit of getting dates and events in the wrong order. The mind moves by instincts, associations, premonitions, and not by fixed dates or completed processes. Action and reaction will occur simultaneously, or the cause actually be found after the effect. Errors will be resisted before they have been properly promulgated. Notions will be first defined long after they are dead. Thus Wordsworth shrank back into Toryism, as it were, from a Shelleyan extreme of pantheism as yet disembodied. Thus Newman took down the iron sword of dogma to parry a blow not yet delivered that was coming from the club of Darwin. For this reason, no one can understand tradition or even history who has not some tenderness for anachronism. This was not merely special pleading. It contains a profound truth. Wilfred Ward proved it of Newman in the biography that G.K. had probably just been reading. Chesterton noted it himself in his book on Cobbett, who, as he said, saw who was not yet there. It is almost the definition of genius. Already at this date, Chesterton and Belloc were fighting much that to the rest of us only became fully apparent long afterwards. I think you would make a very good god, wrote E.V. Lucas to Chesterton. There's indeed something divine in an almost ceaseless outpouring of creative energy. But only God can create tirelessly, and Chesterton was at this time beginning to be tired. You can see it in The Flying In. The book is still full of vitality, and the lyrics in it, later published separately under the title Wine, Water, and Song, are as good in that kind as any that he ever wrote. But with all its vigor, the book is still a less joyful one than Man Alive, and it is a much more angry one. Man Alive was a pay-in of joy to life. Flying in is fighting for something necessary to its fullness, freedom. It must have been just while he was writing it that there were threatenings of a case against him by Lever Brothers on account of a lecture given at the city temple on the snob as a socialist. In answering a question, he spoke of port sunlight as corresponding to a slave compound. Others besides Lever Brothers were shocked, and some clarification was certainly called for. Bellick and Chesterton meant by slavery, not that the poor were being bullied or ill-treated, but that they had lost their liberty. Gilbert went so far as to point out how much there was to be said in defense of a slave state. Under slavery, the poor were usually fed, clothed, and housed adequately. Slaves had often been much more comfortable in the past than were free men in the world today. A model employer might, by his regulations, greatly increase the comfort of his workers and yet enslave them. A letter from Bernard Shaw advising him to get up certain details asks the question of whether the workman at Port Sunlight would forfeit his benefits and savings should he leave. If this is so, wrote Shaw, then though Lever may treat him, as well as Pickwick would no doubt have treated Old Weller, if he had consented to take charge of his savings. Lever is a master of his employee's fate and captain of his employee's soul, which is slavery. He went on to offer financial help in fighting the case. The Christian Commonweal had reported Chesterton's speech and was also threatened with the law. To the editor, G.K. wrote, Only a hasty line to elongate the telephone. I am sorry about this business for one reason only, and that is that you should be even indirectly mixed up in it. Lever can sue me till he bursts. I'm not afraid of him, but it does seem a shame when I've often attacked you, always in good faith and what was meant for good humor, and when you've heaped coals of fire by printing my most provocative words, that your chivalry should get you even bothered about it. I am truly sorry and ask pardon of you, but not of old sun and soap suds, I can tell you. Another very hasty line about the way I shall, if necessary, answer, about which I feel pretty confident. 
I should say it is absurd to have libel actions about controversies instead of about quarrels. I would mean every capitalist being prosecuted for saying that socialism is robbery and every socialist for saying property is theft. By great luck, the example lies at the threshold of the passage quoted. The worst I said of Port Sunlight was that it was a slave compound. Why? That was the very phrase about which half the governing class argued with the other half a few years ago. Are all who call the Chinese slaves to be sued by all who didn't? Am I prosecuted for a terminology? Enough, you know the rest. Go on with the passage and you will see the luck continues. Abrupt, brief, and perhaps abbreviated, as my platform answer was, it really does contain all the safeguards against imputing cruelty or human crime to poor lever. It defines slavery as the imposition of the master's private morality, as in the matter of the pugs. It expressly suggests it does not imply cruelty, for it goes out of its way to say that such slaves may be better off under such slavery. So they were, physically, both in Athens and Carolina. It then says that a merely mystical thing, which I think is Christianity, makes me think this slavery damnable, even if it is comfortable. I would defend all this as a lawful sociological comment in any court in civilization. I tell you my line of defense to use discreetly and at your discretion. If the other side are bent on fighting, I should reserve the defense. If they seem open to reason, I should point out that it is on our side. His old schoolfellow, Salter, was also his solicitor, and a letter to Wells shows in part the advice Salter gave. Dear Wells, I'm asked to make a suggestion to you that looks like, and indeed is, infernal impudence, but which a further examination will rob of most of its terrors. Let not these terrors be redoubted when I say that the request comes from my solicitor. It is a great lark. I am writing for him when he ought to be writing for me. In the forthcoming case, Lever versus Chesterton and another, the defendant Chesterton will conduct his own case, as his heart is not, like that of the lady in the song, another's. He wants to fight it purely as a point of the liberty of letters and public speech, and to show that the phrase slavery, wherein I am brought in question, is current in the educated controversy about the tendency of capitalism today. The solicitor, rather to my surprise, approves this general sociological line of defense and says that I may be allowed one or two witnesses of weight and sociological standing, not, of course, to say my words are defensible, still less that my view is right, but simply to say that the servile state and the servile terms in connection with it are known to them as parts of a current and quite unmalicious controversy. He has suggested your name, and when I have written this, I have done my duty to him. You could not, by the laws of evidence, be asked to mix yourself up with my remarks on Lever. You could only be asked, if at all, whether there was or was not a disinterested school of sociology holding that capitalism is close to slavery, quite apart from anybody. Do you care to come and see the fun? Yours always, G.K. Chesterton. The suggested line was so successful that Wells' testimony was not called for. The case was withdrawn. No apology was even asked from Gilbert, whose solicitor tells me that Messrs. Lever behaved very reasonably when once it was made clear to them that Gilbert was not a scurrilous person making a vulgar and slanderous attack upon their business. Chapter 20. The Eve of the War, 1911 to 1915, Part 2. With H.G. Wells, as with Shaw, Gilbert's relations were exceedingly cordial, but with a cordiality occasionally threatened by explosions from Wells. Gilbert's soft answer, however, invariably turned away wrath, and all was well again. No one, Wells said to me, ever had enmity for him, except some literary men who did not know him. They met first, Wells thinks, at the Hubert Blands, and then Gilbert stayed with Wells at Easton. There, they played at the non-existent game of Geit and invented elaborate rules for it. Cecil came too and they played the war game Wells had invented. Cecil, says Wells, comparing him with Gilbert, seemed condensed, not quite big enough for a real Chesterton. 
They built, too, a toy theater at Easton, and among other things, dramatized the minority report of the Poor Law Commission. The play began by the commissioners taking to pieces Bumble the Beetle, putting him into a large cauldron and stewing him. Then, out from the cauldron leaped a renewed, rejuvenated Bumble, several sizes larger than when he went in. In the early days of their acquaintance, Wells remembers meeting the whole Chesterton family in the street of a French town and inviting them to lunch. His own youngest son, a small boy, had left the room for a moment when Wells exclaimed, Where's Frank? Good God, Gilbert. You're sitting on him. The anxious way in which Gilbert got up and turned apologetically toward his own chair was unforgettable. An absent-minded man who, in a gesture of politeness, once gave his seat to three ladies in a bus, might well be alarmed over the fate of a small boy found under him. In his memoirs, Wells relates another pleasing story of a Chestertonian encounter. I once saw Henry James quarreling with his brother William James, the psychologist. He had lost his calm. He was terribly unnerved. He appealed to me, to me of all people, to adjudicate on what was and what was not permissible in England. William was arguing about it in an indisputably American accent with an indecently naked reasonableness. I had come to Rye with a car to fetch William James and his daughter to my home at Sandgate. William had none of Henry's passionate regard for the polish upon the surface of life, and he was immensely excited by the fact that in the little Rye Inn, which had its garden just over the high brick wall of the garden of Lamb House, G.K. Chesterton was staying. William James had corresponded with our vast contemporary, and he sorely wanted to see him. So, with a scandalous directness, he had put the gardener's ladder against that ripe red wall, and clambered up and peeped over. Henry caught him at it. It was the sort of thing that isn't done. It was most emphatically the sort of thing that isn't done. Henry instructed the gardener to put away the ladder, and William was looking thoroughly naughty about it. To Henry's manifest relief, I carried William off, and in the road just outside the town, we ran against the Chestertons, who had been for a drive in Romney Marsh. Chesterton was heated, and I think rather swollen by the sunshine. He seemed to overhang his one-horse fly, and he descended slowly but firmly. He was moist and steamy but cordial. We chatted in the road, and William got his coveted impression. The two must have suited each other a good deal, better than Chesterton and the whole conventional brother. Of Henry's reactions, there was a comment from the other side of the Atlantic. The Louisville Post reported that Henry James, being asked on a visit to his native country, what do you think of Chesterton in England? Replied, in England, what do we not think of Chesterton? The Post commented rather neatly, this we of our compatriot must be considered as either mythical or editorial, unless indeed it refers to that small, exquisite circle which immediately surrounds and envelops him. In his autobiography, Gilbert is appreciative but amusing, describing Henry James' reactions to the arrival of Belloc from a walking tour unbrushed, unwashed, and unshaven. After reading Dickens, William wrote from Cambridge, Oh, Chesterton, but you're a darling. I've just read your Dickens. It's as good as Rabelais. Thanks. Wells asked to debate with Gilbert, wrote to Francis, Spade House, Sandgate, undated. Dear Mrs. Chesterton, God forbid that I should seem a pig. Here a small pig is drawn. And indeed, I am not. And of all the joys in life, nothing would delight me more than a controversy with GKC, who indeed I adore. Here is drawn a tiny Wells adoring a vast Chesterton. But... I have been recklessly promising all and everyone who asks me to lecture or debate, if ever I do so again, it will be for you. And if once I break the vow I took last year. Also, we are really quite in agreement. It's a mere difference in fundamental theory, which doesn't really matter a rap, except for after dinner purposes. Yours ever, H.G. Wells. Francis thought Wells was good for Gilbert he tells me, because he took him out walking. And when the two men were alone, Gilbert would say supplicatingly, we won't go for a walk today, will we? He thought it terrifying, said Wells, the way my life tidied up. Francis, too, tidied up, but cautiously. She prevented G.K., says Wells, from becoming too physically gross. He ought not to have been allowed to use the word jolly more than 40 times a day. 
He could not, Wells thought, have gone on living in a London which was that of ordinary social life, whether Mayfair or Bloomsbury, either the country or Dr. Johnson's London, and of the relations seen by Chesterton between liberty and conviviality, he said, every time he lifted a glass of wine, he lifted it against Cadbury. In spite of growing restrictions as to sales and hours, an inn still remained for Chesterton a symbol of freedom in a world increasingly enslaved. It was pointed out to him how great a peril lay in drink, how homes were broken up and families destroyed through drunkenness. After the war began, a letter from one of his readers stressed a real danger. Now I do beg you, Mr. Chesterton, much as you love writing in praise of drink, to give it a rest during the war. You may have the degradation of any number of silly boys to your account without knowing it. I've written with a freedom, you will say perhaps rudeness, which a casual meeting with you and a great admiration for your work by no means justifies, but which other things perhaps do. I beg you to forgive me. It seems to me that this charge he never quite answered. To claim liberty is one thing, to him the glories of wine is quite another. And when he was attacked for the latter, he always defended the former, saying that he did not deny the peril, but that all freedom meant peril. Peril must be preferred to slavery. There were things in which a man must be free to choose, even if his choice be evil. This is part of Chesterton's whole philosophy about drink, a subject on which he wrote constantly. It is interesting to note the stages of its development in his mind. The Chesterton family had not a Puritan tradition in the sense of being teetotal, but Lucian Oldershaw tells me that in their boyhood, he always felt G.K. himself to be a bit of a Puritan and I've come upon a boyish poem that seems to confirm this in the matter of wine. The teapot. Raised high on tripod, flashing bright, the holy silver urn, within whose inmost cavern dark the secret waters burn. Before the temple's gateway the subject teacups bow, and pass it steaming with thy gift, thy brown autumnal glow. Within thy tiny fortress the tea leaf treasure pile, o'er which the fiery fountain pours its waters undefiled. Till the witch water steals away the essence they unfold and dashes from the yawning spout a torrent arch of gold. Then fill an honest cup, my lads, and quaff the draught amain, and lay the earthen goblet down and fill it yet again. Nor heed the curses on the cup that rise from folly's school, the sneering of the drunkard in the warning of a fool. To leave the steward's cavalier, the revel's blood-red wine, to hiccup out a tyrant's health and swear his right divine. Mine, Cromwell's cup, to stir within, the spirit cool and sure, to face another star chamber, a second Marston Moor. Leave to the genius scorner, the sought soul-slaying urns that stained the fame of Addison and wrecked the life of Burns. For Eddie's hand, his private pot, that for no waiter waits. For Cowper's lips, his cup that cheers, but not inebriates. Goal of infantine hope, unknown mystic felicity. Sangrail of childish quest, much sought, ethereal real tea. Thy faintest tint of yellow on the milk and water pale, like my disdain on Pactulus, gives joy that cannot fail reference to Cromwell's teapot was that it was among the first used in England. Eddie, the artist, made his own tea in all hotels in a private pot. Childhood's May I Have Real Tea had grown into a tea table of the junior debating club and Lucian Oldershaw remembers Gilbert as a young man still lunching at tea shops. I found recently two versions of a fragment of a story called The Human Club written when he was at the Slade School. The second version opens, a meal was spread on the table for the members of the human club, were, as their name implies, human. However, glorified and transformed, the meal, however, consisted principally of tea and coffee. For the humans were total abstainers, not with the virulent assertion of a negative formula, but as an enlightened ratification of a profound social effort. Hear, hear. Not as the meaningless idolatry, cheers, of an isolated nostrum, renewed cheers, but as a chivalrous sacrifice for the triumph of the civic morality, the long cheers and uproar. 
The aims of the human club were many, but among the more practical and immediate was the entire perfection of everything. Perfection is impossible, said the host Eric Peterson, bowing his colossal proportions over the coffee pot. He was in the habit of showing these abrupt rifts of his train of thought like gigantic fragments of a frieze. But, he said then quite simply, with no change in his bleak blue eyes, perfection is impossible, thank God. The impossible is the eternal. We are a long way from tea, the oriental, cocoa, the vulgar beast, and wine, the true festivity of man, that we find in wine, water, and song. Chesterton had meanwhile discovered the wine-drinking peasants of France and Italy, and he had discovered what were left of the old-fashioned inns of England, where cider or beer are drunk by the sort of Englishmen he had come to love best, the poor. In his revolt against that dreary and pretentious element that he most hated in the middle classes, he had come to feel that the life of the poor, as they themselves had shaped it, when they were free men, was the ideal. And that ideal included moderate drinking, drinking to express joy in life and to increase it. Already in Heretics, 1904, he had in the essay called Omar and the Sacred Vine attacked the evil of pessimistic drinking. A man should never drink because he is miserable. He will be wise to avoid drink as a medicine for help being a normal thing he will tend, in search of it, to drink too much. But no man expects pleasure all the time, so if he drinks for pleasure, the danger of excess is less. The sound rule in the matter would appear to be like many other rules, a paradox. Drink because you are happy, but never because you're miserable. Never drink when you are wretched without it, or you will be like the gray-faced gin drinker in the slum. But drink when you would be happy without it, and you will be like the laughing peasants of Italy. Never drink because you need it, for this is rational drinking, and the way to death and hell. But drink because you do not need it, for this is irrational drinking in the ancient health of the world. From Heretics, John Lane, Chapter 7, page 103. But the human will must be brought into action, and the gifts of God must be taken with the thanksgiving that is restrained. We must thank God for beer and burgundy by not drinking too much of them. The topic seemed to fascinate him and he returned to it again and again. In one essay he described himself opening all the windows in a private bar to get rid of the air of secrecy that he hated. Wine should be taken, not secretly, but frankly and in fellowship, as men in inns do dine. Cocktails he abominated, and in fact strong spirits were almost as evil as wine and beer were good. In an essay, The Cowardice of Cocktails, he is especially scathing in his comment on those who urge that they give a man an appetite for his meals. From Sidelights on New London and Newer York, page 45. This is unworthy of a generation that is always claiming to be candid and courageous. In the second aspect, it is utterly unworthy of a generation that claims to keep itself fit by tennis and golf and all sorts of athletics. What are these athletics worth if, after all their athletics, they cannot scratch up such a thing as a natural appetite? Most of my work is, I will not venture to say literary, but at least sedentary. I never do anything except walk about and throw clubs and javelins in the garden. But I never require anything to give me an appetite for a meal. I never yet needed a tot of rum to help me go over the top and face the mortal perils of luncheon. Quite rationally considered, there has been a decline in degradation in these things. First came the old drinking days, which are always described as much more healthy. In those days, men worked or played, hunted or herded, or plowed or fished, or even, in their rude way, wrote or spoke, if only expressing the simple minds of Socrates or Shakespeare and then got reasonably drunk in the evening when their work was done. We find the first step of the degradation when men do not drink when their work is done, but drink in order to do their work. Workmen used to wait in queues outside the factories of 40 years ago to drink nips of neat whiskey to enable them to face life in the progressive and scientific factory. But at least it may be admitted that life in the factory was something that it took some courage to face. These men felt they had to take an anesthetic before they could face pain. What are we to say of those who have to take an anesthetic before they can face pleasure? 
one of those who, when faced with the terrors of mayonnaise, eggs, or sardines, can only utter a faint cry for brandy. One of those who have to be drugged, maddened, inspired, and intoxicated to the point of partaking of meals, like the assassins to the point of committing murders. If, as they say, the use of the drug means the increase of the dose, where will it stop? And at what precise point of frenzy and delusion will a healthy grown-up man be ready to rush headlong upon a cutlet or make a dash for death or glory at a ham sandwich? This is obviously the most abject stage of all, worse than that of the man who drinks for the sake of work, and much worse than that of the man who drinks for the sake of play. Wine, Chesterton maintained, should not be drunk as an aid to creative production, yet one may find that increased power of creation sometimes follows in its wake. And here, of course, was a danger to a man who worked as hard as Chesterton. He sometimes spoke of himself as idle, but I think it would be hard to match either his output or his hours of creative work. I remember one visit that I paid to Beaconsfield when he was writing one of his major books. He was in his study by 10 in the morning, emerged at lunch at 1, and went back from about 2.30 to 4.30. After tea, he worked again until 7.30 dinner. His wife and I went to bed at about 10.30, leaving him preparing his material for the next day. Towards 1 a.m., a ponderous tread as he passed my door on his way to bed woke me to a general impression of an earthquake. In the passage in Magic, G.K. makes his hero say, I happen to have what is called a strong head, and I have never been really drunk. It was true of himself, but in these years, just before the Great War, before his own severe illness, intimate friends have told me they had seen him unlike himself that they felt he had come to depend almost absent-mindedly, one said, on the stimulus of wine for the sheer physical power to pour forth so much. Besides open work, G.K. was in these days mentally oppressed by the strain of the Marconi case, and then almost overwhelmed by the horror of the World War. A man very tender of heart, sensitive and intensely imaginative, he could not react as calmly as Cecil himself did to what both believed the probability of the latter's imprisonment. And when that strain was removed, there remained the stain on national honor, the opening gulf into which he saw his country falling. To him, the Marconi case was a heavier burden than the war. For, as he saw it, in the Marconi case, the nation was wrong in enduring corruption. And in the war, the nation was magnificently right in resisting tyranny. So Chesterton felt Yet the outbreak of the war, with all its human suffering to mind and body, weighed heavily upon him too. He wrote The Barbarism of Berlin, of which I will say something in the next chapter, for it belongs to those writings of the war period, the series of which is so consistent that in his autobiography he was able to claim that he had no sympathy with the rather weak-minded reaction that is going on around us. At the first outbreak of World War I, attended the conference of all the English men of letters called together to compose a reply to the manifesto of the German professors. I, at least among all those writers, can say, what I have written, I have written. Then his illness came upon him. And Dr. Pocock, coming for a first visit, found the bed partly broken under the weight of the patient who was lying in a grotesquely awkward position, his hips higher than his head. You must be horribly uncomfortable, he said. Why, now you mention it, said G.K., a man receiving a new idea? I suppose I am. The doctor ordered a water bed, and almost the last words he heard before the patient sank into a coma were, I wonder if this bally ship will ever get to shore. The illness lasted several months. We can follow its progress, and his, in extracts from letters written to Father O'Connor by Francis. November 25th, 1914. You must pray for him. He is seriously ill, and I have two nurses. It is mostly heart trouble, but there are complications. He is quite his normal self, as to head and brain, and he even dictates and reads a great deal. December 29th, 1914. Gilbert had a bad relapse on Christmas Eve, and now is being desperately ill. He is not often conscious and is so weak. I feel he might ask for you. If so, I shall wire. The doctor is still hopeful, but I feel in despair. January 3rd, 1915. If you came, he would not know you, and this condition may last some time. The brain is dormant and must be kept so. 
If he is sufficiently conscious at any moment to understand, I will ask him to let you come, or will send on my own responsibility. Pray for his soul and mine. January 7, 1915. Gilbert seemed decidedly clearer yesterday, and though not quite so well today, the doctor says he has reason to hope the mental trouble is working off. His heart is stronger, and he is able to take plenty of nourishment. Under the circumstances, therefore, I am hoping and praying he may soon be sufficiently himself to tell us what he wants done. I am dreadfully unhappy at not knowing how he would wish me to act. His parents would never forgive me if I acted only on my own authority. I do pray to God he will restore him to himself that we may know. I feel in his mercy he will, even if death is the end of it, or the beginning, shall I say. January 12, 1915. He is really better, I believe, and by the mercy of God, I dare hope he is to be restored to us. Physically, he is stronger, and the brain is beginning to work normally. And soon, I trust, we shall be able to ask him his wishes with regard to the church. I am so thankful to think that we might get at his desire. In January 1915, Francis wrote to my mother, Gilbert remains much the same in a semi-conscious condition, sleeping a great deal. I feel absolutely hopeless. It seems impossible it can go on like this. The impossibility of reaching him is too terrible an experience, and I don't know how to go through with it. I pray for strength, and you must pray for me. Here's Josephine, she wrote in a later undated letter. Gilbert is today a little better, after being practically at a standstill for the past week. He asked for me today, which is a great advance, and hugged me. I feel like Elijah, doesn't it? And shall go in the strength of that hug 40 days. The recovery will be very slow, the doctors tell me, and we have to prevent his using his brain at all. In this letter, she begged to see my mother, and I remember when they met, she told her that one day she had tried to test whether Gilbert was conscious by asking him, who is looking after you? He answered very gravely, God, and I felt so small she said. Presently, Francis told my mother that Gilbert had talked to her about coming into the Catholic Church. It was just at this time that she wrote to tell Father O'Connor that Gilbert said to her, did you think I was going to die? And followed this with a question, does Father O'Connor know? After a conversation with my mother, Francis wrote to her. March 21st, I think I would rather you did not tell anyone just yet of what I told you regarding my husband and the Catholic Church. Not that I doubt for a moment that he meant it and knew what he was saying and was relieved at saying it, but I don't want the world at large to be able to say that he came to this decision when he was weak and unlike himself. He will ratify it, no doubt, when his complete manhood is restored. I know it was not weakness that made him say it, but you will understand my scruples. I know in God's good time he will make his confession of faith, and if death comes near him again, I shall know how to act. Thanks for all your sympathy. I did enjoy seeing you. On Easter Eve, Francis wrote two letters, one to Father O'Connor and one to my mother. To Father O'Connor, she said, All goes well here, though still very, very slowly. G's mind is gradually clearing, but it is still difficult to him to distinguish between the real and the unreal. I am quite sure he will soon be able to think and act for himself, but I dare not hurry matters at all. I've told him I am writing to you often, and he said, That is right. I'll see him soon. I want to talk to him. He wanders at times, but the clear intervals are longer. He repeated the creed last night, this time in English. To my mother, I feel the enormous significance of the resurrection of the body when I think of my dear husband just consciously laying hold of life again. Indeed, I will pray that your dear ones may be kept in safety. God bless you for all your sympathy. I am so glad that Gilbert's decision for I'm sure it was a decision, has made you so happy. I dare not hurry anything. The least little excitement upsets him. Last night he said the creed and asked me to read parts of Myers' St. Paul. He still wanders a good deal when tired, but is certainly a little stronger. Love and Easter blessings to you all. We ourselves were passing then through the shadow of death. Almost as Gilbert rose again to this life, my father passed into life eternal. One of the very few letters I possess in Gilbert's own handwriting was also one of the first he wrote on recovery. It was to my mother. I fear I have delayed writing to you and partly with a vague feeling that I might 
so find some way of saying what I feel on your behalf and others, and of course, it has not come. Somewhat of what the world and a wider circle of friends have lost, I shall try to say in the Dublin Review, by the kindness of Monsignor Barnes, who has invited me to contribute to it. But of all I feel and Francis feels, and of the happy times we have had in your house, I despair of saying anything at all. I can only hope you and yours will be able to read between the lines what I write, either here or there, and understand that the simultaneous losses of a good friend and a fine intellect have a way of stunning rather than helping the expression of either. I would say I am glad he lived to see what I feel to be a rebirth of England. If his mere presence in an older generation did not prove to me that England never died. This sense of the rebirth of England gave Gilbert's restored life a special quality of triumph that abode down to the end of the war. Chapter 21, Part 1, The War Years Gilbert was taking up life again, and with it the old friendships and the old debates. In the new atmosphere created by the war, to Bernard Shaw he wrote, June 12, 1915. My dear Bernard Shaw, I ought to have written to you a long time ago to thank you for your kind letter, which I received when I had recovered, and still more for many other kindnesses that seem to have come from you during the time before my recovery. I am not a vegetarian, and I am only in a very comparative sense a skeleton. Indeed, I am afraid you must reconcile yourself to the dismal prospect of my being more or less like what I was before and any resumption of my ordinary habits must necessarily include the habit of disagreeing with you. What and where and when is uncommon sense about the war? How can I get hold of it? I do not merely ask as one hungry for hostilities, but also as one unusually hungry for good literature. Il me faut des géants, as Cyrano says. So, I naturally wish to hear the last about you. You probably know that I do not agree with you about the war. I do not think it is going on on its own momentum. I think it is going on in accordance with that logical paradox whereby the thing that is most difficult to do is also the thing that must be done. If it were an easy war to end, it would have been a wicked war to begin. If a cat has nine lives, one must kill it nine times, saving your humanitarian feelings and always supposing it's a witch's cat and really draws its powers from hell. I've always thought that there was in Prussia an evil will. I would not have made it a ground for going to war, but I was quite sure of it long before there was any war at all. But I suppose we shall someday have an opportunity of arguing about all that. Meanwhile, my thanks and good wishes are as sincere as my opinions, and I do not think those insincere. Yours always sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. Bernard Shaw replied, 22nd June, 1915. My dear Chesterton, I am delighted to learn under your own hand that you have recovered all your health and powers with an unimpaired figure. You have also the gratification of knowing that you have carried out a theory of mine that every man of genius has a critical illness at 40, nature's object being to make him go to bed for several months. Sometimes nature overdoes it. Schiller and Mozart died. Goethe survived, though he very nearly followed Schiller into the shades. I did the thing myself quite handsomely by spending 18 months on crutches, having two surgical operations, and breaking my arm. I distinctly noticed that instead of my recuperation beginning when my breakdown ended, it began before that. The ascending curve cut through the tail of the descending one and I was consummating my collapse and rising for the next flight simultaneously. It is perfectly useless for you to try to differ with me about the war. Nobody can differ with me about the war. You might as well differ from the Almighty about the orbit of the sun. I have got the war right, and to that complexion, you too must come at last, your nature not being a fundamentally erroneous one. At the same time, it is a great pity you were not born in Ireland. You would have had the advantage of hearing the burning patriotism of your native land expressing itself by saying exactly the same things about England that English patriotism now says about Prussia, and of recognizing 
that though they were entirely true, they were also a very great nuisance, as they prevented people from building the future by conscious thought. Also, Cecil would have seen what the Catholic Church is really like when the apostolic succession falls to the farmer's son, who is cleverer with school books than with agricultural implements. In fact, you would have learned a devil of a lot of things, for lack of which you often drive me to exclaim, Gilbert, Gilbert, why persecutest thou me? As to the evil will, of course there is an evil will in Prussia. Prussia is in paradise. I have been fighting that evil will in myself and others all my life. It is the will of the brave Barabbas and of the militant nationalists who admired him and crucified the pro-Gentile. But the Prussians must save their own souls. They also have their Shahs and Chestertons and a divine spark in them for these to work on. What we have to do is to make ridiculous the cry of vengeance is mine, said Podsnap. And whenever anyone tells an Englishman a lie, to explain to the poor devil that it is a lie and that he must stop cheering it as a splendid speech. For an Englishman never compares speeches either with facts or with previous speeches. To him a speech is art for art's sake. The disciples or our favored politicians being really, if they only knew it, disciples of Whistler. Also, and equally important, we have to bear in mind that the English genius does not, like the German, lie in disciplined idealism. The Englishman is an anarchist and a grumbler. He has no such word as fatherland, and the idea which he supposes corresponds to it is nothing but the swing of a roaring chorus to a patriotic song. Also, he is a muddler and a slacker because tense and continuous work means thought, and he is lazy and fat in the head. But as long as he is himself and grumbles, it does not matter. Given a furious opposition, screaming for the disgrace of tyrannical and corrupt ministers, and a press on the very verge of inviting Napoleon to enter London in triumph and deliver a groaning land from the intolerable burden of its native rulers, incapacity and rapacity, and obsolescence in the departments will work as well as the enemy's departments, perhaps better, and the government will have to keep its wits at full pressure. But once let England try what she is trying now, that is to combine the devoted silence and obedience of the German system with the slack and muddle of coodle and doodle, and we are lost. Unless you keep up as hot a fire from your ink bottle on the government as the soldier keeps up from the trenches, you are betraying that soldier. Of course they will call you pro-German. What of that? They call me pro-German. We also must stand fire. As Pierre Gint said of hell, if the torture is only moral, it cannot be so very bad. I grieve to say that some fool has stolen my title and issued a two-page pamphlet called Uncommon Sense About the War, so I shall have to call mine More Common Sense About the War. It is not yet in type. I haven't yet quite settled its destination. Any chance of seeing you both if we drive over from Ayotte to Beaconsfield some Sunday or other afternoon? Yours ever, GBS. Wells, too, is rejoicing over his recovery. Dear old GKC, I am so delighted to get a letter from you again. As soon as I can, I will come to Beaconsfield and see you. I am absurdly busy in bringing together the rulers of the country and the scientific people of whom they are totally ignorant. George has never heard of Ramsey, and so on. And the hash and muddle and quackery on our technical side is appalling. It all means boys' lives in Flanders, and horrible waste and suffering. Well, anyhow, if we've got only obscure and cramped and underpaid scientific men, we have a bench of fine, fat bishops and no end of tremendous lawyers. One of the best ideas for the Ypres position came from Robert Mohn but the execution was too difficult for our officers to attempt. So we've got a row of wounded and mangled men that could reach from Beaconsfield to Great Marlow, just to show we don't take stock in these damn scientific people. Yours ever, H.G. No one, however mad, could have called Gilbert a pro-German. It was, perhaps, the only accusation the new witness escaped. But while he largely agreed with Shaw's analysis of the English man, as a natural anarchist and grumbler, while he believed in the voluntary principle and disliked conscription, his general outlook was as different from Shaw's as were the pamphlets they both wrote. In a book addressed to a German professor, G.K. frankly confessed the real crimes of England 
from which she was now making reparation. To any Englishman living in the native atmosphere, the suggestion that England had been preparing an aggression against Germany seemed more than faintly ludicrous. We were not engaged in plotting in Europe. On the contrary, we were far too careless of Europe. And the funds of the Liberal Party, which was in power, actually depended chiefly on Quaker millionaires who were noted pacifists and at whose bidding national honor was jeopardized by our delay in declaring our support of France. We were not prepared for war, and probably only the shock of the invasion of Belgium made certain our stand with France. It may seem an idle contradiction to say that our strength in this war came from not being prepared, but there is a truth that cannot be otherwise expressed. The strongest thing in sane anger is surprise. If we had time to think, we might have thought better, that is worse. Everything that could be instinctive managed to be strong. The instant fury of contempt with which the better spirit in our rulers flung back the Prussian bribe. The instant solidarity of all parties. Above all, the brilliant instinct by which the Irish leader cast into the scale of a free Europe the ancient sword of Ireland from the uses of diversity. Our crimes were in the past, not the present. The first had been when we gave aid to Prussia against Austria. Austria, which was not a nation, but a kind of empire, a holy Roman empire that never came, which still retained something of the old Catholic comfort for the soul. We had helped to put Prussia instead of Austria at the head of the Germanies. Prussia, which in the person of Frederick the Great, hated everything German and everything good. Francophile, as Chesterton was, he yet had a certain tenderness for those old Germanies which preserved the good things that go with small interests and strict boundaries, music, etiquette, a dreamy philosophy, and so on. Our next crimes had been in calling Prussia to our aid against Napoleon and in failing to assist Denmark against her. And by far, our worst had been the using of Prussian mercenaries with their ghastly tradition of cruelty in Ireland in the 98. There is in this little book one drawback from the historian's point of view. Its view of the past is so oddly selective. Doubtless it is lawful to examine your own nation's conscience as you do your own and not your neighbor's, yet history should be rather an examination of facts than an examination of conscience. And historically, Richelieu's policies had had quite something to say in the creation of Prussia. The conscript armies of the French Revolution had first made Europe into an armed camp. It was an undue simplification to insist exclusively on the crimes of England. But even while he did so, Chesterton rejoiced that now, at long last, England was on the right side, on the side of Europe and of sanity. The new witness group had always seen the issue as their countrymen were now suddenly beginning to see it. They had no sympathy with the liberal thinking made in Germany that had, in the name of biblical and historical criticism, been undermining the basis of Christianity. Their love of logic and of clarity had made German philosophy intolerable to them. It was wind and it was fog. Finally, their love of France had always made them conceive of Europe as centering in that country. For them, there was one profound satisfaction, even amid the horrors of war, that the issues were so clear. But were they as clear to the whole world? If not, they must be made so. There were two main problems to be overcome in this matter, one of which was less pronounced at the time than it became later, the economic interpretation of history. Started by Karl Marx, the idea that all history can be interpreted solely by economic causes has come since to have an extraordinary popularity, even among those whose own philosophy and sociology are most widely removed from Marx. It is a view which Chesterton would always have dismissed with the contempt it deserves. Both he and Belloc saw as the determining factor in history, because it is the determining factor in human life, the free will of man. This does not mean that they would deny that the economic factor has often been powerful in conquering man's liberty or a motive in its exercise. But Chesterton regarded the present age as a diseased one, precisely because the money motive held so disproportionate a place in it. He looked back to the past and saw the world of today as almost unique in that respect. He looked forward to the future and hoped for a release from it. 
As he looked back into the past, he saw something in the history of mankind far stronger than the economic motive, whether that mean the strife for wealth or the mere struggle for subsistence. He saw the all-pervading power of religion, which in bygone ages had presided over man's activities and turned the exercise of that most noble faculty-free will to the building of a civilization today undreamed of. But in 1914, it was easier to get away from the economic interpretation of history than it was to overcome another difficulty in the minds of those who had not the Chesterton vision of Europe, and to whom it seemed that in a war between nations, it was extremely likely that all parties were more or less equally to blame. History, said Chesterton, tends to be a facade of faded picturesqueness for most of those who have not specially studied it a more or less monochrome background for the drama of their own day. But the nature of that background and the vision of today's drama will vary with the varying angle of historic vision. There were two possible meanings for the statement that all nations were to blame for the world war. All nations had gone away from God. Motives of personal and national greed had ousted the old ideal of Christendom. It might roughly be said that no nation was seriously trying to seek the kingdom of God and its justice. International finance had become a shadow resting on all the earth, and it could not have got this power if governments had been governing solely for the good of their peoples. Bow down your heads before God is the invocation constantly used in the Missal during the penitential season of Lent, and the government of every nation needed this call to repentance. With this interpretation, Chesterton would have agreed. All nations were to blame for the predisposing causes that made a world war possible. But when we come to the question of actual responsibility for making this particular war, the statement means something very different, and something with which Chesterton was prepared to join issue. Against him, those who disliked France or England, and saw the history of those two countries as a history of imperialism, were saying, if Germany had not attacked France, France would have attacked Germany, or England would have been equally treacherous if it had paid her. Look at the Treaty of Limerick. Chesterton kept imploring people simply to look at the facts. Germany had in fact broken her word to France and attacked her. France had not attacked Germany. Germany had invaded Belgium. England had not invaded Holland to seize a naval and commercial advantage, and whether they say that they wished to do it in our greed or feared to do it in our cowardice, the fact remains that we did not do it. Unless this common sense principle be kept in view, I cannot conceive of how any quarrel can possibly be judged. A contract may be made between two persons solely for material advantage on each side, but the moral advantage is still generally supposed to lie with the person who keeps the contract. From Barbarism of Berlin, pages 15 and 16. The promise and the vow were fundamental to Chesterton's view of human life. Discussing divorce, he claims as essential to manhood the right to bind oneself and to be taken at one's word. The marriage vow was almost the only vow that remained out of the whole medieval conception of chivalry, and he could not endure to see it set at naught. But even in the modern world, there still remains some notion of the sacredness of a solemn promise. It is plain that the promise or extension of responsibility through time is what chiefly distinguishes us, I will not say from savages, but from brutes and reptiles. This was noted by the shrewdness of the Old Testament when it summed up the dark, irresponsible enormity of Leviathan in the words, Will he make a pact with thee? The vow is to the man what the song is to the bird, or the bark to the dog his voice whereby he is known. There were two chief marks whereby it seemed to Chesterton that the Prussian invasion of Belgium was fundamentally an attack on civilization. The attempt for a promise was the first. He called it the War on the Word. Also from The Barbarism of Berlin, pages 32 and 33. The other mark of barbarism he called the refusal of reciprocity. The Prussians, he wrote, have been told by their literary men that everything depends upon mood, and by their politicians that all arrangements dissolve before necessity. This was not merely a contempt for the word, 
but also an assumption that German necessity was like no other necessity because the German cannot get outside the idea that he, because he is he and not you, is free to break the law and also to appeal to the law. Thus, the Kaiser at once violated the Hague Convention openly himself and wrote to the President of the United States to complain that the Allies were violating it. For this principle of a quite unproved racial supremacy is the last and worst of the refusals of reciprocity. Also from The Barbarism of Berlin, page 37 and page 60. If these two ideas were allowed to prevail, they must destroy civilization. And so to Chesterton, the war was a crusade, and to his profound joy, was understood as such by the people of England. The democratic spirit of our country is rather unusually sluggish and far below the surface. And the most genuine and purely popular movement that we have had since the Chartists has been the enlistment for this war. Chesterton loved the heroic humor of the trenches. The cry of early doors from the boys rushing on death, the term blighty for England and congratulations on a severe wound as a good blighty one, the song under showers of bullets, when it's raining, keep your umbrella up. The English, he once said, had no religion left except their sense of humor. But I think he meant that they hung out humor somewhat defiantly as a smokescreen for other things. Anyhow, he doubted neither that the war was worth winning nor that it could be won by our soldiers and sailors. And with the soldiers and sailors stood the munition workers and the trades unions, which had sacrificed their cherished rights for the war period. If the only danger to England was on the home front, it was not, in his eyes, to be found in the mass of the nation. Nor was he at first too apprehensive of the actions of the government. Asquith and Sir Edward Grey might have been slow in declaring war, but both were patriotic Englishmen, and with them stood with equal patriotism the mass of the governing classes. If, as has later been said, the war had really been brought about by English political and financial interests, it's strange that Lord Desborough, the head of the London house of J.P. Morgan and a leading financier of England, should have lost his two elder sons, and the Prime Minister, his eldest. But the new witness did see two dangers at home which might jeopardize the success of our armies in the field and bring about a premature and dishonorable peace. These were international finance and the press magnets. Nothing so reminds me of how we were all feeling about the daily papers just then as finding this letter to E.C. Bentley, dated July 20th, 1915. I was delighted to hear from you, though very sorry to hear you have been bad. I mean physically bad. Morally and intellectually, you have evidently been very good. Seriously. I think you've done something to save this country. For the Telegraph continues to be almost the only paper that the crisis has sobered and not tipsified. I take it in myself and know many others who do so. Part of the fun about Armsworth is that quite a lot of old ladies of both sexes go about distinguishing elaborately between the Daily Mail and the Times. It is a stagnant state of mind created in people who have never been forced by revolution or other public peril to distinguish between the things they are used to and the thoughts for which the things are supposed to stand. If you printed the whole of Ali Sloper's Half Holiday and called it the Athenaeum, they would read it with unmoved faces. So long as St. Paul's Cathedral stood in the usual place, they would not mind if there was a crescent on top of it instead of a cross. By the way, I see the Germans have actually done what I described as a wild fancy in the flying in. Combine the cross and the crescent in one ornamental symbol. Both these papers, the Daily Mail and the Times, were then owned by the same man, Alfred Harmsworth, who had become Lord Northcote. I'm inclined to think that the attack on Harmsworth, which the new witness developed, attributed too much to purposed malice and did not allow enough for the journalistic craving for news and for scoops. Probably some of the posters and articles to which they objected were not the work of Lord Northcliffe, but of some young journalist anxious to sell his paper. Nevertheless, the new witness attack was not only largely justified, but was also remarkably courageous. The staff of the new witness were themselves journalists and men of letters in both capacities, as powerful a newspaper owner as Lord Northcliffe could damage them severely, and did. Never henceforward would any of them be able to write in one of his numerous papers, 
never would one of their books receive a favorable review. For Belloc did not hesitate to call Lord Northcliffe a traitor for the way in which he had attacked Kitchener, while Cecil amused himself by reviewing and pointing out the illiteracy of that strange peer's own writing. Later, too, when Harmsworth's papers were in full cry for the fall of Asquith and the substitution of Lloyd George, the new witness took a strong stand. They pointed out, too, the way in which censorship was exercised against the smaller newspapers while the Northcliffe press seemed immune. Here was the fundamental danger. Whatever the motive, some of the attacks and articles printed were undoubtedly calculated in military language to cause harm and despondency. It was appalling that in the time of war this should be permitted, and as they saw it, permitted because the Harmsworth millions had been used to secure a hold on certain politicians. To the new witness, George was simply Harmsworth's man. Meanwhile, at Easter 1916 came the awful tragedy of the Irish Rising. Chesterton had fallen into the sleep of his long illness soon after the splendid gesture in which Redmond had offered the sword of Ireland to the Allied cause. And there seems little doubt that in making this offer, Redmond had with him, for the last time, the people of Ireland. Recruiting began well, but that awful fate of stupidity that seems to overtake every Englishman dealing with Ireland, even now, was overwhelming the two countries. Sir Francis Vane, an Irish officer in the British Army, described in a series of articles in The New Witness the blunders made in the recruiting campaign, such things as prominent Protestant Unionists being brought to the fore, national sentiment discouraged, waving of Union Jacks, appeals to patriotism not for Ireland, but for England. Vane himself found his attempt at recruiting on national lines unpopular and with authority and in the midst of his successful effort was recalled to England. Still, though recruiting slackened, the cause of the Allies remained in Ireland the popular cause, and the Easter Rising was the work only of a handful of men. Its immediate cause was the fact that although the Home Rule Bill had been passed and was on the statute book, its operation was again deferred. All Irishmen saw this as a breach of faith, and the majority were not at that time behind the Rising. The severity of its repression turned out almost overnight into a national cause and erected yet another barrier against friendship between England and Ireland. For this friendship, Chesterton longed ardently and worked passionately. Nor did he believe the barriers insurmountable. He even held that there was, between the people of the two countries, a natural amity. There is something common to all the Britons, which even acts of union have not torn asunder. The nearest name for it is insecurity, something fitting in men walking on cliffs and the verge of things. Adventure, a lonely taste in liberty, a humor without wit, perplex their critics and perplex themselves. Their souls are fretted like their coasts. The Irish and the English had suffered oppression at the same hands, those of the rulers of England. If Prussian soldiers had been used against Irish peasants, so too had they been used against English chartists. A typical Englishman, William Cobbett, had suffered fine and long imprisonment because of his protest against the flogging of an English soldier by a German mercenary. Short History of England, page 7. Telling the truth about Ireland, wrote Chesterton, is not very pleasant to a patriotic Englishman, but it is very patriotic. For the lack of the essential patriotism of admitting past sin, the rulers of England were perpetuating an evil that many of them sincerely desired to end. For this was a case where the right road could only be found by retracing the steps of the long road of wrong. The Crimes of England, page 57. Before the end of the war, G.K. visited Ireland, and in the book that he wrote, after this visit, may be found his best analysis of all this matter. Ireland, he believed, was making a mistake in not throwing herself into the cause of the defeat of Germany, not because she owed anything to England, but because of what Prussia was and of what Europe meant. Ireland had been the friend of France and the enemy of Prussia long before England had been either. She would do well to hold to her ancient allegiance. It was true that Ireland had been betrayed by the liberal promise of home rule, but the men who betrayed her were the Marconi men. Redmond had made the great mistake of his career when, from motives of patriotism for Ireland, he had helped the party hacks of the government committee to whitewash these men. 
who had gone on to betray Ireland as they were then betraying England. England too needed home rule. England too needed deliverance from her degenerate and unworthy governing class. There are a few pages in Irish Impressions, now out of print, which find their place here in illustration of what he meant by his championship of nationality. A brilliant writer once propounded to me his highly personal and even perverse type of internationalism by saying, as a sort of unanswerable challenge, wouldn't you rather be ruled by Goethe than by Walter Long? I replied that words could not express the wild love and loyalty I should feel for Mr. Walter Long if the only alternative were Goethe. I could not have put my own national case in a clearer and more compact form. I might occasionally feel inclined to kill Mr. Long, but under the approaching shadow of Goethe, I should feel more inclined to kill myself. That is the deathly element of denationalization, that it poisons life itself, the most real of all realities. Some people felt it an affectation that the Irish had put up their street signs in Gaelic, but G.K. defended it. It's well to remember that these things, which we also walk past every day, are exactly the sort of things that always have, in the nameless fashion, the national note. It is this sensation of stemming a stream, of 10,000 things all pouring one way, labels, titles, monuments, metaphors, modes of address, assumptions and controversy, that make an Englishman in Ireland know that he is in a strange land. Nor is he merely bewildered as among a medley of strange things. On the contrary, if he has any sense, he soon finds them united and simplified to a single impression, as if he were talking to a strange person. He cannot define it, because nobody can define a person and nobody can define a nation. He can only see it, smell it, hear it, handle it, bump into it, fall over it, kill it, be killed for it, or be damned for doing it wrong. He must be content with these mere hints of its existence, but he cannot define it because it is like a person and no book of logic will undertake to define Aunt Jane or Uncle William. We can only say with more or less mournful conviction that if Aunt Jane is not a person, there is no such thing as a person. And I say with equal conviction that if Ireland is not a nation, there is no such thing as a nation. Chapter 21, Part 2 the war years. In September 1916, Cecil Chesterton bade farewell to the new witness. He was in the army as a private in the East and in the East Surreys, and G.K. took over the editorship. I like Chesterton's paper, The New Witness, wrote an American journalist in the New York Tribune, no, not yet Herald Tribune, since GKC has taken it over. Gilbert Chesterton seems to me the best thing England has produced since Dickens. I like the things he believes in, and I hate sociological experts and prohibitionists and all and officers, which are the things he hates. I feel in him that a very honest man is speaking. I like his impotence to Northcliffe. As a journalist, Chesterton gets only about a quarter of himself into action, but even a quarter of Chesterton is good measure. He works very hard at his journalism. That is why he doesn't do it as well as his careless things, which give him fun. But for all that, there is no other editorial page in England or the United States written with the snap, wit, and honest humanity of his paragraphs. I hope he won't blunt himself by overwork. It would be an international loss if that same jolly mind is bent to routine, England has need of them. The overwork and the high quality of it were alike undeniable, but after the long repose of his illness, G.K. seemed like a giant refreshed and ready to run his course. Each week's new witness had an editorial. Besides the paragraphs of which the New York Tribune speaks, not all of these, however, written by himself, and a signed article under the suggestive general heading at the sign of the world's end. The difference between articles and a real book and the degree of work needed to turn the one into the other may be seen if the essays on marriage in the paper be compared with the superstition of divorce for which they furnished material, and those on Ireland with Irish impressions. There were besides very many articles in other papers, English and American, and he was also writing his history of England. If all Englishmen 
had kept the same unwavering gaze at reality as Chesterton, much of what he called the rather feeble-minded reaction that followed the war might have been avoided, and with it, the advent of Hitler. Particularly, he opposed the tendency to call Kaiserism, what is now called Hitlerism, and should always be called Prussianism. While agreeing that care should be taken not to write of German atrocities that could not be substantiated, he insisted that there was no ground for forgetting or ignoring the findings of the American inquiry in Belgium, which had established more than enough. These horrors, the bombing of civilians, shelling of open towns, and sinking of passenger ships, culminating with the Lusitania, were in the main what brought America into the war. Here, as with England, Chesterton did not admit as primary what has since been so exclusively stressed, the economic motive. Here, as with England, he took the volunteer army as one great proof of the will of the nation, and those of us who remember can testify that in America, as in England, the will of the people was ahead of the decision of the politicians. On one point, Chesterton's articles have a special interest, the question of reprisals. When the Germans broke yet another of the promises of the Hague Convention and initiated the use of poison gas, there was much discussion as to the ethics of reprisals, and G.K. used against reprisals two arguments, one of which was a rare example of a fallacy in his arguments. If a wasp stings you, he said, do not sting back. No, we might reply, but you squash it. You have as a man an advantage over a wasp, and so do not need to use its own weapons to defeat it. His other argument is far more powerful and is indeed overwhelming. If you use, even as reprisals, unlawful weapons, it is harder to prove you did not initiate them. And I remember well another feeling at the time expressed by G.K., which was, I believe, that of the majority of the English people, if we use these things, if we accept the Prussian gospel of frightfulness, then spiritually we have lost the war. Spiritually, Prussia had conquered, as she has engulfed the old Germanies, and first imposing her rule, then gained acceptance of her ideas. So it may be with us. Ideas are everything, and the barbarians destroy more with ideas than even by material weapons, horrible as these may be. Inclined at first to hope for the fruits of democracy from the Russian Revolution, Chesterton was soon being reproached by H.G. Wells for dirty suspiciousness about the Bolshevik leaders and their motives. But the collapse of Russia and the defeat of Romania alike only strengthened the necessity of the fight to a finish with Prussia that became, as the months passed, the absorbing aim of the new witness. In the treaties, respectively, Brest-Litovsk and Bucharest, Germany, imposed upon these two countries incredibly harsh terms. Thus, wrote the new witness after the Treaty of Bucharest. We should like to ask the pacifists and semi-pacifists who are fond of official documents if they have read the white paper dealing with the plain facts about the peace with Romania. If they have a single word to say on the subject, we should be much interested to hear what it is. It makes absolutely plain two facts, both of which have a sort of frightful humor after all. The humanitarian talk about no annexations and no indemnities. The first is that the conquerors have annexed in a direct and personal sense beyond what is commonly meant by annexation. The second is they have indemnified themselves by an immediate coercion and extortion, which is generally veiled by the forms of a recognized indemnity. In annexing some 9,000 square miles, they have been particular to attach whole forests to the hunting grounds of the Hungarian nobles and the timber of Hungarian wood merchants, not merely annexing as a conqueror annexes, but rather stealing as an individual steals. Further, the fun growing fast and furious, they have taken country containing 130,000 Romanians merely because it is uninhabited land. For the second point, we often speak figuratively of tyrants enslaving a country, but Teutons do literally enslave. All the males of the occupied land, which happen to be two-thirds of Romania, are driven to work on pain of death or prison. All this is clear and satisfactory enough, but white paper keeps the best for the last. It is this sentence we would commend to our peaceful friends. 
The German delegates informed the Romanian delegates, who were appalled at being required to accept such conditions, that they would appreciate their moderation when they knew those which would be imposed on the Western powers after the victory of the Central Empires. A reminder was needed. Far less than most people was Chesterton subject to the weakness of the human spirit that brings weariness and sustained effort and premature relaxation. Russia had not, he said, shown any evidence of repentance, merely of regret for lack of success. The Kaiser said he had not wanted this war. No, said Chesterton, he wanted a different war. Chesterton might, and did say later, that he himself had wanted a very different peace. The destruction of Prussia, the reconstruction of the old German states, but at present he wanted only to fight on until this became possible. I do not think he ever hated anybody, but he did hate Prussianism as the wickedness that hindered loving, and he had no liking for the patronizing pacifism of the gentleman, it was Romain Roland, who took a holiday in the Alps and said he was above the struggle as if there were any alp from which the soul could look down on Calvary. There is indeed one mountain among them that might be very appropriate to so detached an observer, the mountain named after Pilate, the man who washed his hands. Uses of Diversity, page 40, Mountain Library. His keen imagination could visualize the sufferings caused by war. Vicariously, he knew something of the life of the trenches, for Cecil, like many another seaman, had managed to get to France. A delightful article on comradeship shows what letters from soldiers confirm, how perfectly at home was Private Chesterton among his fellows, and how much loved by them. English soldiers are classed A, B, or C according to their degree of physical fitness, and Cecil was in class C. I can understand a pagan, but not a Christian, who simply dismisses the suffering of our soldiers as useless. He is like Dr. Hyde, scorning Father Damien, or like those who cried at the foot of the cross. He saved others, himself he cannot save. They saved others, these men, their suffering was that of the human race whose head is Christ. With him they bore, even if they knew it not, that mysterious burden of humanity that makes some men question God's existence, but draws others into conscious membership of his physical body. Many were so drawn in those days and there seemed a new lifting up of the cross. The new witness does, I think, lack one note a little. They were too busy hating Prussianism to give thought to the Christian command to love Prussians, whose sufferings, too, were those of humanity. Into the opposite error, there was no risk that they would fall. Never for them would heroism be belittled in the name of the very horrors it was encountering. In one article, Bellock touched on this strange perversion and reminded his readers that the power to ravage and destroy was not really a new result of modern machinery. Attila and his Huns had inflicted even greater devastation and had left a desert behind them. Barbarism in its nature was destructive, and we were encountering barbarism. In so doing, we were acting the part of Christian men. But the old fight still had to be waged on the home front against the money power, and against what the new witness called Prussianism at home. Unceasingly, they battled for fair treatment for soldiers' wives and children, for freedom from unmeaning and unnecessary regulations, against the profiteering by big firms and the consequent crushing of small. About 2,000 small butcher shops, for instance, had to close at the very beginning of the war, owing to a cornering of supplies by the large firms. Against this, and all the ramifications of the meat scandal, the new witness struggled, publishing, they claimed, facts unpublished elsewhere and inspiring questions in the House of Commons. Bellock's irony, Chesterton's wit, point these articles and make them worth reading as literature, and there is some of the old fooling. A further series on the servile state is attacked by Shaw, who thinks that Bellock, since he is not a socialist, must be a follower of Herbert Spencer. G.K. accounts for this by saying that Shaw had not read Bellock. How do you know, retorts Shaw. It is not Herbert Spencer I have not read. Suppose you had your choice of not reading a book by Bellock and not reading one by Spencer. Which would you choose? Hang it all, be reasonable. The economic front was never abandoned and the paper continued to attack all forms of socialism, including the recreation of Bumble by Mrs. Sidney Webb 
with all the regimentation of the poor for their own good that Bumble represented. The inner secrets of the Fabian office are unfolded by Shaw in a letter to Gilbert dated August 6, 1917. My dear GKC, if you want to expose a scandalous orgy in the new witness, you may depend on the following as being a correct account by an eyewitness. You know that there is a body called the Fabian Research Department, of which I have the hollow honor to be perpetual grand, the real moving spirit being Mrs. Sidney Webb. A large number of innocent young men and women are attracted to this body by promises of employment by the said Mrs. S.W. in works of unlimited and inspiring uplift, such as are unceasingly denounced, along with Marconi and other matters in your well-written organ. Well, Mrs. Sidney Webb summoned all these young things to an uplifting at home at the Fabian office lately. They came in crowds and sat at her feet while she prophesied unto them, with occasional comic relief from the unfortunate perpetual grand. At the decent hour of 10 o'clock, she bade them good night and withdrew to her own residence and to bed. For some accidental reason or other, I lingered until, as I thought, all the young things had gone home. I should explain that I was in the two pair back. At last, I started to go home myself. As I descended the stairs, I was stunned by the most infernal din I have ever heard, even at the front, coming from the Fabian Hall, which would otherwise be the backyard. On rushing to this temple, I found the young enthusiasts sprawling over tables, over radiators, over everything except chairs in a state of scandalous abandonment, roaring at the tops of their voices in a quite unintelligible manner, a string of presumably obscene songs accompanied on the piano with frantic gestures and astonishing musical skill by a man whom I had always regarded as a respectable Fabian researcher, but who now turned out to be a demon pianist out heralding my secretary puts in two R's and explains that she's thinking of Herod's Spangali. A horribly sacrilegious character was given to the proceedings by the fact that the tune that they were singing when I entered was Luther's hymn, Eine Feste Burg ist unser Gott. As they went on, for I regret to say that my presence exercised no restraint whatever, they sang their extraordinary and incomprehensible litany to every tune, however august its associations which happen to fit it. These, if you please, are the Solomon sour neophytes, whose puritanical influence has kept you in dread for so many years, but I have not told you the worst. Before I fled from the building, I did at last discover what words it was they were singing. When it first flashed on me, I really could not believe it. At the end of the next verse, no doubt or error was possible. The young Maynard next to me was concluding every strop by shrieking that she didn't care where the water went if it didn't get into the wine. Now you know. I've since ascertained that the breviary of this black mask can be obtained at the Fabian office with notes of the numbers of the hymns, ancient and modern, and all the airs sacred and profane to which your poems have been set. This letter needs no answer, indeed admits of none. I leave you to your reflections. Ever GBS. The Shaw Worm Turns on Wells was a headline in the New Witness over a vigorous and lighthearted attack. The others were apt to score off Wells in these exchanges because he lost lightheartedness and became irritable. Even with Gilbert, he sometimes broke out, although in a calmer moment he told Shaw that to get angry with Chesterton was an impossibility. With Cecil Chesterton, it was only too easy to get angry, at any rate, and he appeared in The New Witness. But I think when he heard Cecil was in France, Wells must have regretted one of the letters he wrote to Gilbert, just before the change of editorship. It was curious, the contrast between the genial personality so loved by his friends and the waspishness so often shown by Cecil and his staff in the columns of the paper. His extraordinary personality, writes E.S.P. Haynes, wonderfully penetrated the eccentricity of his appearance. His features were slightly fantastic and his voice was as loudly discordant as his laughter. But the real charm and generosity of his character were so transparent that one never seemed to be conscious of the physical medium. Yet, with all my sympathy for many of the new witness ideas my nerves jangle when I read the volumes of Cecil's editorship, 
and I think jangled nerves explain if they do not excuse this outburst by Wells. My dear GKC, haven't I on the whole behaved decently to you? Haven't I always shown a reasonable civility to you and your brother and Bellic? Haven't I betrayed at times a certain affection for you? Very well, then you will understand that I don't start out to pick a needless quarrel with the New Witness crowd. But this business of the Hoofer book and the New Witness makes me sick. Some disgusting little greaser named uh, something has been allowed to insult old FMH in a series of letters that make me ashamed of my species. Huffer has many faults, no doubt, but firstly, he's poor. Secondly, he's notoriously unhappy and in the most miserable position. Thirdly, he's a better writer than any of your little crowd. And fourthly, instead of pleading his age and his fat and taking refuge from service in a greasy obesity as your brother has done, he is serving his country. His book is a great book. And your writer just lies about it. I guess he's a dirty-minded priest or some such unclean thing when he says it is the story of a stallion and so forth. The whole outbreak is so envious, so base, so cat in the gutter spitting at the passerby that I will never let the new witness into the house again. Regretfully yours, H.G. Wells. Gilbert replied, 11 Warwick Gardens, Kensington West. My dear Wells, as you will see by the above address, I have been away from home and must apologize for delay. I am returning almost at once, however. Most certainly, you have always been a good friend to me, and I have always tried to express my pride in the fact. I know enough of your good qualities in other ways to put down everything in your last letter to an emotion of loyalty to another friend. Any quarrel between us will not come from me, and I confess I am puzzled as to why it should come from you, merely because somebody else who is not I, dislikes a book by somebody else who is not you, and says so in an article for which neither of us is even remotely responsible. I often disagree with criticisms of the writer. I do not know anything about the book or the circumstances of Puffer. I cannot help being entertained by your vision of the writer, who is not a priest, but a poor journalist, and I believe a free thinker. But whoever he may be, and I hardly think the problem worth a row between you and me, he has the right to justice. And you must surely see that even if it were my paper, I could not either tell a man to find a book good when he found it bad, or sack him for a point of taste which has nothing in the world to do with the principles of the paper. For the rest, Haynes represents the new witness much more than a reviewer does being both on the board and the staff, and he has put your view in the paper. I cannot help thinking with a more convincing logic. Don't you sometimes find it convenient, even in my case, that your friends are less touchy than you are? By all means, drop any paper you dislike, though if you do it for every book review you think unfair, I fear your admirable range of modern knowledge will be narrowed. Of the paper in question, I will merely say this. My brother, and in some degree the few who have worked with him, have undertaken a task of public criticism for the sake of which they stand in permanent danger of imprisonment and personal ruin. We are incessantly reminded of this danger, and no one has ever dared to suggest that we have any motive but the best. If you should ever think it right to undertake such a venture, you will find that the number of those who will commit their journalistic fortunes to it is singularly small and includes some who have more courage and honesty than acquaintance with the hierarchy of art. It is even likely that you will come to think the latter less important. Yours, Sans Raccoon, G.K. Chesterton. P.S. On rereading your letter in order to be fair as I am trying to be, I observe you specially mention letters. You will see, of course, that this does not make any difference. To stop letters would be to stop Haynes' letter and others on your side, and these could not be printed without permitting a rejoinder. I post this from Beaconsfield, where anything further will find me. It ended as all quarrels did that anyone started with Gilbert. Dear GKC, Also, I can't quarrel with you, but the hoofer business aroused my long dormant moral indignation, and I let it fly at the most sensitive part of the new witness constellation, the only part about whose soul I care. 
I hate these attacks are rather miserable, exceptional people like Huffer and Masterman. I know these aren't perfect men, but their defects make quite sufficient hells for them without these public peltings. I suppose I ought to have written to CC instead of you. One of these days I will go and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with him, only I always get so amiable when I meet a man, he, CC, needs it, I mean the talking to. Yours ever, HG. Through the war's progress, Wells appeared to Chesterton to be expressing a powerful and individual genius, not his own considered views, but the reactions of public opinion. As Mr. Brittling, he saw the war through and even called it a war and war. As Mr. Clissold, he asked of what use it had all been. Chesterton speaks of him as a rather unstable genius, and the genius and instability alike can be seen in his meteor appearances in The New Witness and in his books. Several of these he sent to Gilbert, who wrote September 12, 1917. I've been trying for a long time, though perpetually balked with business and journalism, to write and thank you for sending me, in so generous a manner, your ever-interesting and delightful books, especially as divisions touching the things we care most about. Drive me, every time I review them, to deal more in controversy and less in compliment than I intend. The truth and the trouble is that both of us are only too conscious that there is a great war going on all the time on the purely mental plane. And I cannot help thinking your view is often a heresy. And I know only too well that when you lead it, it is likely to be a large heresy. I fear that being didactic means being disproportionate and that the temptation to attack something I think I can correct leads to missing, in my writing, not in my reading, a thousand fine things that I could never imitate. It is lucky for me that you are not very often a book reviewer when I bring out my own shapeless and amateurish books. In the autobiography, G.K. calls Wells a sportive but spiritual child of Huxley. He delighted in his wit and his swiftness of mind, but he summarized in the same book the quality which runs through all his work. I've always thought that he reacted too swiftly to everything, possibly as a part of the swiftness of his natural genius. I've never ceased to admire and sympathize, but I think he has always been too much in a state of reaction. To use the name, which would probably annoy him most, I think he is a permanent reactionary. Whenever I met him, he seemed to be coming from somewhere rather than going anywhere. As he was so often nearly right, that his movements irritated me like the sight of somebody's hat being perpetually washed up by the sea and never touching the shore, but I think he thought that the object of opening the mind is simply opening the mind, whereas I am incurably convinced that the object of opening the mind, as of opening the mouth, is to shut it again on something solid. No change of mood in the public meant any change in the new witness group. In a powerful article in reply to an old friend who asked for peace because the war was destroying freedom, Bellick told him that freedom had gone long since for the mass of Englishmen. How many, wrote G.K., pacifists or semi-pacifists resisted the detailed destruction of all liberty for the populace before the war? It is a bitter choice between freedom and patriotism, but how many fought for freedom before it gave them the chance of fighting against patriotism? from The New Witness, May 31st, 1917. Again and again they touched the spot on the question of trading with the enemy. In this, as in all their attacks, they made one point of enormous importance. Do not, they said, look for traitors and spies among waiters and small traders. Look up, not down. You will find them in high places if you dare to look. They dared. And here came in once more what was commonly regarded as a strange crank peculiar to the Chester Belloc, their outlook toward Jews. Usually, those who referred to it spoke of a religious prejudice. Again and again, the new witness, not always patiently, but with unvaryingly clarity, explained. They had no religious prejudice against Jews. They had not even a racial prejudice against Jews, though this, I think, was true only of some of the staff. Their only prejudice was against the pretense that a Jew was an Englishman, 
It was undeniable that there were, for example, Rothschilds in Paris, London and Berlin, all related in conducting an international family banking business. There were Der Langeins in London and Paris, pronounced in the French style, whose cousins were Air Langers, pronounced in the German style in Berlin. How, the new witness asked, could members of such families feel the same about the war as an Englishman? They could not, to put it at its lowest, have the same primary loyalty to England or to Germany either. Their primary loyalty must be, indeed it ought to be, to their own race and kindred. Yet this was surely an excessive simplification. We have only to remember that lately a son of the Der Lange host died gallantly as an English airman. We have only to remember the thousands of Jews who fought in our ranks in this war and the last. Very many Jews are patriotic for England and for America. Many were patriotic for Germany. This, no doubt, makes the problem more acute, for any discussion is nonsense that omits this certain fact. There are Jews patriotic first for the country they live in, a country that gave them home and citizenship, of which often their wives and mothers are descended. There are others who feel that Jewry is their patria. This was the fact the new witness could never forget. A Jew might not be specially pro-German in feeling, yet his actions might help Germany by being pro-Jewish. International Jewish trading was trading with the enemy, and was to a very large extent continuing in spite of assurances to the contrary. Moreover, international finance was getting nervous over the continuance of the war as a menace to its own future. It wanted peace, a peace that should still leave it in possession in this country and in Germany. Gilbert Chesterton was passionately determined to cast it out. He was a Zionist. He wished for the Jewish people the peaceful possession of a country of their own, but he demanded urgently that they should no longer be allowed to govern his country. Marconi still obsessed him, and the surrender of English politics to the money power seemed to him to represent as great a danger for the future as Prussianism. For a moment, the two dangers were the one danger, and against them was set the people of England. It was at this moment that Chesterton published his epic of the English people, which he called a history. Frank Swinnerton is told, as recounted in Georgian Scene, page 93, how this book came to be written. Chado and Windus, for whom Swinnerton worked, had asked G.K. to write a history of England. He refused on the ground that he was no historian. Later, he signed a contract with the same publishers for a book of essays, then discovered that he was already under contract to give this book to another firm. He asked Chateau and Windus to cancel their contract and offered to write something else for them. Swinterton's account continues. The publishers, concealing jubilation, sternly recalled their original proposal for a short history of England. Shrieks and groans were distinctly heard all the way from Beaconsfield, but the promise was kept. The short history of England was what Chesterton must have called a wild and awful success. It probably has been the most generally read of all of his books, but while the credit for it is his, he must not be blamed for impudence in essaying history, when the inspiration arose in another's head, not mine, and when in fact no man ever went to the writing of a literary work with less confidence. You can find no dates in this history and a minimum of facts, but you can find vision. The history professors at London University said to Lawrence Solomon that it was full of inaccuracies, yet he's got something we hadn't got. G.K. might well have borrowed from Newman and called it an essay in aid of a history of England. He showed something of the great moral change which turned the Roman Empire into Christendom, by which each great thing to which it afterwards gave birth was baptized into a promise or at least into a hope of permanence. It may be that each of its ideas was, as it were, mixed with immortality. The English people had been free and happy as part of this great thing, cultivating their own land, establishing by their guilds a social scheme based upon pity and a craving for equality, building cathedrals and worshipping God, and with the Holy Land much nearer to a plain man's house than Westminster and immeasurably nearer than Runnymede. All life was made lovely by this prodigious presence of a religious transfiguration in common life and only began to darken with the successful rebellion of the rich under Henry VIII. Probably too big a proportion is given by Chesterton to the great crime that overshadowed for him the rest of English history. Yet he does justice in brilliant phrasing to the 18th century Whigs, 
still more to Chatham and Burke and to Dr. Johnson, whom he so loved and to whom he was often compared. But supremely, he loved Nelson, who dies with his stars on his bosom and his heart upon his sleeve. For Nelson was the type and chief exemplar of the ordinary Englishman. The very hour of his death, the very name of his ship, are touched with that epic completeness which critics call the long arm of coincidence and profits the hand of God. His very faults and failures were heroic, not in a loose but in a classic sense, in that he fell only like the legendary heroes, weakened by a woman, not foiled by a foe among men. And it remains the incarnation of a spirit in the English that is purely poetic, so poetic that it fancies itself a thousand things, and sometimes even fancies itself prosaic. At a recent date, in an age of reason, in a country already calling itself dull and businesslike, with top hats and factory chimneys already beginning to arise like towers of funereal efficiency, this country's clergyman's son moved to the last in a luminous cloud and acted a fairy tale. He shall remain as a lesson to those who do not understand England, and a mystery to those who think they do. In outward action, he led his ships to victory and died upon a foreign sea. But symbolically, he established something indescribable and intimate, something that sounds like a native proverb. He was the man who burnt his ships and who forever set the Thames on fire. The Ballad of the White Horse had been a poem about English legends and origins. The history, too, was called a poem by the reviewers. And it was. It was a poem about Falstaff and Sam Weller and even the artful Dodger who in so many British colonies had turned into Robinson Crusoe. His rulers had tried to educate him. They had tried to Germanize him and to teach him to embrace a Saxon because he was the other half of an Anglo-Saxon. All English culture had been based for a century and more on ardent admiration for German culture. And then the day came and the ignorant fellow found he had other things to learn. And he was quicker than his educated countrymen, for he had nothing to unlearn. He, in whose honor, had all been said and sung, stirred and stepped across the border of Belgium. Then were spread out before men's eyes all the beauties of his culture and all the benefits of his organization. Then we beheld under a lifting daybreak what light we had followed and after what image we had labored to refashion ourselves. Nor in any story of mankind has the irony of God chosen the foolish things so catastrophically to confound the wise. For the common crowd of poor and ignorant Englishmen, because they only knew that they were Englishmen, burst through the filthy cobwebs of 400 years and stood where their fathers stood when they knew that they were Christian men. The English poor, broken in every revolt, bullied by every fashion, long despoiled of poverty and now being despoiled of liberty, entered history with a noise of trumpets and turned themselves in two years into one of the iron armies of the world. And when the critic of politics and literature, feeling that this war is, after all, heroic, looks around him to find the hero, he can point to nothing but a mob. Chapter 22 after the armistice. The months that followed the signing of the armistice were the darkest in Gilbert Chesterton's life. Nothing but the immense natural high spirits of the new witness group could have carried him through the many years in which he cried their unheeded warnings to England. But now as the war drew to an end, a new note of optimism had become audible. The Prussian menace was almost conquered. Our soldiers would return and would bring with them the courage and confidence of victors. They might overthrow the governing plutocracy and build again an England of freedom and sanity. But one soldier did not return, the one to whom this group looked for comradeship and inspiration. On December 6, 1918, Cecil Chesterton died in hospital in France. His courage was heroic, native, positive and equal, wrote Belloc, always at the highest potentiality of courage. Gilbert wrote, we lived long enough to march to the victory which was for him a supreme vision of liberty and the light. The work which he put first, he did before he died. The work which he put second, but very near to the other, he left for us to do. 
there are many of us who will abandon many other things and recognize no greater duty than to do it. This second work was the fight at home against corruption and for freedom for the English people. It was impossible to remember Gilbert Chesterton vividly and to write the word bitterness. It was rather with a profound and burning indignation that he thought of his fellow Englishmen who had fought and died, and then looked up and saw Marconi George and Marconi Isaacs still rulers of the fate of his country. Thus meditating, he wrote an elegy in a country churchyard. The men that work for England, they have their graves at home, and bees and birds of England about the cross can roam. But they that fought for England, following a falling star, alas, alas for England, they have their graves afar. And they that rule in England, in stately conclave met, alas, alas for England, they have no graves as yet. From the Collected Poems, page 65. Strange irony of Cecil Chesterton's last weeks. His old enemy, Godfrey Isaacs, brought an action for perjury against Sir Charles Hobhouse. Both men's counsel agreed, and the judge stressed that perjury lay on one side or the other. The case was given against Isaacs. He appealed, and his appeal was dismissed. Perjury had lain on one side or the other. Meanwhile, news came that Rufus Isaacs, now Lord Redney, had gone with Lloyd George to Paris to attend the peace conference. All that this might mean, the peril to Poland, the danger of a Prussia kept at the head of the Germanies for the sake of international finance, an abasement of England before those countries that had not forgotten Marconi, all this was vivid to Gilbert Chesterton. In the same number of The New Witness, in which he mourned his brother, December 13, 1918, he wrote, under the sign of the world's end, an open letter to Lord Reddy. My Lord, I address to you a public letter, as it is upon a public question. It is unlikely that I should ever trouble you with any private letter or any private question, and least of all on the private question that now fills my mind. It would be impossible altogether to ignore the irony that has in the last few days brought to an end the great Marconi duel in which you and I, in some sense, played the part of seconds. That personal part of the matter ended when Cecil Chesterton found death in the trenches to which he had freely gone, and Godfrey Isaacs found dismissal in those very courts to which he once successfully appealed. But believe me, I do not write on any personal matter, nor do I write strangely enough, perhaps, with any personal acrimony. On the contrary, there is something in these tragedies that almost unnaturally clarifies and enlarges the mind. And I think I write partly because I may never feel so magnanimous again. It would be irrational to ask you for sympathy, but I am sincerely moved to offer it. You are far more unhappy, for your brother is still alive. I would turn my mind to you and your type of politics. It is not wholly and solely through that trick of abstraction by which in moments of sorrow a man finds himself staring at a blot on the tablecloth or an insect on the ground. I do, of course, realize, with that sort of dull clarity, that you are in practice a blot on the English landscape, and that the political men who made you are the creeping things of the earth. But I am, in all sincerity, less in a mood to mock at the sham virtues they parade than to try to imagine the more real virtues which they successfully conceal. In your own case, there is the less difficulty, at least in one matter. I am very willing to believe that it was the mutual dependence of the members of your family that has necessitated the sacrifice of the dignity and independence of my country. And that if it be decreed that the English nation is to lose its public honor, it will be partly because certain men of the tribe of Isaacs kept their own strange private loyalty. I am willing to count this to you for a virtue as your own code may interpret virtue. But the fact would alone be enough to make me protest against any man professing your code and administering our law. And it is upon this point of your public position, and not upon any private feelings, that I address you today. Not only is there no question of disliking any race, but there is not here even a question of disliking any individual. It does not raise the question of hating you. Rather, it would raise, in some strange fashion, the question of loving you. Has it ever occurred to you how much a good citizen would have to love you in order to tolerate you? Have you ever considered how warm, indeed how wild, 
must be our affection for the particular stray stockbroker who has somehow turned into a Lord Chief Justice to be strong enough to make us accept him as Lord Chief Justice. It is not a question of how much we dislike you, but of how much we like you, or whether we like you more than England, more than Europe, more than Poland, the pillar of Europe, more than honor, more than freedom, more than facts. It is not, in short, a question of how much we dislike you, but of how far we can be expected to adore you, to die for you, to decay and degenerate for you, for your sake to be despised, for your sake to be despicable. Have you ever considered in a moment of meditation how curiously valuable you would really have to be that Englishmen should in comparison be careless of all the things you have corrupted and indifferent to all the things that you may yet destroy? Are we to lose the war which we have already won? That and nothing else is involved in losing the full satisfaction of the national claim of Poland. Is there any man who doubts that the Jewish international is unsympathetic with that full national demand? And is there any man who doubts that you will be sympathetic with the Jewish international? No man who knows anything of the interior facts of modern Europe has the faintest doubt on either point. No man doubts when he knows whether or no he cares. Do you seriously imagine that those who know, that those who care, are so idolatrously infatuated with Rufus Daniel Isaacs as to tolerate such risk, let alone such ruin. Are we to set up as the standing representative of England a man who is a standing joke against England? That nothing else is involved in setting up the chief Marconi minister as our chief foreign minister. It is precisely in those foreign countries with which such a minister would have to deal that his name would be, and has been, a sort of pantomime proverb like Panama or the South Sea Bubble. Foreigners were not threatened with fine and imprisonment for calling a spade a spade, and a speculation a speculation. Foreigners were not punished with the perfectly lawless law of libel for saying about public men what those very men had afterwards to admit in public. Foreigners were lookers-on who were really allowed to see most of the game. When our public saw nothing of the game, and they made not a little game of it, are they henceforth to make game of everything that is said and done in the name of England in the affairs of Europe? Have you the serious impudence to call us anti-Semites because we are not so extravagantly fond of one particular Jew as to endure this for him alone? No, my lord, the beauties of your character shall not blind us to all elements of reason and self-preservation. We can still control our affections. If we are fond of you, we are not quite so fond of you as that. If we are anything but anti-Semite, we are not pro-Semite in that particular impersonal fashion. If we are lovers, we will not kill ourselves for love. After weighing and valuing all your virtues, the qualities of our own country take their due and proportional part in our esteem. Because of you, she shall not die. We cannot tell in what fashion you yourself feel your strange position and how much you know it is a false position. I have sometimes thought I saw in the faces of such men as you that you felt the whole experience as unreal, a mere masquerade, as I myself might feel it if, by some fantastic luck in the old fantastic civilization of China, I were raised from the yellow button to the coral button or from the coral button to the peacock's feather. Precisely because these things would be grotesque, I might hardly feel them as incongruous. Precisely because they meant nothing to me, I might be satisfied with them. I might enjoy them without any shame at my own impudence. Precisely because I could not feel them as dignified, I should not know what I had degraded. My fancy may be quite wrong, but it is but one of the many attempts I've made to imagine and allow for an alien psychology in this matter. And if you, and Jews far worthier than you, are wise, they will not dismiss as anti-Semitism what may well prove the last serious attempt to sympathize with Semitism. I allow for your position more than most men allow for it, more, most assuredly, than most men will allow for it in the darker days that yet may come. It is utterly false to suggest that either I, or a better man than I, whose work I now inherit, desired this disaster for you and yours. I wish you no such ghastly retribution. Daniel, son of Isaac, go in peace, but go.
Yours, G.K. Chesterton. In those last sentences, the spirit of prophecy was upon Chesterton after a truly dark and deep fashion. Yet even he did not guess that the retribution he feared would fall not upon the tribe of Isaacs, thus established in English government, but upon the unfortunate Jewish people as a whole, from the German nation that Isaacs had gone to Paris to protect. For there was no doubt in Chesterton's mind that it was his work at the peace conference to strive for the survival of Prussia, no matter how Europe and the rest of the Germany suffered. The new witness hated the Treaty of Versailles in its eventual form as much as Hitler hates it, but for a very different reason. All human judgments are limited, and no doubt there was a mixture of truth and error in Chesterton's view of the years that followed. But in the universal reaction from the war spirit to pacifism, the truths he was urging received scant attention. His early amazing prophecies fell on deaf ears. He will almost certainly, Monsignor Knox has said, be remembered as a prophet in an age of false prophets. And it is not insignificant that today it has become the fashion to say, as he said 25 years ago and steadily reiterated, that the peace of 1918 was only an armistice. Monsignor Knox in the Panegyric preached in Westminster Cathedral June 27, 1936. Just before leaving England for the front, Cecil had married Miss Ada Jones, who had long worked with him on the paper and who continued to write both for it and later for GK's Weekly, doing especially the dramatic criticism under the pen name J.K. Prothero. Later on, she was to become famous for her exploit in spending a fortnight investigating, in the guise of a tramp, the London of down-and-out women. She wrote in the darkest London and founded the Cecil Houses to improve the very bad conditions she had discovered and in memory of her husband. At this date, Mrs. Cecil Chesterton visited Poland and wrote a series of articles describing the Polish struggle for life and freedom. Several Poles also contributed articles to the paper. There was not, I imagine, on the staff one single writer with the kind of ignorance that enabled Lloyd George to confess in Paris that he did not know where Heshkin was. Here was the first tragedy of Versailles. The representatives of both America and England were ignorant of the reality of Europe. Wilson was, as Chesterton often said, a much better man than Lloyd George, but he knew as little of the world which he had come to reconstruct. He was, too, a political doctrinaire, preferring what was not there in the shape of the League of Nations to the real nations of Poland or Italy. And with the American, as with the Welshman, international finance stood beside the politicians and whispered in their ears. An interesting article appeared in The New Witness by an American who said that no leading journal in his own country would print it any more than any English one. He described the opposition of masses of ordinary Americans to the League of Nations and how a Chicago banker, who, however, had no international interests, had hardly agreed with this opposition. But the same banker had written to him next day, eating his own words. In the interim, he had met the other bankers. This American correspondent held with the new witness that the League of Nations was mainly a device of international finance so framed as to enlist also the support of pacifist idealists who really believed it would make for peace. Only one thing, said the new witness, would make for a stable peace. Remove Prussia from her position at the head of Germany. Make her regaining of it impossible. Make a strong Poland and a strong Italy, as well as a strong France. Later on, they said they had disapproved of the weakening of Austria. But though I do not doubt that this is true in principle, I cannot find much mention of Austria in the paper. Poland, Italy, and Ireland fill their columns and the freeing of England. They claimed that theirs was in the main the policy of Clemenceau. But both Chesterton and Belloc admitted that Clemenceau, even if he desired a strong Poland as a barrier between Germany and Russia, shared with his colleagues an equal responsibility in the destruction of Austria, which proved so fatal. He was too much a Freemason to desire many Catholic states. The interests of France were not those of Italy, which certainly went to the wall and was turned thereby from friend and ally into enemy. And the new witness summed up the fate of Ireland in the suggestion that Lloyd George had said to Wilson, if you won't look at Ireland, I won't look at Mexico. Both Lloyd George and Wilson were too anti-Catholic to do other than dislike, in Lloyd George's case, hate is the word, Catholic Poland. 
It is certain that Lloyd George, in particular, worked savagely against the Poland that should have been. A commission appointed by the Peace Conference reported in favor of Poland owning the port of Danzig and territory approximating to her age-long historic boundaries, and in particular, including East Prussia, in which there was still a majority of Poles. Lloyd George sent back the report for revision. They made it again on the same lines. It was a strange anomaly that this man should have sat at the council table representing a great country. In the past, men had sat there who not only knew much of Europe themselves, but who had had as their advisors the Foreign Office with all its experience and tradition. Bellick pointed out in an article on Versailles that the English tradition had been to hold a balance between conflicting extremes and thus to bring about a peace that at least ensured stability for a long period. But here is a man too ignorant to realize the dangers of his own ignorance and therefore seek help from experience. This peace would be, Bellick foretold, the parent of many wars. The Czechs got much of what they wanted, just as Denunzio got Fiume for Italy by seizing it. Poland wanted for Versailles and enlisted her allies. Yet while the peace conference was actually in session, Germans were persecuting Poles in East Prussia so that many thousands of them fled into Poland proper and thus diminished the Polish population in East Prussia before any plebiscite could be taken there. Lloyd George and Churchill sent a British expeditionary force to Archangel to assist the White Russians, but when the Bolsheviks invaded Poland, she was not supported. Nor did the Allies send her the raw material they had promised to rebuild her commercial life. Again and again, our papers reported pogroms in Poland, yet investigation by writers for the new witness failed to discover any pogroms in the cities in which they were reported as occurring. Powerful are the words in which, in April 1919, Chesterton foretells the future that will result if power and her historic port are refused to Poland. We know that a flood threatens the West from the meeting of two streams, the revenge of Germany and the anarchy of Russia. And we know that the West has only one possible dike against such a flood, which is not the mere existence, but the might and majesty of Poland. We know that without some such Christian and chivalric shield on that side, we shall have half Europe and perhaps half Asia on our backs. We know exactly what the Germans think about our nationalities in the West and exactly what the Bolshevists think about any nationalities anywhere. We know that if the Poles have a port and a powerful line of communication with the West, they will be eager to help the West. We know that if they have no port, they will have no reason to help the West and no power to help anybody. We know that if they lose their port, it will not be by any act of English public opinion or any public opinion, but by the most secret of all secret diplomacy. That it will not even be given up by the English to the Germans, but by German Jews to other German Jews. We know that such international adventurers would still find themselves floating on the top of any tide that drowned the nations, and that they do not care what nations they drown. We know that out of the whole world, the Polish port is the one place that should have been held, and the one place that is being surrendered. In short, we know what everybody knows and scarcely anybody says. There is one word to be added for those detached persons who see no particular objection to England ceasing to be English, who do not care about the national names of the West, which have been the greatest words in the poetry of the world. So far as we know, there is only one ideal they do care about, and they will not get it. Whatever else this betrayal means, it does not mean peace. The Poles have raised revolution after revolution when three colossal empires prevented them from being a nation at all. It is not in the realm of sanity to suppose that, if we make them half a nation, they will not someday attempt to be a whole nation. But we shall come back to the place where we started. After another cycle of terror and torment, an abominable butchery into a place where we might in peace and perfect safety stand firm today. Not by any act of English public opinion would Poland be weakened. Not by any act of English opinion, Prussia strengthened or Ireland depressed. It was the horror of the situation that no act of English public opinion seemed possible, for the organs of action were stultified. When they could act by fighting and by dying, Englishmen had done it grandly. Not all that they had done had, Chesterton believed, been lost. Because of them, the cross once more had replaced the crescent over the holy city of Jerusalem. 
Because of them, Alsace and Lorraine were French once more and Poland lived again. But their sufferings and their death had not availed them yet to save England. And what is theirs? Though banners blow on Warsaw risen again, or ancient laughter walks in gold through the vineyards of Lorraine, their dead are marked on English stones, their loves on English trees. How little is the prize they win, how mean a coin for these. How small a shriveled laurel leaf lies, crumpled here and curled. They died to save their country, and they only saved the world. From Reflected Poems, pages 79 to 80, The English Graves. In The New Witness, he wrote, July 25, 1919, On peace day, I set up outside my house two torches and twined them with a laurel because I thought at least there was nothing pacifist about laurel. But that night, after the bonfire and the fireworks had faded, a wind grew and blew with gathering violence, blowing away the rain. And in the morning, I found one of the laurel posts torn off and lying at random on the rainy ground, while the others still stood erect, green and glittering in the sun. I thought that the pagans would certainly have called it an omen, and it was one that strangely fitted my own sense of some great work, half fulfilled and half frustrated. And I thought vaguely of that man in Virgil, who prayed that he might slay his foe and return to his country. And the gods heard half the prayer, and the other half was scattered to the winds. For I knew we were right to rejoice, since the tyrant was indeed slain and his tyranny fallen forever. But I know not when we shall find our way back to our own land. English soldiers in Ireland felt, as we all remember, a strong sympathy with the Irish people. Most of them, said the new witness, became Sinn Feiners. This was an exaggeration, but certainly their opposition to acting as terrorists led to the employment in their stead of the jailbirds known as Black and Tans. And in England itself, the feeling was stirring that grew stronger as the years passed. The soldiers, who were the nation, had won the victory. The politicians had thrown it away. A rushed election before most of the men were demobilized had brought back the same old politicians by turning, so G.K. put it, collusion into coalition. The coalition government had been in wartime comprehensible and defensible, precisely because it is not concerned with construction or reconstruction, but only with the warding off of destruction. A peacetime coalition could do nothing but show up the absurdity of the old party labels, for if these meant anything, they meant that their wearers wanted an entirely different kind of construction, at which therefore they could not collaborate. How could a real Tory cooperate in construction with a genuine radical? It was the culmination of unreality. The idea that it succeeded, for the moment, because the country really believed that Lloyd George had won the war, seemed to Chesterton the crowning absurdity. It succeeded because the party machines combined to finance their candidates and offered them to a rather dazed country whose men were still in great numbers under arms. There's naturally no dissentient when hardly anybody seems to be sentient. Indifference is called unanimity. How then could this indifference be thrown off? How could the returning manhood of the nation be given a true democracy? Was there still hope? If there was, never had the new witness been more needed than now. It had told the truth about political corruption. Today, it had to fight it. We are not divided now into those who know and those who do not know. We are divided now into those who care and those who do not care. Thus wrote Chesterton in an article about his own continued editorship of the paper. Politics would never have been my province, either in the highest or the lowest sense. I have hitherto known myself to be merely a stopgap. But my action, or rather inaction, as a stopgap has come terribly to an end. That gap will never be filled now till God restores all the noble ruin that we name the world. And the wisest know best that the gap will yawn as hopelessly in the history of England as in the story of our private lives. I must now either accept this duty entirely or abandon it entirely. I will not abandon it. For every instinct and nerve of intelligence I have tells me that this is a time when it must not be abandoned. I must accept a comparison that must be a contrast, and a crushing contrast. But though I can never be so good as my brother, I will see if I can be better than myself. The same attacks on financiers and others constantly reiterated might well have put Gilbert in the dock where his brother had stood. But I think the upshot of the case against Cecil had not been entirely encouraging to the winners. Then too, GK's immense popularity made such an attack 
a still more doubtful move. Cecil had been less well known than Gilbert, but far better known than a Mr. Fraser and a Mr. Beamish, a pair of cranks against whom Sir Alfred Mon brought a libel action in 1919 for having, in a placard shown in a window in a back street, called him a traitor and accused him of having traded with the enemy. In this case, Sir Alfred Mon, of the Mon Nickel Company, giving evidence, said that he always disregarded charges made by irresponsible persons. Charges had been made against him in The New Witness, which was edited by Mr. Gilbert Chesterton. All the world regarded Mr. Chesterton as irresponsible, but he was certainly amusing, and he, The Witness, had read most of his books. He had once procured with such difficulty a copy of the new witness, his lordship. Did Mr. Chesterton charge the witness with being a traitor? Mr. Smith, counsel for the defense. Yes, in the new witness. Irresponsible was not quite the mot juste. The unfortunate Fraser and Beamish were not of the metal to win that or any case in that or any court. There was a kind of solemn buffoonery in choosing these two as responsible opponents in preference to the irresponsible G.K. Chesterton. At any rate, damages of £5,000 were given against them, which gives some measure of the risk G.K. took in making exactly the same attacks. Gilbert had not so much natural buoyancy as Cecil. He got far less fun out of making these attacks. Still less had he the recklessness that made Cecil indifferent even to the charge of inaccuracy. That charge was in fact the only one that Gilbert feared. Writing to a contributor whose article he had held back in order to verify an accusation made in it, Gilbert remarked that he had no fear of a lawsuit when he was certain of his facts. He did not fear fine or imprisonment. He had one fear only. I am afraid of being answered. There was another thing he feared, hurting or distressing his friends. This was especially a danger for one, so many of whose friends were also his opponents in politics or religion, and who was now editing a paper of so controversial a character. With H.G. Wells, he had a real bond of affection, and an interesting correspondence with and about him illustrates all Gilbert's qualities, consideration for his subordinates, for his friendships, concern for the integrity of his paper, sense of responsibility to Cecil's memory. During an editorial absence, the assistant editor, Mr. Titterton, had accepted a series of articles called Big Little H.G. Wells from Edwin Pugh, which seemed to be turning into an attack on Wells instead of an appreciation. Chesterton wrote to Mr. Titterton and simultaneously to Wells himself. Dear Wells, the sudden demands of other duties, which I really could not see how to avoid, has prevented my attending to the new witness lately. And I have only just heard on the telephone that you have written a letter to the paper touching an unfortunate difference between you and Edwin Pugh. I don't yet know the contents of your letter, but of course, I have told my Lockham tenants that it is to be printed whatever it is, this week or next. I am really exceedingly distressed to have been out of the business at the time. But if you knew the circumstances, I think you would see the difficulty. And my editorial absence has not been a holiday. As it is, I agreed to the general idea of a study of your work by Pew. And I confess it never even crossed my mind that anybody would write such a thing except as a tribute to your genius and the intellectual interest of the subject. Nor can I believe it now. It may strike you as so ironical as to be incredible, but it is really one of those ironies that are also facts. I rather welcome the idea of a criticism in the paper which so often differs from you, from a modernist and collectivist standpoint more like your own. I should imagine Pew would agree with you more than I do, and not less. I will not prejudge the quarrel till I understand more of it, but I now write at once to tell you that I would not dream of tolerating anything meant to be a mere personal attack on you, even if I resign my post on this point, and I had already written to the office to say so. But I do not believe for a moment that Pew means any such thing. I regarded him as a strong Wellsian, and even more of an admirer than myself, though he might be so modern as to use a familiar and mixed method of portraiture, which is too modern for my tastes, but which many use besides he. For the moment, I suggest a possible misunderstanding, which he may well correct by a further explanation. I had said something myself in my weekly article, demurring to a possible undervaluing of you long before I heard of your own letter. Even when I am in closer touch with things, of course, many things appear in the paper 
with which I wholly disagree. But the notion of a mere campaign against you would always have seemed to me as abominable and absurd as it does now. I do not believe anyone can entertain it, and I certainly do not. I am perfectly willing to do you anything that can fairly be shown to be justice, whether it were an explanation or an apology or anything else. This is all I can say without your letter and Pew's side of the case, but I feel I should say this at once. Yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. P.S. I have arranged for your letter to appear in next week's number, but I may have more light on Pew's attitude by then. To Titterton, he wrote, I do hope this work will not turn into anything that looks like a mere attack on Wells, especially in the rather realistic and personal modern manner, which I am perhaps too Victorian myself to care very much about. I do not merely feel this because I have managed to keep Wells as a friend on the whole. I feel it much more, and I know you are a man to understand such sentiments, because I have a sort of sense of honor about him as an enemy, or at least a potential enemy. We are so certain to collide in controversial warfare that I have a horror of his thinking I would attack him with anything but fair controversial weapons. My feeling is so entirely consistent with a faith in Pew's motives, as well as an admiration for his talents, that I honestly believe I could explain this to him without offense. I am honestly in a very difficult position on the new witness, because it is physically impossible for me, really, to edit it, and also do enough outside work to be able to edit it unpaid, as well as having a little over to give it from time to time. What we should have done without the loyalty and capacity of you and a few others, I can't imagine. I cannot oversee everything that goes into the paper. I cannot resign without dropping, as you truly said, the work of a great man who is gone, and who, I feel, would wish me to continue it. It is like what Stevenson said about marriage and its duties. There is no refuge for you, not even suicide. But I should have to consider even resignation if I felt that the acceptance of Pew's generosity really gave him the right to print something that I really felt bound to disapprove. It may be that I am needlessly alarmed over a slip or two of the pen in vivid descriptions of a very odd character, and that Pew really admires his big little HG as much as I thought he did at the beginning of the business. If the general impression on the reader's mind is of the big wells and not the little wells, I think the doubt I mean would really be met. Somehow, the letter to Titterton got into the hands of a Mr. Hennessy, who, after Gilbert's death, sent it to Wells. Wells wrote, Thank you very much for that letter of GKC's. It is exactly like him. From first to last, he and I were very close friends, and never for a moment did I consider him responsible for Pew's pathetic and silly little outbreak. I never knew anyone so steadily true to form as GKC. Besides the cleansing of public life, two other things were seen as vital by the new witness. The restoration of well-distributed property and the restoration of liberty. Under the heading, Reconstruction of Property, Felix set out a series of proposals, highly practical and very far from what is usually called revolutionary, that savings, for instance, made on a small scale, should be helped by a very high rate of interest, and the purchase by small men of small parcels of land or businesses or houses should be freed from legal charges, while these should be made heavier for those who purchased on a large scale, thus encouraging small property and checking huge accumulation. He pointed out how vast sums could be found for such subsidies out of the money spent today on an education which the poor detested for their children and which most of the wealthy admitted to be an abject failure. Most of those, he noted, who oppose distributism do so on the ground that the proposals are unpractical or revolutionary, which generally means that they have not examined the proposals. His own were certainly practical and would by many be called reactionary, but he admitted one doubt. Besides the overwhelming difficulty of turning the current of modern socialism, the doubt whether Englishmen, from long disuse, had not lost the appetite for property. Chesterton's own line of approach to the double problem was also twofold. In a volume of essays published near the end of the war and called The Utopia of Usurers, he remarked that an anarchic figure, which the more timid Tories profess to fear, has already fallen upon us. We are ruled by ignorant people. The old aristocracy of England, in his view, had made many mistakes, but certain things they had understood very well. The modern governing class cannot face a fact or follow an argument or feel a tradition. But least of all can they, on any persuasion, read through a plain and partial book, English or foreign, 
that is not specially written to soothe their panic or to please their pride. There had been reality in the claim of the old aristocracy to understand matters not known to the people. They had read history. They were familiar with other languages and other lands. They had a great tradition of foreign diplomacy. Even the study of philosophy and theology, today confined to a handful of experts, was not alien to them. On all this had rested what right they had to govern. But today, they rule them by the smiling terror of an ancient secret. They smile and smile, but they have forgotten the secret. On the other hand, the ordinary workman had the advantage over his probably millionaire master by the necessity of knowing something. He must be able to use his tools. He must know enough arithmetic to know when prices have risen. The hard business of living taught him something. Give him a chance of more through property and liberty and see what he will build on that foundation. The war had already shown not only the courage of our men, but their contrivance. Their trench newspapers, songs and jests, their initiative as sailors and as airmen. At home, the same thing was happening. Allotments had sprung up everywhere and solved the problem of potato shortage. Men were doing for themselves a rough kind of building. The inclination to get away from the machine and do things oneself was on the increase. Armistice and the men's return were heralded by outdoor tea parties with ropes stretched across the streets for safety. The outburst of pageants was spontaneous and national. It's time to Chesterton for an army of amateurs, for England is perishing of the professionals. Vitality seemed to be flowing back into national life, but bureaucracy does not love vitality. Agitated town councils met and stopped the tea parties, fought against street markets through which allotment holders could sell their produce cheaply, but heavy rates on land reclaimed and buildings erected by hard work. Town families living in single rooms had secured plots on building estates and run up shacks for themselves and their families. They were forbidden to live in these dwellings, only intended as temporary, but far more healthy than living eight people to a room in a slum. The new witness suspected that the real objection in the eyes of councillors was a lowering of the value of neighboring plots for wealthier purchasers. Worst of all, the allotments were taken, fields sold for speculative building, land dug in public parks, taken away in the name of amenities. The little spark that could have been fanned into a flame was crushed out. An episode of a few years later best illustrates the spirit Chesterton was fighting. In 1926, a threat arose to the traffic monopoly from soldiers who put their war gratuities into the purchase of omnibuses which they drove themselves. The London General Omnibus Company decided to crush them and with the aid of the government commission succeeded. Chesterton's paper followed the struggle with passionate interest. Just as he believed that the small shop actually served the public better than the large, so too he believed that these owner drivers would serve it better than the combine. But if it could have been proved that the combine was more efficient, Gilbert would still have championed the independence. It was better for the community that men should take responsibility and initiative for themselves, even if the work could be done more efficiently by wage slaves. To his dismay, he found that the trade unions did not dream of applying this test, and that they were aligned against the pirates, as the independent owners were usually called. He had always been an ardent supporter of the trade unions. To him, it seemed they were trying to do the work of the ancient guilds under far more difficult conditions. But after the war, for the first time, a little note of doubt creeps into his voice when he is speaking of them. They were still vocal for the rights of labor, but they had begun to lay stress exclusively on the less important of those rights. Writing of the loss of the allotments, he suggested in one article that the trade unions might well use some part of their funds in purchasing land to be held in perpetuity by their members. But I doubt if he much expected that they would do so. Many trade unionists were working for the bus company and were more concerned about their conditions of work than about the handful of drivers who were their own masters. But the unions had begun to stress almost solely the question of hours and of wages to fight for good conditions, but no longer for control or ownership, to demand security, but to agree to abandon many of their rights in return. It was a chill fear, and for long he resisted it. But in these terrible years, it had begun to shake him. Were the people of England losing the appetite for freedom and for property? Were the trade unions, from lack of leadership and confusion of thought, beginning to accept the servile state? Recording by Carol Pelster. Chapter 32, Part 1. 
Rome via Jerusalem. Shortly after the war, Gilbert and Francis set out on their travels, going in 1919 to Palestine, home through Italy early in 1920, and starting out again the following year for a lecture tour in the United States. To his friendship with Maurice Baring, Gilbert owed their being able to make the first of these journeys, as well as much else. The picture entitled Conversation Piece of Chesterton, Belloc, and Baring is well known. Was it Chesterton himself who christened it Baring, Overbearing, and Past Baring? Many elements united the three in a close friendship, love of literature, love of Europe, and a common view of the philosophy of history and of life. Frances Chesterton often said that of all her husband's friends, she thought there was none he loved better than Maurice Baring. They often wrote ballads together, a French form which they, with Philimore and others, had repopularized in English. A telegram from Gilbert refusing a celebration runs like a refrain. Prince, Yorkshire holds me now. By Yorkshire hams I'm fed. I can't assist your row. I send ballads instead. These ballads urbane were a feature in the new witness, but many of those the three friends composed were strictly not for publication, but recited to friends behind closed doors. Gilbert's memory was useful. He knew all his own and the others. Once Belloc forgot the envoy to one of his own ballads, and Gilbert finished it for him. Even to Maurice Baring, G.K. wrote less often than he intended, and one apologetic ballad carries the refrain, I write no letters to the men I love. I have always fancied that Maurice Baring gave Gilbert the idea for his story, The Man Who Knew Too Much. First in the diplomatic service, then doing splendidly as an airman in the war, a member of the great banking family, related to most of the aristocracy, and intimate with most of the rest, he is like the hero of the book, in a sort of detachment, a slight irony about a world that he has not cared to conquer. Impossible for a mere acquaintance to say whether he views that world with all the disillusionment of Chesterton's hero. But anyhow, such a suggestion from life is never more than a hint for creative art. Another side is seen in the autobiography, in the stories of Maurice Baring plunging into the sea in evening dress on the occasion of his 50th birthday, and of the smashing by Gilbert of a wine glass that became, in retrospect, a priceless goblet which had stood by Charlemagne's great chair and served St. Peter at high mass and now inspired the refrain, I like the sound of breaking glass. A good deal of glass was broken by the stones of this group of men whose own house was made of tolerably strong materials. There is quite a bundle of Mr. Baring's letters to Gilbert, and, in spite of the apologetic ballade, a fair number of answers. Two of these last are written early in 1919, the second of which opens the question of the Jerusalem visit. May 23rd, 1919. My dear Maurice, I am the prince of unremembered towers destroyed before the birth of Babylon. I am also the writer of unremembered letters, and to a much greater extent the designer and imaginer of unwritten letters. And I cannot remember whether I ever acknowledged properly your communications about Claudel, especially your interesting remarks about the comparative coolness of Henri de Reynier about him. It struck me because I think it is part of something I have noticed myself. A curious and almost premature conservatism in the older generation of revolutionaries, particularly when they were pagan revolutionaries. Not that I suppose de Reynier is particularly old, or in the stock sense, a revolutionist. But I think you will know the break between the generations to which I refer. 
I remember having exactly the same experience the only time I ever talked to Swinburne. I had regarded and resisted him in my boyhood as a sort of antichrist in purple, like Nero holding his lyre. And I found him more like a very well-read Victorian old maid, almost entirely a laudator temporis acti, disposed to say that none of the young men would ever come up to Tennyson, which may be quite true for all I know. I fancy it has something to do with the very fact that their revolt was pagan, and being temporal was also temporary. When that particular fashion in caps of liberty has gone out, they have nothing to fall back on but the feeling which Swinburne himself puts into the mouth of the pagan on the day when Constantine issued the proclamation. But to me their new device is barren. The days are bare. Things long gone over suffice, and men forgotten that were. I only tell you all this because you might find it amusing to keep an eye on the new statesman as well as the new witness, where there is a small repetition of the same thing. Bernard Shaw has written an article which is supposed to be about his view of me and socialism, but which may be said more truly to be about his blindness to Hillary and his servile state. It is quite startling to me to find how wholly he misses Hillary's point, and how wildly he falls back on a sort of elderly impatience with our juvenile paradox and fantasticality. I shall answer him as abusively as my great personal liking for him will allow, and I think Hillary is going to do the same. So. If you ever see such papers, you might enjoy the fun. Yours always, G.K. Chesterton. Dear Maurice, thank you ever so much for your interesting letter. I think you are right every time about Goss and Claudel, or rather, about Claudel and Goss. For though I think Goss a very valuable old Victorian in his way, I do not think he is on the same scale as the things that have lately been happening in the world. And Claudel is one of them. He has happened like a great gun going off. And I think I saw a line of his on the subject of such a discharge of artillery in the war. It ran, And that which goes forth is France, terrible as the Holy Ghost. I doubt if Goss has ever seen that France even in a flash and a bang. I don't see how he could. Remember the religion in which he grew up. By his own very graphic account of it, a man is not entirely emancipated from such a very positive puritanism by anything so negative as agnosticism. Nothing but a religion can cast out a religion. Being so sensitive on behalf of Renan, is simply not understanding the great historical passions about a heresiarch. It means that famous intellectuals must not hate each other, because they all belong to the Saville Club. Please do not think I mean merely that Goss is a snob. I think he is a jolly old gentleman and a good critic of French poetry, but not of Gesta Dei Per Francos. Your points against him are quite logical. I suppose the controversy will not be conducted in public, or I should feel inclined to join in it. Anyhow, I wish it could be continued between us as a conversation in private, for I have long wanted to talk to you about serious things. Meanwhile, as not wholly unconnected with the serious things, could you possibly do me a great favor? It is very far from being the first great favor you have done me, and I should fear that anyone less magnanimous would fancy I only wrote to you about such things. But the situation is this. An excellent offer has been made to me to write a book about Jerusalem, not political, but romantic and religious, so to speak. I conceive it as mostly about pilgrimages and crusades in poetical prose, and working up to Allenby's great entrance. The offer includes money to go to Jerusalem, 
but cannot include all the political or military permissions necessary to go there. I have another motive for wanting to go there, which is much stronger than the desire to write the book, though I do think I could do it in the right way, and what matters more, on the right side. Francis is to come with me, and all the doctors in creation tell her she can only get rid of her neuritis if she goes to some such place and misses part of an English winter. I would do anything to bring it off for that reason alone. You are a man who knows everybody. Do you know anybody on Allenby's staff? Or know anybody who knows anybody on Allenby's staff? Or know anybody who would know anybody who would know anything about it? I am told that it cannot be done as yet in the ordinary way by cooks, and that the oracle must be worked in some such fashion. If you should be so kind as to refer to any worried soldier or official, I should like it understood that I am not nosing about touching any diplomatic or military matter, France in Syria, or any copy for the new witness. I only want to write semi-historical rhetoric on the spot. If you could possibly help in this matter, I really think you would be helping things you yourself care about, and one person, not myself, who deserves it. I will not say it would be killing two birds with one stone, which might seem a tragic metaphor, but bringing one bird at least to life and allowing the other bird, who is a goose, to go on a wild goose chase. Yours always, G.K. Chesterton. It was much needed change and refreshment for both Gilbert and Francis. Her diary shows a vivid enjoyment of all the scenes and happenings. Going into the Church of the Nativity with a door so low you can hardly get in, this done to prevent the cattle from straying in, seeing camels on the roof of a convent, standing godmother to an Armenian carpenter's baby, the officiator in a cape of white silk embroidered in gold and a wonderful crown supposed to represent the temple. The godfather, a young man, was in a red velvet gown. After a good many prayers and much chanting, the babe, beautifully dressed, was taken to the font, which is in the side of the wall, and there were more prayers and chanting. Then cushions were laid on the floor, and the child undressed, all of us assisting. At this point I was asked to stand godmother, and gladly consented. The baby, by this time quite naked, was handed to the priest, who immersed him completely under the water three times, giving him the name of Pedros, Peter. Before being re-clothed, he was anointed with oil. The forehead, eyes, nose, mouth, ears, heart, hands, and feet, all being signed with the cross. The child was by this time crying lustily, and it was some business to get him dressed, especially as he was swaddled in bands very completely. When ready, he was handed to me, and he lay stiff in my arms whilst I held two large lighted candles. I followed the priest from the font to the little altar, where a chain and a little gold cross were bound round his head, signifying that he was now a Christian. Then the priest touched his lips with the sacramental wafer, and touched his nose with myrrh. After the blessing, we left the church in a procession, the godfather carrying the baby. At the threshold of the house, the priest took it and delivered it to the mother, who sat waiting for it also holding the two candles. Again the priests muttered a few prayers and blessed mother, child, and godparents. The father is an Armenian carpenter by trade. Very nice people. Mother, very pretty. The parents insisted that we should stay for refreshments, and we were handed a very nice liquor in lovely little glasses and a very beautiful sort of pastry. Afterwards, cups of weak tea and cakes. The various rites and ceremonies in Jerusalem interested Francis deeply, 
but the diary shows no awareness of the differences that separated the various kinds of Christians. The diary ends with the return through Rome, where she and I met, to the surprise of both of us, in the street, while a friend traveling with them met my mother. Both meetings were miraculous, Francis comments. Since the letters to my mother during Gilbert's illness in 1915, we had heard no more about his spiritual pilgrimage. There was much eager talk at this meeting, but no opportunity occurred, and certainly none was sought, for any confidences. As we waved goodbye after their departing train, my mother said thoughtfully, Francis did rather play off Jerusalem against Rome, didn't she? In fact, as we learned later, this visit to Jerusalem had been a determining factor in Gilbert's conversion. Many people, both in and outside the church, had been wondering what had so long delayed him. The mental progress from the vague liberalism of the wild night to the splendid edifice of orthodoxy had been a swift one. For the book was written in 1908, and already several years earlier in Heretics, and in his newspaper contests with Blatchford, Gilbert Chesterton had shown his firm belief in the Godhead of our Lord, in sacraments, in priesthood, and in the authority of the Church. But it was not yet the Catholic and Roman Church. There is a revealing passage in the autobiography. And then I happened to meet Lord Hugh Cecil. I met him at the house of Wilfred Ward, that great clearing house of philosophies and theologies. I listened to Lord Hugh's very lucid statements of his position. The strongest impression I received was that he was a Protestant. I was myself still a thousand miles from being a Catholic. But I think it was the perfect and solid Protestantism of Lord Hugh that fully revealed to me that I was no longer a Protestant. The time that thousand miles took is a real problem. The years before the illness during which he talked of joining the church, the seven further years before he joined it, Cecil Chesterton had been received before the war, just at the beginning of the Marconi case, in fact and the entire outlook of both brothers had seemed to make this inevitable, not only theologically, but sociologically and historically, alike in their outlook on Europe today, or on the great ages of the past. It was a Catholic civilization based on Catholic theology that seemed to them the only true one for a full and rich human development, I think in this matter a special quality and its defect could be seen in Gilbert. For most people, intensity of thought is much more difficult than action. With him, it was the opposite. He used his mind unceasingly, his body as little as possible. I remember one day going to see them when he had a sprained ankle and learning from Francis how happy it made him because nobody could bother him to take exercise. The whole of practical life he left to her, but joining the church was not only something to be thought about, it was something really practical that had to be done. And here Francis could not help him. He will need Francis, said Father O'Connor to my mother to take him to church, to find his place in his prayer book, to examine his conscience for him when he goes to confession. He will never take all those hurdles unaided. Francis never lifted a finger to prevent Gilbert from joining the Catholic Church. But obviously, before she was convinced herself, she could not help him. The absence of help was in this case a very positive hindrance. I remember one day on a picnic, Gilbert coming up to me with a very disconsolate expression and asking where Francis was. I said, I don't know, but I can easily find her. Do you want her? He answered, I don't want her now, but I may want her at any minute. 
Many men depend upon their wives, but very few men admit it so frankly. And if he was unpractical to a point almost inconceivable, Frances herself could be called practical only in comparison with him. The confused mass of papers through which she had to hunt to find some important document lingers in the memory. Another element that made action lag behind conviction with Chesterton was his perpetual state of overwork. Physically inactive, his mind was never barren, but issued in an immense output. Several books every year, besides editing and articles, there were even two years in which no fewer than six books were published. To focus his attention on the deepest matters, it was vital to escape from the net of work and worry. Returning from Jerusalem, Gilbert wrote from Alexandria to Maurice Baring, My dear Maurice, to quote a poet we agree in thinking ridiculously underrated by recent fashions, my boat is on the shore, and my bark is on the sea. But before I go, Tom Moore, if I may so by a flight of fancy describe you, I feel impelled to send you this hurried line to thank you. So far as this atrocious hotel pen will allow me, for the wonderful time I have had in Palestine, which is so largely owing to you. There is also something even more important I want very much to discuss with you, because of certain things that have been touched on between us in former times. I will only say here that my train of thought, which really was one of thought and not fugitive emotion, came to an explosion in the church of the Ece Omo in Jerusalem, a church which the guidebooks call new and the newspapers call Latin. I fear it may be at least a month before we meet, for the journey takes a fortnight and may be prolonged by a friend ill in Paris, and I must work the moment I return to keep a contract. But if we could meet, by about then, I could thank you better for many things. Yours, illegibly, G.K. Chesterton. The contract that had to be kept was in all probability the writing of The New Jerusalem. It is a glorious book. Until I read them more carefully, I had always accepted G.K.'s own view that books of travel were a weak spot in his multifarious output. He said of himself that he always tended to see such enormous significance in every detail that he might just as well describe railway signals near Beaconsfield as the light of sunset over the Golden Horn. But the New Jerusalem is no mere book of description. It is the book of a man seeing a vision. To understand how this vision broke upon him, we have first to try to understand something jealously hidden by Gilbert Chesterton, his own suffering even as a boy, in the days of the toothache, and still more torturing earache, he had written, Though pain be stark and bitter, and days in darkness creep, not to that depth I sink me that asks the world to weep. So much did he acclaim himself enrolled under the banner of joy, that I think most people miss the companion picture to the favorite one of the happy warrior. No warrior can fight untiringly through a long lifetime without wounds, without temptations to abandon the struggle and seek a less glorious peace. If, in what are commonly called practical matters, Chesterton was weak, he was in this almost superhumanly strong. His fame did not rest upon success in the field of sociology and politics. He could have increased it by neglecting the good of England for which he fought, and living in literature, poetry, and fantasy. Here all acclaimed him great, whereas most tolerated or despised as a hobby or a weakness the work he was pouring into the fight for England. In this time after the armistice, it was by a naked effort of the will that he held his ground. 
the loss of Cecil, with his light-hearted courage, his energy and buoyancy, was immeasurable. And I know, for we talked of it together, that Frances had not the complete sympathy with Gilbert over the paper that she had over his other work. It seemed to her too great a drain on his time and energy. It made the writing of his important books more difficult. She would not, she told me, try to stop it, as she knew how much he cared, but she would have rejoiced if he had chosen to let it go. And the fight that he had almost enjoyed in Cecil's company had become a harder one, not merely because he was alone, but because the nature of the foe had changed. He was fighting now not individual abuses, but the mood of pessimism that had overtaken our civilization. In an article entitled, Is It Too Late?, he defined this pessimism as a paralysis of the mind, an impotence intrinsically unworthy of a free man. He stated powerfully the case of those who held that our civilization was dying and that it was too late to make any further efforts. The future belongs to those who can find a real answer to that real case. The omens and the auguries are against us. There is no answer but one, that omens and auguries are heathen things, and that we are not heathens. We are not lost unless we lose ourselves. Great Alfred, in the darkness of the ninth century, when the Danes were beating at the door, wrote down on his copy of Boethius his denial of the doctrine of fate. We, who have been brought up to see all the signs of the times pointing to improvement, may live to see all the signs in heaven and earth pointing the other way. If we go on, it must be in another name than that of the goddess of fortune. It was that other name in which he had so long believed that he realized, with the freshness of novelty on this journey to Jerusalem, he made in the holy city and in the fields of Palestine a new discovery of Christ and of the Christian thing. As he looked over the Dead Sea and almost physically realized what evil meant, he heard the voice of the divine deliverer saying to the demons, Go forth and trouble him not any more. In the cave at Bethlehem, he realized the little local infancy whereby the creator of the world had chosen to redeem the world. All through the book there are glimpses of what he tells more fully in The Everlasting Man. Between the two books, all that he had seen and thought in Palestine lay in his mind and grew there and fructified for our understanding. But he had seen it all in that first vision. Jerusalem first impressed Chesterton as a medieval city, and from its turrets he could readily picture Godfrey de Bouillon, Richard the Lionhearted, and St. Louis of France. Through the Crusades he views what was meant by Christendom, and sets over against it at once the greatness and the barrenness of Islam. The Moslem had one thought, and that a most vital one, the greatness of God, which levels all men. But the Moslem had not one thought to rub against another, because he really had not another. It is the friction of two spiritual things, of tradition and invention, or of substance and symbol, from which the mind takes fire. The creeds, condemned as complex, have something like the secret of sex. They can breed thoughts. Today, we of Christendom have fallen below ourselves, but yet we have something left of the power to create, whether it be a theology or a civilization. Talking to an old Arab in the desert, Chesterton heard him say that in all these years of Turkish rule, the Turks had never given to the people a cup of cold water. And as the old man spoke, 
he heard the clank of pipes and he knew that it was the English soldiers who were bringing water through the desert to Jerusalem. A chapter on Zionism discusses, with sympathy to both parties, the difficulties of the Jewish settlement in Palestine. In Palestine, he found his Jewish friend and co-worker on the New Witness, Dr. Ader, who had gone there ardent in the cause of Zionism, and Chesterton himself remained convinced that some system akin to Zionism was the only possible solution of this enormous problem. Possibly a system of Jewish cantons in various countries. But he was equally convinced that the English government was destroying the chances of success for Zionism by sending Jews as governors in England's name to that or any other Eastern country. Even in this book, there is struck at times a note of the doom he feared was overhanging us. He heard Islam crying from the turret and Israel wailing from the wall. And yet he seemed too to hear a voice from all the peoples of Jerusalem bidding us weep not for them who have faith and clarity and a purpose, but weep for ourselves and for our children. In his fighting articles, he had asserted the supremacy of the human will over fate. In this book, he sees how that will must be renewed, purified, and made once more mighty by the same power that built the ancient civilization of Christendom. Jerusalem gave to Chesterton the fuller realization of two great facts. First, he saw that the supernatural was needed not only to conquer the powers of evil, but even to restore the good things that should be natural to man. As he put it in the later book, nature may not have the name of Isis. Isis may not be really looking for Osiris. But it is true that nature is really looking for something. Nature is always looking for the supernatural. Yet man, even strengthened by the supernatural, cannot suffice for the fight without a leader who is more than man. In the land of Christ's childhood, his teaching and his suffering, there came to Gilbert Chesterton a vision more vivid than a man walking unveiled upon the mountains, seen of men and seeing a visible God. All visions must fade into the light of common day, and the return home meant the resumption of hard labor. For the moment, wrote Gilbert to Maurice Baring, as Balzac said, I am laboring like a miner in a landslide. Normally I would let it slide. But if I did in this case, I should break two or three really important contracts which I find I have returned from Jerusalem just in time to save. A few years later, when Sheed and Ward started, Gilbert wanted to write a number of books for us to publish. His secretary found that he had then 30 books contracted for with a variety of publishers. He had got home in April 1920, and a lecture tour was planned for the United States at the beginning of the following year. The eight months between saw the completion and publication of The Uses of Diversity, Collected Essays, The New Jerusalem, and The Superstition of Divorce, and still went on The New Witness, The Illustrated London News, Articles, Introductions, Lectures, Conferences. Two letters to Maurice Baring clearly belong to these months. My dear Maurice, I am so awfully distressed to hear you are unwell again. I do not know whether I ought even to bother you with my sentiments, beyond my sympathy. But if it is not too late or too early, I will call on you early next week, probably Monday. But I will let you know for certain before then. I would have called on you long ago, let alone written, but for this load of belated work which really seems to bury me day after day, I never realized before that business can really block out much bigger things. As you may possibly guess, 
I want to consider my position about the biggest thing of all, whether I am to be inside it or outside it. I used to think one could be an Anglo-Catholic and really inside it, but if that was, to use an excellent phrase of your own, only a porch, I do not think I want a porch, and certainly not a porch standing some way from the building. A porch looks so silly standing all by itself in a field. Since then, unfortunately, there have sprung up around it real ties and complications and difficulties. Difficulties that seemed almost duties. But I will not bother you with all that now, and I particularly do not want you to bother yourself, especially to answer this, unless you want to. I know I have your sympathy, and please God, I shall get things straight. Sometimes one suspects the real obstacles have been the weaknesses one knows to be wrong, and not the doubts that might be relatively right, or at least rational. I suppose all this is a common story, and I hope so, for wanting to be uncommon is really not one of my weaknesses. They are worse, probably, but they are not that. There are other, and in the ordinary sense, more cheerful things I would like to talk of, things I think we could both do for causes we certainly agree about. Meanwhile, thank you for everything. And be sure I think of you very much. Yours always, G.K. Chesterton. My dear Maurice, this is the shortest, hastiest, and worst written letter in the world. It only tells you three things. One, that I thank you a thousand times for the book. Two, that I have to leave for America for a month or two, earlier than I expected. But I'm glad, for I shall see something of Francis without walls of work between us, and three, that I have pretty well made up my mind about the thing we talked about. Fortunately, the thing we talked about can be found all over the world. Yours always, G.K. Chesterton. I will not write here of the American scene, but we'll talk of it in a later chapter, along with the second tour Gilbert made in the States. It seems best to complete now the story of his journey of the mind. A reserved man tells more of himself indirectly than directly. Readers of the autobiography complain that it is concerned with everything in the world except G.K. Chesterton. You can certainly search its pages in vain for any account of the process of his conversion. For that you must look elsewhere, in the poems to Our Lady, in the Catholic Church and Conversion, in the Well and the Shallows, and in the letters here to be quoted. In the Catholic Church and Conversion, he sketches the three phases through which most converts pass, all of which he had himself experienced. He sums them up as patronizing the Church, discovering the Church, and running away from the Church. In the first phase, a man is taking trouble, and taking trouble has certainly never been a particular weakness of mine, to find out the fallacy in most anti-Catholic ideas. In the second stage, he is gradually discovering the great ideas enshrined in the Church and hitherto hidden from him. It is these numberless glimpses of great ideas that have been hidden from the convert by the prejudices of his provincial culture that constitute the adventurous and buried second stage of the conversion. It is, broadly speaking, the stage in which the man is unconsciously trying to be converted, and the third stage is perhaps the truest and most terrible. It is that in which the man is trying not to be converted. He has come too near to the truth and has forgotten that Truth is a magnet with the powers of attraction and repulsion. The Catholic Church and Conversion, page 61. To a certain extent, it is a fear which attaches to all sharp and irrevocable decisions. 
it is suggested in all the old jokes about the shakiness of the bridegroom at the wedding, or the recruit who takes the shilling and gets drunk partly to celebrate, but partly also to forget it. But it is the fear of a fuller sacrament and a mightier army. Ibid, page 65. The man has exactly the same sense of having committed or compromised himself, of having been, in a sense, entrapped, even if he is glad to be entrapped. But for a considerable time he is not so much glad as simply terrified. It may be that this real psychological experience has been misunderstood by stupider people and is responsible for all that remains of the legend that Rome is a mere trap. But that legend misses the whole point of the psychology. It is not the Pope who has set the trap or the priests who have baited it. The whole point of the position is that the trap is simply the truth. The whole point is that the man himself has made his way towards the trap of truth and not the trap that has run after the man. All steps except the last step. He has taken eagerly on his own account, out of interest in the truth. And even the last step, or the last stage, only alarms him because it is so very true. If I may refer once more to a personal experience, I may say that I for one was never less troubled by doubts than in the last phase, when I was troubled by fears. Before that final delay, I had been detached and ready to regard all sorts of doctrines with an open mind. Since that delay has ended indecision, I have had all sorts of changes in mere mood and I think I sympathize with doubts and difficulties more than I did before. But I had no doubts or difficulties just before. I had only fears, fears of something that had the finality and simplicity of suicide. But the more I thrust the thing into the back of my mind, the more certain I grew of what thing it was. And by a paradox that does not frighten me now in the least, it may be that I shall never again have such absolute assurance that the thing is true as I had when I made my last effort to deny it. Ibid, page 62 to 63. Chapter 32, part 2. Rome via Jerusalem. The whole of Catholic theology can be justified, says Gilbert, if you are allowed to start with those two ideas that the church is popularly supposed to oppose, reason and liberty. To become a Catholic is not to leave off thinking, but to learn how to think. It is so in exactly the same sense in which to recover from palsy is not to leave off moving, but to learn how to move. The convert has learned, long before his conversion, that the church will not force him to abandon his will. But he is not unreasonably dismayed at the extent to which he may have to use his will. This was the crux for Gilbert. There is in the last second of time or hair breadth of space, before the iron leaps to the magnet, an abyss full of all the un fathomable forces of the universe, the space between doing and not doing such a thing is so tiny and so vast. Father Maturin said after his conversion that for at least ten years before it, the question had never been out of his mind for ten waking minutes. It was about ten years since Gilbert had first talked to Father O'Connor of his intention to join the church, but in his case, thought on the subject could not have been so continuous. Still he had time for patronizing, discovery, and running away, all in leisurely fashion. External efforts to help him had been worse than useless, as he indicates in The Catholic Church and Conversion, they had always put him back. Gilbert could not be hustled, 
says Maurice Baring of his whole habit of mind and body. You could fluster Gilbert, but not hustle him, says Father O'Connor. They were both too wise to try. In two letters, Gilbert said that the two people who helped him most at this time were Maurice Baring and Father Ronald Knox, who had both gone through the same experience themselves. Besides the positive mental processes of recognition, repulsion, and attraction exercised by the Church, Gilbert was affected to some extent both by affection for the Church of England and disappointment with it. The profound joy of his early conversion to Christianity was linked with Anglicanism, and so too were many friendships and the continued attachment to it of Francis. But what he said to Maurice Baring about a porch is representative. Like Father Maturin, he felt he owed so much to his Anglican friends. He hated to stress over much the revulsion from Anglicanism in the process of conversion, but it did at this date contribute to the converging arguments. He wrote to Maurice Baring, so many thanks for the sermons, which I will certainly return, as you suggest. I had the other day a trying experience, and I think a hard case of casuistry. I am not sure that I was right, but also not by any means sure I was wrong. Long ago, before my present crisis, I had promised somebody to take part in what I took to be a small debate on labor. Too late, by my own carelessness, I found to my horror it had swelled into a huge Anglo-Catholic Congress at the Albert Hall. I tried to get out of it, but I was held to my promise. Then I reflected that I could only write, as I was already writing, to my Anglo-Catholic friends on the basis that I was one of them now, in doubt about continuing such, and that their conference in some sense served the same purpose as their letters. What affected me most, however, was that by my own fault, I had put them into a hole. Otherwise, I would not just now speak from or for their platform, just as I could not, as yet at any rate, speak from or for yours. So, I spoke very briefly, saying something of what I think about social ethics whether or not my decision was right. My experience was curious and suggestive, though tragic, for I felt it like a farewell. There was no doubt about the enthusiasm of those thousands of Anglo-Catholics, but there was also no doubt, unless I am much mistaken, that many of them besides myself would be Roman Catholics rather than accept things they are quite likely to be asked to accept. For instance, by the Lambeth Conference. For though my own distress, as in most cases, I suppose, has much deeper grounds than clerical decisions, yet if I cannot stay where I am, it will be a sort of useful symbol that the English Church has done something decisively Protestant or pagan. I mean that to those to whom I cannot give my spiritual biography, I can say that the insecurity I felt in Anglicanism was typified in the Lambeth Conference. I am at least sure that much turns on that conference, if not for me, for large numbers of those people at the Albert Hall. A young Anglo-Catholic curate has just told me that the crowd there cheered all references to the Pope and laughed at every mention of the Archbishop of Canterbury. It's a queer state of things. I am concerned most, however, about somebody I value more than the Archbishop of Canterbury, Francis, to whom I owe much of my own faith, and to whom, therefore, as far as I can see my way, I also owe every decent chance for the controversial defense of her faith. If her side can convince me, they have a right to do so. If not, I shall go hot and strong to convince her. I put it clumsily, 
But there is a point in my mind. Logically, therefore, I must await answers from Waggett and Gore, as well as Knox and McNabb, and talk the whole thing over with her, and then act as I believe. This is a dusty political sort of letter, with nothing in it but what I think, and nothing of what I feel. For that side of it, I can only express myself by asking for your prayers. The accident of his having to speak at this Congress, where he was received with enormous enthusiasm, probably led to a fuller analysis of this element in his thought. I put here a letter he wrote to Maurice Baring soon after his conversion, because it sums up the Anglican question as he finally saw it. February 14, 1923. Please forgive me for the delay, but I have been caught in a cataract of letters and work in connection with the new paper we are trying to start, and am now dictating this under conditions that make it impossible for it to resemble anything so personal and intimate as the great unwritten epistle to which you refer. But I will note down here very hurriedly and in a more impersonal way some of the matters that have affected me in relation to the great problem. To begin with, I am shy of giving one of my deepest reasons, because it is hard to put it without offense, but I am sure it is the wrong method to offend the wavering Anglo-Catholic. But I believe one of my strongest motives was mixed up with the idea of honor. I feel there is something mean about not making complete confession and restitution after a historic error and slander. It is not the same thing to withdraw the charges against Rome one by one, or restore the traditions to Canterbury one by one. Suppose a young prig refuses to live with his father, or his friend, or his wife, because wine is drunk in the house, or there are Greek statues in the hall. Suppose he goes off on his own and develops broader ideas. On the day he drinks his first glass of wine, I think it is essential to his honor that he should go back to his father or his friend and say, You are right, and I was wrong, and we will drink wine together. It is not consonant with his honor that he should set up a house of his own with wine and statues and every parallel particular, and still treat the other as if he were in the wrong. That is mean, because it is making the best of both. It is combining the advantages of being right with the advantages of having been wrong. Any analogy is imperfect, but I think you see what I mean. The larger version of this is that England has really got into so wrong a state with its plutocracy and neglected populace and materialistic and servile morality that it must take a sharp turn that will be a sensational turn. No evolution into Catholicism will have that moral effect. Christianity is the religion of repentance. It stands against modern fatalism and pessimistic futurism, mainly in saying that a man can go back. If we do decidedly go back, it will show that religion is alive. For the rest, I do not say much about the details of continuity and succession, because the truth is they did not much affect me. What I see is that we cannot complain of England suffering from being Protestant, and at the same time claim that she has always been Catholic. That there has always been a high church party is true. That there has always been an Anglo-Catholic party may be true, but I'm not so sure of it. But there is one matter arising from that which I do think important. Even the high church party, even the Anglo-Catholic party, only confronts a particular heresy called Protestantism upon particular points. It defends ritual rightly, or even sacramentalism rightly, because these are the things the Puritans attacked. If it is not the heresy of an age 
At least it is only the anti-heresy of an age. But since I have been a Catholic, I have become conscious of being in a much vaster arsenal, full of arms against countless other potential enemies. The Church, as the Church, and not merely as ordinary opinion, has something to say to philosophies, which the merely high church has never had occasion to think about. If the next movement is the very reverse of Protestantism, the church will have something to say about it, or rather has already something to say about it. You might unite all high churchmen on the high church quarrel, what authority is to unite them when the devil declares his next war on the world? Another quality that impresses me is the power of being decisive first and being proved right afterwards. This is exactly the quality a supernatural power would have, and I know nothing else in modern religion that has it. For instance, there was a time when I should have thought, psychical inquiry the most reasonable thing in the world and rather favorable to religion i was afterwards convinced by experience and not merely faith that spiritualism is a practical poison don't people see that when that is found in experience a prodigious prestige accrues to the authority which long before the experiment did not pretend to inquire, but simply said, drop it. We feel that the authority did not discover, it knew. There are a hundred other things of which that story is true, in my own experience. But the high churchman has a perfect right to be a spiritualistic inquirer. Only he has not a right to claim that his authority knew beforehand the truth about spiritualistic inquiry. Of course, there are a hundred things more to say. Indeed, the greatest argument for Catholicism is exactly what makes it so hard to argue for it. It is the scale and multiplicity of the forms of truth and help that it has to offer. And perhaps, after all, the only thing that you and I can really say with profit is exactly what you yourself suggested, that we are men who have talked to a good many men about a good many things, and seen something of the world and the philosophies of the world, and that we have not the shadow of a doubt about what was the wisest act of our lives. This letter, as we have seen, was written afterwards. Meanwhile, the story of the last slow but by no means uncertain steps is best told in a series of undated letters to Father Ronald Knox. Dear Father Knox, it is hard not to have a silly feeling that demons in the form of circumstances get in the way of what concerns one most and I have been distracted with details, for which I have to be responsible, in connection with the new witness, which is in a crisis about which shareholders, etc., have to be consulted. I can't let my brother's paper, that stands for all he believed in, go without doing all I can, and I am trying to get it started again, with Belloc to run it if possible, but the matter of our meeting has got into every chink of my thoughts, even the pauses of talk on practical things. I could not explain myself at that meeting, and I want to try again now. I could not explain what I mean about my wife without saying much more. I see in principle it is not on the same level as the true church, for nothing can be on the same level as God. But it is on quite a different level from social sentiments about friends and family. I have been a rottenly irresponsible person till I began to wear the iron ring of Catholic responsibilities. But I really have felt a responsibility about her, more serious than affection, let alone passion. First, 
Because she gave me my first respect for sacramental Christianity. Second, because she is one of the good who mysteriously suffer. I have, however, a more practical reason for returning to this point. So far as my own feelings go, I think I might rightly make application to be instructed as soon as possible, but I should not like to take so serious a step without reopening the matter with her, which I could do by the end of a week. I have had no opportunity before, because she has only just recovered from an illness and is going away for a few days. But at about the end of next week, say, everything ought to be ready. Meanwhile, I will write to you again, as I ought to have done before. But this tangle of business ties me up terribly just now. Perhaps you could tell me how I could arrange matters with some priest or religious in London, whose convenience it would suit if I came up once or twice a week, or whatever is required. Or give me the address of someone to write to, if that is the correct way. There are priests at High Wycombe, which is nearer, but I imagine they are very busy parochial clergy. I have meant to write to you about the convictions involved in a more abstract way, but I fear I have filled my letter with one personal point. But, as I say, I will write to you again about the other matters, and as they are more intellectual and less emotional, I hope I may be a little more coherent. Yours very sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. P.S. This has been delayed even longer than I thought, for business bothers of my own and the papers, plus finishing a book and all my journalism, are bewildering me terribly. Dear Father Knox, please excuse this journalistic paper, but the letter block seems undiscoverable at this time of night. I ought to have written before, but we have been in some family trouble. My father is very ill, and as he is an old man, my feelings are with him and my mother in a way more serious than anything, except the matter of our correspondence. Essentially, of course, it does not so much turn the current of my thoughts as deepen it. To see a man so many million times better than I am in every way, and one to whom I owe everything, under such a shadow, makes me feel, on top of all my particular feelings, the shadow that lies on us all. I can't tell you what I feel, of course, but I hope I may ask for your prayers for my people, and for me. My father is the very best man I ever knew of that generation, that never understood the new need of a spiritual authority, and lives almost perfectly by the sort of religion men had when rationalism was rational. I think he was always subconsciously prepared for the next generation having less theology than he has, and is rather puzzled at its having more. But I think he understood my brother's conversion better than my mother did. She is more difficult, and of course I cannot bother her just now. However, my trouble has a practical side, for which I originally mentioned it. As this may bring me to London more than I thought, it seems possible I might go there after all, instead of Wickham, if I knew to whom to go. Also, I find I stupidly destroyed your letter with the names of the priests at Wickham to whom you referred me. Would it bother you very much to send me the names again, and any alternative London ones that occur to you, and I will let you know my course of action then. Please forgive the disorder of my writing and feeling. Yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. Dear Father Knox, I was just settling down three days ago to write a full reply to your last very kind letter, which I should have answered long before when I received the wire that called me instantly to town. 
My father died on Monday, and since then I have been doing the little I can for my mother. But even that little involves a great deal of business, the least valuable sort of help. I will not attempt to tell you now all that this involves in connection with my deeper feelings and intentions. For I only send you this interim scribble as an excuse for delaying the letter I had already begun, and which nothing less than this catastrophe would have prevented me finishing. I hope to finish it in a few days. I am not sure whether I shall then be back in Beaconsfield, but if so, it will be at a new address. Top Meadow, Beaconsfield. Yours in haste, G.K. Chesterton. Dear Father Knox, I feel horribly guilty in not having written before, and I do most earnestly hope you have not allowed my delay to interfere with any of your own arrangements. I have had a serious and very moving talk with my wife, and she is only too delighted at the idea of your visit in itself. In fact, she really wants to know you very much. Unfortunately, it does not seem very workable at the time to which I suppose you referred. I imagine it more or less corresponds to next week, and we have only one spare bedroom yet, which is occupied by a nurse who is giving my wife a treatment that seems to be doing her good, and which I don't want to stop if I can help it. I am sure you will believe that my regret about this difficulty is really not the conventional apology, though heaven knows all sorts of apologies are due to you. Touching the other idea of Lady Lovat's most generous invitation, I am not so sure, as that again depends at the moment on the treatment. But of course I shall let Lady Lovat know very soon in any case and make other arrangements, as you suggested. In our conversation, my wife was all that I hope you will some day know her to be. She is incapable of wanting me to do anything but what I think right, and admits the same possibility for herself. But it is much more of a wrench for her, for she has been able to practice her religion in complete good faith, which my own doubts have prevented me from doing. I will write again very soon. Yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. P.S. I am ashamed to say this has been finished fully 48 hours after I meant it to go, owing to executor business. Nobody so unbusinesslike as I am ought to be busy. Dear Father Knox, this is only a wild and hasty line to show I have not forgotten, and to ask you if it would be too late if I let you know in a day or two, touching your generous suggestion about your vacation. I shall know for certain, I think, at latest by the end of the week, but just at the moment it depends on things still uncertain about a nurse who is staying here giving my wife a treatment of radiant heat. One would hardly think needed in this weather, but it seems to be doing her good, I am thankful to say. If this is pushing your great patience too far, please do not hesitate to make other arrangements if you wish to. I shall no doubt be able to do the same, but I should love to accept your suggestion if possible. Yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. Dear Father Knox, Just as I was emerging from the hurricane of business I mentioned to you, I find myself under a promise a year old to go and lecture for a week in Holland, and I write this almost stepping onto the boat. I don't in the least want to go, but I suppose the great question is there as elsewhere. Indeed, I hear it is something of a reconquered territory. Some say a third of this heroic Calvinist state is now Catholic. I have no time to write properly, but the truth is that even before so small a journey I have a queer and perhaps superstitious feeling that I should like to repeat to you my intention of following the example of the worthy Calvinists, please God, so that you could even cite it if there were ever need in good cause. 
I will write to you again and more fully about the business of instruction when I return, which should be in about ten days. Yours always sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. Dear Father Knox, I ought to have written long ago to tell you what I have done about the most practical of business matters. I have again been torn in pieces by the wars of the new witness, but I have managed to have another talk with my wife, after which I have written to our old friend, Father O'Connor, and asked him to come here, as he probably can from what I hear. I doubt whether I can possibly put in words why I feel sure this is the right thing, not so much for my sake as for hers. We talk about misunderstandings, but I think it is possible to understand too well for comfort, certainly too well for my powers of psychological description. Francis is just at the point where Rome acts both as the positive and the negative magnet. A touch would turn her either way, almost against her will, to hatred, but with the right touch to a faith far beyond my reach. I know Father O'Connor's would be the touch that does not startle, because she knows him and is fond of him, and the only thing she asked of me was to send for him. If he cannot come, of course I shall take other action and let you know. I doubt if most people could make head or tail of this hasty scrawl, but I think you will understand. Yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. Father Knox wrote on July 17th, 1922, I'm awfully glad to hear that you've sent for Father O'Connor and that you think he's likely to be available. I must say that in the story, Father Brown's powers of neglecting his parish always seem to me even more admirable than Dr. Watson's power of neglecting his practice. So I hope this trait was drawn from the life. Father O'Connor has described the two days before the reception. On Thursday morning, on one of our trips to the village, I told Mrs. Chesterton, there is only one thing troubling Gilbert about the great step, the effect it is going to have on you. Oh, I shall be infinitely relieved. You cannot imagine how it fidgets Gilbert to have anything on his mind. The last three months have been exceptionally trying. I should be only too glad to come with him. If God in his mercy would show the way clear, but up to now he has not made it clear enough to me to justify such a step. So I was able to reassure Gilbert that afternoon. We discussed at large such special points as he wished, and then I told him to read through the Penny Catechism to make sure there were no snags to a prosperous passage. It was a sight for men and angels and all the Friday to see him wandering in and out of the house with his fingers in the leaves of the little book, resting it on his forearm whilst he pondered with his head on one side. The ceremony took place in a kind of shed with corrugated iron roof and wooden walls, a part of the railway hotel, for at this time Beaconsfield had no Catholic church. Father Ignatius Rice, OSB, another old and dear friend, came over from the abbey at Douay to join Father O'Connor at breakfast at the inn, and they afterwards walked up together to Top Meadow. What follows is from notes made by my husband of a conversation with Father Rice. They found Gilbert in an armchair reading the catechism, pulling faces and making noises, as he used to do when reading. He got up and stuffed the catechism in his pocket. At lunch, he drank water and poured wine for everyone else. About three, they set out for the church. Suddenly, Father O'Connor asked G.K. if he had brought the ritual. G.K. plunged his hand in his pocket, pulled out a three-penny shocker with complete absence of embarrassment, and went on searching till at last he found the prayer book. While G.K. was making his confession to Father O'Connor, Francis and Father Rice went out of the chapel and sat on the yokel's bench in the bar of the inn. She was weeping. 
After the baptism, the two priests came out and left Gilbert and Francis inside. Father Rice went back for something he had forgotten, and he saw them coming down the aisle. She was still weeping, and Gilbert had his arm round her, comforting her. He wrote the sonnet on his conversion that day. He was in brilliant form for the rest of the day, quoting poetry and jesting in the highest spirits. He joined the church to restore his innocence. Sin was almost the greatest reality to him. He became a Catholic because of the church's practical power of dealing with sin. Immediately he wrote to his mother and to Maurice Baring, who had anxiously feared he had perhaps offended Gilbert. So long was it since he had heard from him. My dearest mother, I write this with the worst pen in South Bucks to tell you something before I write about it to anyone else. Something about which we shall probably be in the position of the two bosom friends at Oxford who never differed except in opinion. You have always been so wise in not judging people by their opinions, but rather the opinions by the people. It is, in one sense, a long story by this time, but I have come to the same conclusion that Cecil did about needs of the modern world in religion and right dealing. And I am now a Catholic, in the same sense as he, having long claimed the name in its Anglo-Catholic sense. I am not going to make a foolish fuss of reassuring you about things I am sure you never doubted. These things do not hurt any relations between people as fond of each other as we are, any more than they ever made any difference to the love between Cecil and ourselves. But there are two things I should like to tell you, in case you do not realize them through some other impression. I have thought about you, and all that I owe to you and my father, not only in the way of affection, but of the ideals of honor and freedom and charity and all other good things you always taught me. And I am not conscious of the smallest break or difference in those ideals, but only of a new and necessary way of fighting for them. I think, as Cecil did, that the fight for the family and the free citizen and everything decent must now be waged by the one fighting form of Christianity. The other is that I have thought this out for myself and not in a hurry of feeling. It is months since I saw my Catholic friends and years since I talked to them about it. I believe it is the truth. I must end now, you know, with how much love, for the post is going. Always your loving son, Gilbert. Dear Maurice, my abominable delay deserves every penalty conceivable. Hanging, burning, and boiling in oil. But really, not so inconceivable an idea as that I should be offended with you at any time, let alone after all you have done in this matter. However thoroughly you might be justified in being offended with me, really and truly, my delay, indefensible as it is, was due to a desire and hope of writing you a letter quite different from all those I have had to write to other people. A very long and intimate letter trying to tell you all about this wonderful business in which you have helped me so much more than anyone else. The only other person I meant to write to in the same style is Father Knox, and his has been delayed in the same topsy-turvy way. I am drowning in whirlpools of work and worry over the new witness, which nearly went bankrupt for good this week. But worry does not worry so much as it did before. Unless it is adding insult to injury, I shall send the long letter, after all. This I send off instantly on receipt of yours. Please forgive me. You see, I humiliate myself by using your stamped envelope. Yours always, G.K. Chesterton. This sense that the church was needed to fight for the world was very strong in Gilbert when he hailed it to his mother as the one fighting form of Christianity. 
in the new witness, he answered near this time a newspaper suggestion that the church ought to move with the times. The cities of the plain might have remarked that the heavens above them did not altogether fit in with their own high civilization and social habits. They would be right. Oddly enough, however, when symmetry was eventually restored, it was not the heavens that had been obliged to adapt themselves. The church cannot move with the times, simply because the times are not moving. The church can only stick in the mud with the times, and rot and stink with the times. In the economic and social world, as such, there is no activity except that sort of automatic activity that is called decay. The withering of the high powers of freedom and their decomposition into the aboriginal soil of slavery. In that way, the world stands much at the same stage as it did at the beginning of the Dark Ages, and the Church has the same task as it had at the beginning of the Dark Ages, to save all the light and liberty that can be saved, to resist the downward drag of the world, and to wait for better days. So much a real Church would certainly do. But a real Church might be able to do more, it might make its dark ages something more than a seed time. It might make them the very reverse of dark. It might present its more human ideal in such abrupt and attractive a contrast to the inhuman trend of the time as to inspire men suddenly for one of the moral revolutions of history so that men now living shall not taste of death until they have seen justice return. We do not want, as the newspapers say, a church that will move with the world. We want a church that will move the world. We want one that will move it away from many of the things towards which it is now moving. For instance, the servile state. It is by that test that history will really judge of any church, whether it is the real church or no. Recording by Dick Bourgeois Doyle. Chapter 24, Completion. There is only one part of this story that has not been told with the rest. Our Lady's share in Gilbert's conversion. The Chesterton family had been quite without the strange Protestant prejudice that in the minds of many Englishmen sets the Mother of God against God the Son. Our Lady was respected, though of course not invoked. In a boyhood poem, Gilbert took the blasphemous lines of Swinburne's hymn to Proserpine and wrote a kind of parody in reverse, turning the poem into a hymn to Mary. He would, too, recite Swinburne's own lines, deliberately directing them away from Swinburne's intention and supposing them addressed to the new Christian queen of life rather than to the fallen pagan queen of death. But I turn to her still, having seen she shall surely abide in the end, goddess and maiden and queen, be near me now and befriend. Nor was it only admiration for art that made him write, also in early youth, the nativity of Botticelli. Do you blame me that I sit hours before this picture? But if I walked all over the world in this time, I should hardly see anything worth seeing that is not in this picture. Father O'Connor sees in the Catholic Church and conversion a hint that Mr. Belloc had been of those who tried to hustle Gilbert in his younger days. But on this profound reality of Mary's help, they could meet many years before Gilbert had finished the slow rumination of mind and the painful effort of will that had held him so long. Here is an early letter Belloc wrote to his friend. Reform Club, Manchester, 11th of December, 1907. My dear Gilbert, I'm a man afraid of impulse in boats, horses, and all action, though driven to it. I have never written a letter, such as I am writing now, though I have desired to write some six or seven since I became a grown man. In the matter we discussed at Oxford, I have a word to say which is easier to say on paper than by word of mouth, or rather more valuable. All intellectual process is doubtful, all inconclusive, save pure deduction, 
which is a game if one's first certitudes are hypothetical and immensely valuable if one's first certitude is fixed, yet remains wholly dependent on that. Now, if we differed in all main points, I would not write thus, but there are one or two on which we agree. One is very facis immolatus in cruce pro homine. Another is in a looking up to our dear lady, the blessed mother of God. I recommend to you this, that you suggest to her a comprehension for yourself of what indeed is the permanent home of the soul. If it is here, you will see it. If it is there, you will see it. She never fails us. She has never failed me in any demand. I have never written thus, as I say, and I beg you to see nothing in it but what I say. There is no connection, the reason can cease, but so it is. If you say, I want this, as in your case, to know one way or the other, she will give it to you, as she will give health or necessary money or success in pure love. She is our blessed mother. I have not used my judgment in this letter. I am inclined to destroy it, but I shall send it. Don't answer it. Yours ever, H. Belloc. At top of the letter, my point is, if it is right, she knows. If it is not right, she knows. Gilbert believed it, and he knew that as he came to the church, he was coming to Our Lady. Now I can scarcely remember a time when the image of Our Lady did not stand up in my mind quite definitely, at the mention or the thought of all these things. I was quite distant from these things, and then doubtful about these things and then disputing with the world for them, and with myself against them. For that is the condition before conversion. But whether the figure was distant, or was dark and mysterious, or was a scandal to my contemporaries, or was a challenge to myself, I never doubted that this figure was the figure of the faith. That she embodied, as a complete human being, still only human, all that this thing had to say to humanity. The instant I remembered the Catholic Church, I remembered her. When I tried to forget the Catholic Church, I tried to forget her. When I finally saw what was nobler than my faith, the freest and hardest of all my acts of freedom, it was in front of a gilded and very gaudy little image of her in the port of Brindisi, that I promised the thing that I would do if I returned to my own land. From the well and the shallows, pages 176 to 177. In his Chaucer, G.K. quoted with considerable amusement a learned critic who said it was possible that the poet had passed through a period of intense devotion, more especially towards the Virgin Mary. It is, he comments, it does occur from time to time. I do not quite understand why Chaucer must have passed through this fit of devotion, as if he had Mariola tree like the measles. Even an amateur who has encountered this malady may be allowed to testify that it does not usually visit its victim for a brief period. It is generally chronic, and in some sad cases I've known, quite incurable. From Chaucer, page 121. The Queen of Seven Swords is the great expression of Gilbert's chronic love of Our Lady. And men looked up at the woman made for the morning when the stars were young. For whom more true than a beggar's rhyme in the gutter, these songs were sung. The return of Eve exemplified a favorite thought of his. When the journalist keeps repeating that the life of religion does not lie in dusty dogmas, we should stop him with a great shout. For he is wrong at the very start. It is from the seed of dogma, and from that seed alone, that all powers of art and poetry and devotion spring. In the days of his boyhood, when he thought Our Lady with a vague and confused respect as the Madonna, he could not have written the return of Eve. That flower came from the seed of the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Our Lady is the Mother of God, and our Mother. This doctrine blossomed as he wrote. I found one hidden in every home, a voice that sings about the house, a nurse that scares the nightmares off, a mother nearer than a spouse whose picture once I saw and there, wild of old and weird and sweet, in sevenfold splendor blazed the moon, not on her brow, beneath her feet.
This poem, The White Witch, has in it a mingling of the old classical stories of his boyhood and the new light of Christian reality. In The Everlasting Man, he saw the myths as hunger and the faith as bread. Men's hearts today were withered because they had forgotten to eat their bread. The hunger of the pagans was a healthier thing than the jaded sterility of the modern world. Our Lady was ready to give that world the bread of life once more. And as he meditated on the mystery of the virgin birth, he saw God making purity creative. He alone, who overcame all heresies, could overcome the hideous heresy of birth prevention. That Christ, from this creative purity, came forth your sterile appetites to scorn. So in her house, life without lust was born. So in your house, lust without life shall die. Gaudi, Virgo Maria, Cunctus Eresis, Sola, Interimisti. Was this phrase from Our Lady's office ringing in Gilbert's mind as he sang the seven champions of Christendom, disarmed and worsted in the fight? Going back to Our Lady to find that she had hidden their swords where the Gospels tell us she hid and pondered all things. In her heart, from her wounded heart, Mary takes the seven swords to rearm the saints who have to reconquer the earth. Certainly he must often have thought of the litany. So many verses are based on it. Our Lord, as a baby, climbs the ivory tower of his mother's body and kisses the mystic rose of her lips. A woman was his walking home, Puderis Arca Ora Pro Nobis. And he thinks of the sun, moon, and stars as trinkets for her to play with, with the great heart a woman has and the love of little things. For she is a woman, the Regina Angelorum, Queen of Powers and Archangels. She yet belongs to the human race. Our Lady went into a strange country. Our Lady, for she was ours, and had run on the little hills behind the houses and pulled small flowers. But she rose up and went into a strange country with strange thrones and powers. From a welter of comment and correspondence that followed his conversion, challenging, scorning, rejoicing, welcoming, I select two letters from the two closest of Gilbert's Catholic friends, Hilaire Belloc and Maurice Barry. My dear Gilbert, I write to you from these strange surroundings, the first line upon the news you gave me. I must write to you again when I have collected myself, for my reactions are abominably slow. I have, however, something to say immediately, and that is why I write this very evening, just after seeing Eleanor off at the station. The thing I have to say is this, could not have said it before your step, I can say it so now, before it would have been like a selected pleading. The Catholic Church is the exponent of reality. It is true, its doctrines in matters large and small are statements of what is. This it is, which the ultimate act of the intelligence accepts. This it is, which the will deliberately confirms. And that is why faith though an act of the will is moral. If the ordinance map tells us that it is 11 miles to a place, then my mood of lassitude as I walk through the rain at night, making it feel like 30, I use the will and say, no, my intelligence has been convinced, and I compel myself to use it against my mood. It is 11, and though I feel in the depths of my being that I have gone 30 miles and more, I know it is not yet 11 I have gone. I am, by all my nature, of mind skeptical, and as to the doubt of the soul, I discover it to be false, a mood, not a conclusion. My conclusion, and that of all men who have ever once seen it, is the faith, corporate, organized, a personality, teaching, a thing, not a theory, it. To you, who have the blessing of profound religious emotion, this statement may seem too desiccate. It is indeed not enthusiastic lacks meat. It is my misfortune, in youth I had it, even till lately. Grief has drawn the juices from it. I am alone and unfed. The more do I affirm the sanctity, the unity, the infallibility of the Catholic Church. By my very isolation do I the more affirm it, as a man in a desert knows that water is right for man, or as a wounded dog not able to walk yet knows the way home. The 
Catholic Church is the natural home of the human spirit, the odd perspective picture of life, which looks like a meaningless puzzle at first. Seen from that one standpoint, takes a complete order and meaning, like the skull in the picture of the ambassadors. So much for my jejun contribution, not without value, because I know you regard my intelligence, a perilous tool God gave me for his own purposes, one bringing nothing to me. But beyond this, there will come in time, if I save my soul, the flesh of these bones, which bones alone I can describe and teach. I know without feeling, an odd thing is such a connection, the reality of beatitude, which is the goal of Catholic living. In hac urbe lux solenis, ver aeternum pax arenis, et aeterna godia. Yours, H.B. Morris Baring wrote, August 25th, 1922, My dear Gilbert, when I wrote to you the other day, I was still cramped by the possibility of the news not being true, although I knew it was true. I felt it was true at once. Curiously enough, I felt that it had happened before I saw the news in the newspaper at all. I felt that your ship had arrived at its port. But the more I felt this, the more unwilling I was to say anything before I heard the news from a source other than the newspapers. I gave way to an excess, a foolish excess, perhaps, of scruple. But you will, I think, understand this. In writing to you the other day, I expressed not a tenth of what I felt and feel, and that badly and inadequately. Nothing for years has given me so much joy. I have hardly ever entered a church without putting up a candle to Our Lady or to St. Joseph or to St. Anthony for you. And both this year and last year in Lent, I made a novena for you. I know of many other people, better people far than I, who did the same. Many masses were said for you in prayers all over England and Scotland in centers of holiness. I will show you someday a letter from some nuns on the subject. A great friend of mine, one of the greatest saints I have known, Sister Mary Annunciation of the Convent Orphanage, Upper Norwood, used always to pray for you. She, alas, died last year. Did I ever quote you a sentence of Bernard Holland on the subject of Ken Elm Henry Digby when the latter was received? Father Scott, who at last guided him through the narrow door, where one must bend one's head into the internal space and freedom of the eternal and universal Catholic Church. Space and freedom. That was what I experienced on being received. That is what I have been most conscious of ever since. It is the exact opposite of what the ordinary Protestant conceives to be the case. To him, and not only to him, but to the ordinary English agnostic, the convert to Catholicism is abandoning his will and his independence. Sometimes they think even his nationality. At best, they think he is sheltering himself in a walled garden. At the worst, they think he has closed on himself an iron door and shackled himself with foolish chains and sold his birthright for a crown of tinsel. And yet their own experience, the testimony of their eyes, if they would only use them, ought to suggest to them that they might perhaps be mistaken. It would be difficult for anyone to make out a case for the un-Englishness of Manning, or indeed of any prominent English Catholic, whether a born Catholic or a convert. It would be difficult for them to prove that Belloc was a writer wanting an independence. It would be difficult for them to convince anyone that Father Vaughan and Lord Fitzalan were wearing fool's caps, and anybody who has thought about history or looked on at politics must have reflected that freedom resides where there is order and not where there is license or no order. It is true in politics, it is true in art, it is the basis of our whole social life in England. Russia has just given us the most startling of object lessons. The English, with their passion for committees, their club rules, and their well-organized traffic, are daily realizing the fact, however little they may recognize the theory. Only the law can give us freedom, said Goethe, talking of art. Und das gets kann nur die Freiheit geben. Well, all I have to say, Gilbert, is that what I think I have already said to you, and what I have said not long ago in a printed book, that I was received into the church on the eve of Candlemas, 1909, and it is perhaps the only act in my life which I am quite certain I have never regretted. Every day I live, the church seems to me 
more and more wonderful, the sacraments more and more solemn in the sustaining, the voice of the church, her liturgy, her rules, her discipline, her ritual, her decisions in matters of faith and morals, more and more excellent and profoundly wise and true and right, and her children stamped with something that those outside her are without. There I have found truth and reality, and everything outside her is to me compared with her as dust and shadow. Once more, God bless you and Francis. Please give her my love, and my prayers for you, I have always added her name. Yours, Morris. It was a bit of great good fortune, although at the time he did not feel it so, that the death of the new witness in 1922, for lack of funds, left Gilbert some months of uninterrupted creative thought before GK's Weekly took its place. Lawrence Solomon, friend of his boyhood, and at this time a near neighbor, has told me not only how happy his conversion had made Gilbert, but also how it had seemed to bring him increased strength of character. Worry, he had told Morris Baring, did not worry so much as of old because of a fundamental peace. In this atmosphere were written two of his most important books, St. Francis of Assisi, published 1923, The Everlasting Man, published 1925. In a poem, he has expressed his sense of conversion as a new light that had transfigured life, indeed, of a new life given to him. After one moment, when I bowed my head, and the whole world turned over and came upright, and I came out where the old road shone white, I walked the ways and heard what all men said. They rattled reason out through many a sieve that stores the sand and lets the gold go free. And all these things are less than dust to me, because my name is Lazarus, and I live. Collected Poems, page 387, The Convert. Both books shine with that light on the white road of man's endeavor. Thrill with that light. Gilbert felt now the clue to history in his fingers, and he used it increasingly. The Everlasting Man is the orthodoxy of his later life, and one difficulty in dealing with it adequately was expressed in a letter from William Lyon Phelps, thanking the author for a magnificent work of genius and never more needed than now. I took out my pencil to mark the most important passages, but I quickly put my pencil in my pocket, for I found I had to mark every sentence. Reading the book for perhaps the seventh time, I can only say, I hope without irreverence, that G.K. himself says happens to those who can read the words of the gospel simply enough. They will feel as if rocks had been rolled upon them. Criticism is only words about words, and of what use are words about such words as these? Rocks rolled upon them. Did he not feel crushed, overwhelmed at times by his own thought on these immensities? Or can the philosopher carry his thoughts as lightly as Gilbert so often seemed to carry his? I think not always. He must have needed superhuman strength to conceive and give birth to this mighty book. The thoughts sketched in the New Jerusalem had grown to their full fruition in an atmosphere of meditation. It would be much easier to give an outline of the everlasting man than of orthodoxy, much harder to give an idea. For orthodoxy consists of a hundred brilliant arguments, while the everlasting man really is a vision of history supported by a historical outline. Comparing his own effort with that of H.G. Wells, Chesterton says, I do not believe that the best way to produce an outline of history is to rub out the lines. He is, like Wells, however, in not being a specialist, but claiming the right of the amateur to do his best with the facts the specialists provide. Only their specialists are different specialists, and their facts, therefore, largely different facts. Chesterton, unlike most converts, wrote concerning his own conversion the least interesting of his later books, but in The Everlasting Man he is not at all concerned with his own spiritual wayfaring. He merely wants to make everyone else look at what he has come to see at the end of the way. The book is an attempt to get outside man and thus see him as the strange being he really is. To get outside Christianity and see for the first time its uniqueness among the religions of the world. Why are not all men aware of the uniqueness of man among the animals and the uniqueness of the church among religions? Because they do not really look at either. 
Familiarity has dulled the edge of awareness. Men must be made to see them as though for the first time. And it is the towering achievement of this book that reading it, we do so see them. I desire to help the reader to seek Christendom from the outside in the sense of seeing it as a whole against the background of other historic things, just as I desire him to see humanity as a whole against the background of natural things. And I say that in both cases, when seen thus, they stand out from their background like supernatural things. This being his desire, he divides the book into two parts, first being the main adventure of the human race insofar as it remained heathen, and the second, a summary of the real difference that was made by it becoming Christian. Notable as the first part is, it is only a preparation for the second, which shows the church not as one religion among many, but as the only religion, for it is the only thing that binds into one both philosophy or thought and mythology or poetry, giving us a Logos who he is also the hero of the strangest story in the world. He asks the man who talks of reading the Gospels really to read them as he might read his daily paper, and to feel the terrific shock of the words of Christ to the Pharisees or the behavior of Christ to the money changers, to look at the uniqueness of the church that has died so often, but like her founder, risen again from the dead. Two untrue things he felt were constantly reiterated about the gospel. One that the church had overlaid and made difficult a plain and simple story. The other that the hero of this story was merely human and taught a morality suitable to his own age, inapplicable in our or more complicated society. To anyone who really read the gospels, the instant impression would be rather that they were full of dark riddles which only historic Christianity has clarified. The eunuchs of the heavenly kingdom would be an idea dark and terrible, but for the historic beauty of Catholic virginity, the ideal of man and woman in one flesh, inseparable and sanctified by the sacrament, became clear in the lives of the great married saints of Christendom. The apparent idealization of idleness above service in the story of Mary and Martha was lit up by the sight of Catherine and Claire and Teresa shining above the little home at Bethany. The meek inheriting the earth became the basis of a new social order when the mystical monks reclaimed the lands that the practical kings had lost. Thus, if the gospel was a riddle, the church was the answer to the riddle because both were created by one who knew, who saw the ages in which his own creation was to find completion whose morality was not one of another age, but of another world. Chesterton gathered history in his mind and saw together before the Christmas crib the shepherds who had found their shepherd and the philosopher kings who would stand for the same human ideal if their names had really been Confucius or Pythagoras or Plato. They were those who sought not tales, but the truth of things. And since their thirst for truth was itself a thirst for God, they also have had their reward. But even in order to understand that reward, we must understand that for philosophy, as much as mythology, that reward was the completion of the incomplete. From the Everlasting Man, page 211. GK2 had needed the completion of incomplete human thought. He too had followed the star from a far country, it had been a fancy of his boyhood, caught from a fairy tale that evil lurks somewhere in a hidden room of the human house and the human heart. He saw in the history of the ancients a consciousness of the fall, in the sadness of their songs, a sense of the presence of the absence of God. But at Bethlehem, he saw the transformation that had come upon the whole race of man with that little local infancy concealing the mighty power of God who had put himself under the feet of the world. It is rather as if a man had found an inner room in the very heart of his own house, which he had never suspected and seen a light from within. It is as if he found something at the back of his own heart that betrayed him into good. It is not made of what the world would call strong materials, or rather it is made of materials whose strength is in the winged levity with which they brush us and pass. It is all that is in us but a brief tenderness that is there made eternal 
All that means no more than a monetary softening that is, in some strange fashion, become a strengthening and a repose. It is the broken speech and the lost word that are made positive and suspended unbroken. As the strange kings fade into a far country and the mountains resound no more with the feet of the shepherds, and only the night and the cavern lie in fold upon fold over something more human than humanity. Also from The Everlasting Man, page 223. It seems to me profoundly significant that Gilbert studied first in the little poor man of Assisi what Christ could do in one man before he came on to the study of what he had done in mankind as a whole, of who he was who had done it. For the man thus chosen embodied the ideals that Gilbert had seen dimly in his boyhood, ideals that most of us accept a little reluctantly from the church, but which had actually attracted him towards the church. St. Francis had found the secret of life in being a servant and the secondary figure. He seems to have liked everybody, but especially those whom everybody disliked him for liking. By nature, he was the sort of man who has the vanity which is the opposite of pride, that vanity which is very near to humility. He never despised his fellow creatures, and therefore he never despised the opinion of his fellow creatures, including the admiration of his fellow creatures. He was, above all things, a great giver, and he cared chiefly for the best kind of giving, which is called thanksgiving. If another great man wrote a grammar of assent, he may well be said to have written a grammar of acceptance, a grammar of gratitude. He understood down to its very depths the theory of thanks, and its depths are a bottomless abyss. Here in St. Francis, Gilbert saw the apotheosis of his old boyish thought, that thanksgiving is a duty and a joy, and that we should love not humanity, but each human. Things shadowed in the notebook are in St. Francis. For the transition from the good man to the saint is a sort of revolution, by which one for whom all things illustrate and illuminate God becomes one for whom God illustrates and illuminates all things. It is rather like the reversal, whereby a lover might say at first sight, the lady looked like a flower, and say afterwards that all flowers reminded him of his lady. A saint and a poet standing by the same flower might seem to say the same thing. But indeed, though they both would be telling the truth, they would be telling different truths. For one, the joy of life is a cause of faith, for the other, rather, a result of faith. From St. Francis of Assisi, page 111. The Everlasting Man and the St. Francis seem to me the highest expression of Gilbert's mysticism. I have hesitated to use the word, for it is not one to be used lightly, but I can find no other. Like most Catholics, I have been wont to believe that to be a mystic, a man must first be an ascetic, and Gilbert was not an ascetic in the ordinary sense. But is there not for the thinker an asceticism of the mind, very searching, very purifying? In his youth, he had told Bentley that creative writing was the hardest of hard labor. That sense of the pressure of thought that made Newman call creative writing getting rid of pain by pain. The profound depression that often follows, the exhaustion that seems like a bottomless pit. St. Theresa said the hardest penance was easier than mental prayer. Was not much of Gilbert's thought or contemplation? Faith, thanksgiving, love, surely these, far above bodily asceticism, can so clear a man's eyesight that he may fittingly be called a mystic, since he sees God everywhere. The less a man thinks of himself, the more he thinks of his good luck and of all the gifts of God. Only a poet who was more than a poet could see so clearly of what like St. Francis was. When we say that a poet praises the whole creation, we commonly mean only that he praises the whole cosmos. But this sort of poet does really praise creation in the sense of the act of creation. He praises the passage or transition from non-entity to entity. There falls here also the shadow of that archetypal image of the bridge, which is given to the priest his archaic and mysterious name. The mystic who passes through the moment when there is nothing but God does, in some sense, behold the beginningless beginnings in which there was really nothing else not only appreciates everything, but the nothing of which everything is made. In a fashion, he endures and answers even the earthquake irony of the book of Job. In some sense, he is there when the foundations of the world are laid. 
with the morning stars singing together and the sons of God shouting for joy. From St. Francis of Assisi, pages 112 to 113. But there was in all those years another element besides the giving of thanks and the joy of creation, an abiding grief for the sorrows of the sons of men and especially those of his own land. In this mood, the Cobbett was written. Nine years separate the publication of William Cobbett from that of the history of England. Written at the time when Englishmen were fighting so magnificently, that book had radiated G.K.'s own mood of hope. But to read Rural Rides, to meditate on Cobbett's England, and then turn to the England of the hour was not cheerful. For Cobbett did not draw precise diagrams of things as they were, he only had frantic and fantastic nightmares of things as they are. And these nightmares haunted Cobbett's biography, from Cobbett, page 22. What he saw was not an Eden that cannot exist, but rather an inferno that can exist, and even that does not exist. What he saw was the perishing of the whole English power of self-support, the growth of cities that drain and dry up the countryside, the growth of dense, dependent populations incapable of finding their own food, the toppling triumph of machines over men, the sprawling omnipotence of financiers over patriots, the herding of humanity and nomadic masses whose very homes are homeless, the terrible necessity of peace and the terrible probability of war, all the loading up of our little island like a sinking ship, the wealth that may mean famine and the culture that may mean despair, the bread of Midas and the sword of Damocles. In a word, he saw what we see, but he saw it when it was not there. And some cannot see it even when it is there. Also from Cobbett, pages 14 and 15. Two men had written of the Reformation as the ultimate origin of these evils at a time when it was still the fashion to treat it as the dawn of all good. Lingard, himself a Catholic, had written cautiously with careful documentation and moderate tone. Cobbett, a Protestant, had written hastily and furiously, but both men had drawn in essentials the same picture. Chesterton suspected that Cobbett was treated with contempt, Lingard with respect, largely because of the difference in the tone of the two men. Lingard spoke restrainedly, but Cobbett's voice was raised in a loud cry. He was simply a man who had discovered a crime, ancient like many crimes, concealed like all crimes. He was, as one, who had found in a dark wood the bones of his mother and suddenly knew she had been murdered. He knew now that England had been secretly slain. Some, he would say, might think it a matter of mild regret to be expressed in murmurs. But he found a corpse, gave a shout, and if fools laughed at anyone shouting, he would shout the more, till the world should be shaken with that terrible cry in the night. It is that ringing and arresting cry of murder, wrung from him as he stumbled over those bones of the dead England, that distinguishes him from all his contemporaries. Also from Cobbett, pages 176 and 177. Yet for the Christian, hope remains. No murder can be the end. Christianity has died many times and risen again, for it had a God who knew the way out of the grave. This quotation is from the chapter called Five Deaths of the Faith in the Everlasting Man. Several times in the book, Chesterton puts aside tempting lines of thought with a remark that he intends to develop them later in one of the unwritten books that he always felt were so much better than those he actually wrote. Would any human life have been long enough to develop them all? Anyhow, even the whole of this life was not available. As I turn to the story of the weekly paper rising again from its ashes, I ask myself the question I have often asked. Was it worthwhile? I cannot answer the question. Something of his manhood seemed to Gilbert bound up with this struggle. And it may be he would have been a lesser man had he abandoned it. And yet... At moments, imagining the poetry, the philosophy that might have been ours, another white horse, or another everlasting man, I am tempted to wish that these years had not thus been sacrificed to the paper which enshrined his brother's memory. Chapter 25, Part 1. The Reluctant Editor, 1925 to 1930. I tell you not for your comfort, yea, not for your desire, 
save that the sky glows darker yet and the sea rises higher. From the Ballad of the White Horse. Could Gilbert have divided his life between literary work, his home at Top Meadow, and those other elements called in the autobiography friendship and foolery? That life might well have been, as he himself called it, indefensibly fortunate and happy. But he could not. Part of his philosophy of joy was that thanks must be given for sunsets, for dandelions, for beech trees, for home and friends. And this thanks could only be the taking of his part in the fight. He would never, he once said, have turned of his own accord to politics. It is arguable that it would have been better if he never had. But his brother had plunged into the fray with that very political paper, The New Witness, and his brother's death had left it in Gilbert's hands. He felt the task to be a sacred legacy, and when the paper died for lack of funds, his one thought was how to start it again. For many months, he kept the office in being and paid salaries to a skeleton staff, consisting of Mr. Gander, a deaf old manager, Miss Dunham, now Mrs. Phillips, and an office boy. Mr. Titterton would stroll in and play cricket with the office boy with a paper ball and a walking stick. Endless discussions were held as to how to restart the paper, and whether under the old name or a new one. Bernard Shaw had his own view. He wrote, 11th of February, 1923, My dear Chesterton, not presumed to dictate, I have all Jingle's delicacy, but if everybody else is advising you, why should not I? TP's Weekly always had a weekly sound, but it established itself sufficiently to make that form of title the trademark of a certain sort of paper. Hence, Jack o London's Weekly, it also set the trade sheet running that way. You have the precedence of Defoe and Cobbett for using your own name, but DD's Weekly is unthinkable and WC's Weekly indecent. Your initials are not euphonious. They recall that brainy song of my boyhood, Up PD, GKC, KC, KC, GKC, 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 KC, KC, GKC, KC. Chesterton is a noble name. Chesterton is weekly, spoils it. Call it simply Chesterton's. That is how it will be asked for at the bookstalls. You may be obliged to call later ventures Chesterton's Daily or Chesterton's Annual, but this one needs no impertinently superfluous definition. Chesterton's Perennial is amusing enough to be excusable, but a joke repeated every week is no joke. A picture cover like that of Punch might stand even that test, if it were good enough. But where are you to find your Doyle? Weak is a detestable, sniveling word. Nothing can redeem it, not even the Sermon on the Mount. Seven days is better, but reminds one of the police court, as well as of the creation. Every seven days would sound well. But Chesterton's leaves no room for anything else. I am more than unusually sure that I am right. Frances quite agrees with me. How would you like it if she were to publish a magazine and call it Fanny's First Paper? Ever GBS. If Gilbert answered this letter, his answer has disappeared. He seems to have asked permission to publish it, probably with a view to collecting further opinions. 10 Adelphi Terrace, London, WC2, February 16, 1923. My dear GKC, of course, you may publish any letter of mine that you care to, at your discretion. But not only will the publication of a letter from me not add one to your circulation, nothing but a permanent feature will do that. But it may lead you to disregard the advice I give to all the people who start labor papers, about two a week or so, which always is, don't open with an article to say that your paper supplies a want. Don't blight your columns with messages. Don't bewilder your readers with the family jokes of your clique, else there will be no second number. Ponder this, it is sound. Your main difficulty is that the class whose champion you have made yourself reads either Lloyd's or nothing. To the rural proprietor, no longer a peasant, art, including Bellette, is immorality, and people who idealize peasants 
unpractical fools. Also, the Roman Catholic Church, embarrassed by recruits of your type and born scoffers like Belloc who cling to the church because its desecration would take all the salt out of blasphemy, will quietly put you on the unofficial index. The Irish will not support an English journal because it occasionally waves a green flag far better than they can wave it themselves. And the number of Jews who will buy you just to see what you say about them is not large enough to keep you going. Thus, there is absolutely no public for your policy. And though there is a select one for yourself, one and indivisible, it is largely composed of people to whom your oddly assorted antipathies and pseudo-racial feuds are uncongenial. Besides, on these fancies of yours, you have by this time said all you have to say so many thousand times over that your most faithful admirers finally and always suddenly discover they are fed up with the new witness and cannot go on with it. This last danger becomes greater as you become older because when we are young, we can tell ourselves a new story every night between our prayers and our sleep. But later on, we find ourselves repeating the same story with intensifications and improvements night after night until we are tired of it. And in the end, which you have not yet reached, a story revived from the old repertory has to last for months and is more and more shaky as a protection against thinking of business or lying there a prey to unwelcome reminiscences. And what happens to the story of the imaginative child happens also to the sermon or to the feuilleton of the adult. It is inevitably happening to you. That is the case against the success of Chesterton's. Your only chance, finally, is either to broaden your basis or to have no basis at all, like Dickens in Household Words and All the Year Round, and say, Give me something with imagination in it, and I can do without politics or a theoretic sociology of any kind. This is perhaps the only true Catholicism in literature, but it will hardly serve your turn, because all the articles and stories that Dickens got are now mopped up by the popular press, which in his day stuck to politics and news and nothing else. So I am afraid you will have to stand for policy or at least a recognizable attitude, unless you are prepared to write a detective story every week and make Bellick write a satirical story as well. You could broaden your basis if you had money enough to try the experiment of giving 10 poor but honest men in Beaconsfield and 10 more in London capital enough to start for themselves as independent farmers and shopkeepers. The result would be to ruin 18 out of the 20 and possibly to ruin the lot you would then learn from your feelings what you would never learn from me, that what men need is not property, but honorable service. Confronted either with 20 men ruined by your act, or 18 ruined, and one fascination fledgeby owning half a street in London and the other half a parish in Bucks, you would, well, perhaps join the Fabian Society. The pseudo-race feuds you should drop simply because you cannot compete with the Morning Post, which gives the real thing its succulent savagery, whilst you can give only a wouldn't hurt a fly affectation to it. In religion, too, you are up against the fact that an editor, like an emperor, must not belong to a sect. Wells is on the right tack, my tack. See my prefaces to Androcles and Methuselah. We want the real Catholic Church above the manufactured one. The manufactured one is useful, as the Salvation Army is useful, or the formulas of the Church of Christ Scientists, but they do not strike on the knowledge box of the modern intellectual. It is on the modern intellectual that you are depending. I am an Irishman and know how far the official Catholic Church can go. Your ideal church does not exist and never can exist within the official organization in which Father Dempsey will always be efficient and Father Keegan futile, if not actually silenced. And I know that an officially Catholic Chesterton is an impossibility. However, you must find out all this for yourself as I found it out for myself. Your controversy is waste of time, and faith is a curious thing. 
I believe that you would not have become a professed official Catholic if you did not believe that you believe in transubstantiation. But I find it quite impossible to believe that you believe in transubstantiation any more than, say, Dr. Salabi does. You will have to go to confession next Easter. And I find the spectacle, the box, your portly kneeling figure, the poor devil inside, wishing you would become a fire worshiper instead of coming there to shake your soul for the sense of his ridiculousness and yours. All incredible, monstrous comic, though of course I can put a perfect literary complexion on it in a brace of shakes. Now, however, I am becoming personal. How else can I be sincere? Besides, I'm going on too long and the lunch bell is ringing, so forgive me and don't bother to answer unless you cannot help it. Ever, G. Bernard Shaw. Meanwhile, Shaw, as usual, responded cordially to Gilbert's wish to make him an early attraction in the paper, but also, as usual, urged him towards the theater. 10th of December, 1924. By all means, send me a screed about Joan of Art for the cockpit, but I protest I have no views about her. I am only the first man modest enough to know his place, Oprah Dowd, as a simple reporter and old stagehand. You should write plays instead of editing papers. Why not do George Fox, who was released from the prisons in which Protestant England was doing its best to murder him by the Catholic Charles II. George and Joan were as like as two peas in pluck and obstinacy. GBS. The specimen advance number was published before the end of 1924. In the leading article, G.K. gave his reasons for agreeing finally to use his own name, although in the form attacked by Shaw. He had first viewed the proposal with a horror which has since softened into loathing. He had looked for a title that should indicate the paper's policy. But while the policy was in fact a support of human normality, well-distributed property, freedom in the family, yet the surrounding atmosphere was so abnormal that any title defining our doctrine makes it look doctrinaire. A name like the Distributive Review would suggest that a distributist was like a socialist, a crank, or a pedant, with a new theory of human nature. It is so old that it has become new. At the same time, I want a title that does suggest that the paper is controversial and that this is the general trend of its controversy. I want something that will be recognized as a flag, however fantastic and ridiculous. It will be in some sense a challenge, even if the challenge be received only with genial derision. I do not want a colorless name, and the nearest I can get to something like a symbol is merely to fly my own colors. Although the paper was never exclusively Catholic, that flag was for GK, as it had been for Cecil, of a very definite pattern, very clear colors. Religiously, the paper stood for Catholic Christianity. Socially, for the theory of small ownership, personal responsibility, and property. It was in strong opposition, especially to socialism, and even more to communism. Bernard Shaw, Gilbert once said, wanted to distribute money among the poor. We want to distribute power. During the last part of Cecil's editorship, his wife had been assistant editor of The New Witness, and she had so continued when Gilbert first became editor. She was neither a Catholic nor a distributist. Religion seems not to have interested her, and her political outlook was entirely different from Gilbert's. In the Chestertons, she dismissed distributism as quite without first principles, and a pious hope and no more. Obviously, it was impossible for Gilbert to start his new paper with an assistant editor in entire disagreement with his views. I have sometimes wondered whether his intense dislike of having to tell Mrs. Cecil this was not almost as strong a factor in the delay as the money problem. I have learned, as this book goes to press, that Mrs. Cecil became a Catholic in 1941. There was no break in their relations. She went on writing for the paper, doing chiefly the dramatic criticism. But it's clear from her own account of the incident that she wholly misconstrued Gilbert's attitude and did not realize how far she herself had drifted from Cecil's views as well as from Gilbert's. Shaw wrote again, Reed's Palace Hotel, Madeira, 16th January, 1925. My dear GKC. 
The sample number has followed me out here. What a collector's treasure. Considering that I had Cecil's own assurance that my quintessence of Ibsenism rescued him from rationalism and that it was written in 1889, I abandoned rationalism consciously and explicitly in 1881, I consider John Prothero's introduction of me to your readers as a recently converted materialist rationalist to be a most unnatural act, and it would serve her right if I never spoke to her again. Rationalism is the bane of the church. A Roman priest always wants to argue with you. A Church of England parson flies in terror from an argument. A fundamentally sensible course. George Fox simply knocked arguers out with his I have experimental knowledge of God. St. Thomas Aquinas was like me. He knew the worthlessness of ratiocination because he could do it so well and yet despaired of the inspirationalists in practical life because they did it so badly. JKP doesn't know her way about in this controversy and I cannot take up her challenge. What makes me uneasy about the prospectus is that you drag in anti-prohibition. You might as well have declared for brighter London at once or said that the paper would be printed at the office of the morning advertiser. You run the risk of the money coming from the trade. However, non ole. Only remember the fate of all the editors, Gardner, Donald, Massingham, etc., etc., who have written without regard to their proprietors. The strength of your position is that they can hardly carry on with your name in the title without you. But they can kill the paper by stopping supplies if it does not pay. And the chances are that it will not. I've never had a farthing of interest on my shares in the New Statesman, and I don't expect the Rochelle. Therefore, keep your list of shareholders as various and as uncommercial as you can. Get Catholic money rather than beer money, as I am the real patentee of the distributive state, and DS is socialism, and as furthermore the church must remain at least neutral on prohibition, as in the United States, where a Catholic priest has just set a praiseworthy example of neutrality by bringing about a record cop of bootleggers. And as the success of prohibition is so overwhelming that it is bound to become a commonplace of civilization, you must regard it as at least possible that you will someday make the paper socialist and dry with a capital. Therefore, do not undertake to oppose anything. Stand for what you propose to advocate, whether as to property or drink or anything else, but don't state your solutions as antitheses. By the way, don't propose equal distribution of land. It's like equal distribution of metal. Rough on those who get the lead, and rather too jolly for those who get the gold. Your equal distribution must come to equal distribution of the national income in terms of money. The 500 pounds a year is absurd. Do you realize that it is 250 pounds at pre-war rates and subject to heavy taxation? Net 375 pounds pre-war, 182 10 You have sold yourself into slavery for 10 years for 3 pounds 10 2 a week. Are you quite mad? Make it at least 1,500 pounds plus payment for copy. Ever GBS. Of course, it was not merely a question of inadequate payment for its work. As time went on, a large part of the financial burden of the paper had to be carried by him. Lord Howard de Walden helped generously, and so did Mr. Chivers. Other donations came in, but mostly very small ones. No proper accounts were kept, no watch and how the money went, and from time to time Gilbert would pay off a printing bill of 500 pounds or so and go ahead hoping for better times. The money aspect did not worry him, I think, at first. There was always more to be made by a little extra effort, though a time was to come when every extra effort wearied him cruelly. But there was one thing he could not bear, quarrels on the board or on the staff, and above all the suggestion that he should adjudicate. He was a bad judge of men, one of his staff told me. He never shirked an intellectual issue, but in practical crisis, he was inclined to slide out. 
He could never, said another, stand up to accusations from one man against another. The first start was made with the existing staff of three. Miss Dunham was sub-editor and was usually left to see the paper through the press. G.K. would come up once or twice a week and dictate his own articles. You never knew when he was coming, she says, but you always knew when he was there by the smell of his cigar. He was practically a chain smoker. And he always used the same brand. He left drawings on the blotter and everything else. He had no idea of time. And when he said, I think I'll go out now, he might stay out for an hour or so, or he might not return at all. Lighting a cigar or cigarette, he would make a sign in the air with the match. He never omitted this ritual, and Miss Dunham thinks it became like tapping the railings, was to Dr. Johnson. He used to come in and swing about on his little feet, she said. And it is true that his feet, like his voice, seemed too small to belong to the rest of them. Her great difficulty was that she could not get him to read and select among the contributions. Too often, this was left to her, and she felt painfully inadequate to the task. For the first year, all the notes of the week were written by G.K. Then he got Mr. Titterton as assistant editor, and after that, said the assistant editor, with simplicity, you could always tell good Titterton from bad Chesterton. Everyone who worked at the office adored G.K., especially the little people. Typists, secretaries, office boys. He was so kind, Miss Dunham said. He never got angry, never minded being interrupted. If his papers blew away, he never got impatient. His patience hurt one. She had never seen him angry. That the paper was ever got out seems wonderful, as the staff recall those days. Yet I think that all the stories about Gilbert's inefficiency as editor have contributed towards an impression that I shared myself until quite lately, that G.K.'s Weekly was immeasurably inferior to the new witness. Going more carefully through the files, I have begun to question that impression. The paper was produced under certain obvious disadvantages. Even spending some days a week in London and telephoning freely, it is not easy to edit a paper from the country. Gilbert thought of himself as a bad editor and was not, in fact, a very good one. The contributions he accepted were uneven in quality. Both leaders and notes of the week, when not written by him, tended to be weak imitations of either himself or Belloc, tinged at times with an air of omniscience, tolerable in Belloc, but quite intolerable in his imitators. Just occasionally, the equally unedited notes and leader were in contradiction of each other that the paper remains an exceedingly interesting one. Analyzing my earlier and late impressions, I concluded that my earlier feeling of boredom sprang from the inevitable effect of the new witness coming first, and therefore having been read first. It is a disadvantage of consistency that, as Bernard Shaw remarked, you have said the same thing, you have told the same story so often as the years go by. Chapter 25, Part 2, The Reluctant Editor, 1925-1930. Taking the rest of a year and returning fresh to G.K.'s Weekly, I was surprised at finding how much I enjoyed reading it, and also at finding that it had been of more practical use than I remembered to the cause it served. The trend of the whole world is to make the state powerful and the family powerless. It was something that in these years, G.K.'s Weekly should have helped to smash two bills of this nature, the Mental Deficiency and the Canal Children's Bills. Both these aimed at taking children from their parents, the first in the cause of health, the second of education. Against both, Gilbert wrote brilliantly and successfully. G.K.'s Weekly has much more G.K. in it and quite as much Belloc as in the earlier years of The New Witness. Eric Gale, too, a long friend of the Chestertons, became the chief contributor on art. In 1925, he spent a night at Top Meadow to discuss the policy of the paper, especially with reference to industrialism in art. A little later, the Gills moved from Wales, much nearer to Beaconsfield, and the two men met fairly often. Gills' letters are interesting. They are mostly before the visit to Beaconsfield and probably led to it. He begins by attacking Gilbert for one, supporting Orpanism against Byzantinism, and two, thinking that the art of the painting began with Giotto, whereas Giotto was really much more the end. 
In June 1925, G.K. was asking him to write about Epstein. Gill agreed to do so, but insisted that Chesterton and Bellick must not disagree with him, but accept my doctrine as the doctrine of G.K.'s weekly in matters of art, just as I accept yours in other matters. I don't intend to write for you as an outsider. Have I not put almost my last quid into your blooming company? 7% or not? God forbid that you should have an art critic who will go around the picture shows for you and write bilge about this painter and that and this art movement and that. In the first state of effervescence, the labor he delighted in quite deadened the pain of the editor's chair. Gilbert was prepared, if necessary, to write the whole paper and to treat it as a variant on the toy theater or the sword stick. It was said that the Chicago pork machine used every part of a pig except the squeal. It might be said that the Fleet Street press machine uses only the squeal. In short, nobody reading the newspapers could form the faintest notion of how intelligent we newspaper people are. The whole machine is made to chop up each mind into meaningless fragments and waste the vast mass even of those. Such a thing as one complete human being appearing in the press is almost unknown, and when an attempt is made at it, it necessarily has a certain air of eccentric egotism. That is a risk which I am obliged to run everywhere in this paper and especially on this page. As I have said, the whole business of actually putting a paper together is a new game for me to play, to amuse my second childhood. And it combines some of the characters of the jigsaw and a crossword puzzle. But at least I am called upon to do a great many different sorts of things and am not tied down to that trivial specialism of the proletarian press. March 28, 1925. And again, this paper exists to insist on the rights of man, on possessions that are of much more political importance than the principle of one man, one vote. I am in favor of one man, one house, one man, one field. Nay, I have even advanced the paradox of one man, one wife. But I am almost tempted to add the more ideal fancy of one man, one magazine, to say that every citizen ought to have a weekly paper of this sort to splash about in, this kind of scrapbook to keep him quiet. April 4th, 1925. G.K. goes on to talk about an old idea of his. That is, a young journalist should write one article for the Church Times and another for Pinkhunt, and then put them into the wrong envelopes. It is that sort of contrast and that sort of combination that I am going to aim at in this paper. I cannot see why convictions should look dull, or why jokes should be insincere. I should like a man to pick up this paper for amusement and find himself involved in an argument. I should like him to pursue it purely for the sake of argument and find himself pulled up short by a joke. I never can see why a thing should not be both popular and serious, that is, in the sense of being both popular and sincere. For the paper had a most serious purpose. He acknowledged its defects of bad printing, which the printers indignantly denied, bad proofreading, bad editing, and claimed to raise against the banner of advertisement the noble banner of apology because a creative revolution was what he wanted. Words and forms were hard to find. It was easy to dress up stale ideas in a new dress, but the terminology for something outside the old hack party programs had to be fresh minted. He proposed various changes after a few months running and introduced them thus. We should be only too glad if for this week only, our readers would have the tact to retire and leave us alone. We are in the Hegelian condition, a condition not so much of being as of becoming, and no generous person would spy on an unfortunate fellow creature who is going through the horrible and degrading experience of being a Hegelian. It is even more embarrassing than being caught in the very act of evolution, which every clear-headed person would desire to avoid. December 12, 1925. In this number, he began The Return of Don Quixote, and also a sort of scrapbook. He invited contributions dealing with every sort of approach to distributism, and promised more than one series of constructive proposals and definite schemes of legislation. We do not promise that all these schemes will exactly agree with each other, or that we shall agree with all of them. Some will be more conservative, some more drastic than our own view. This article ends with an ambitious note. 
very varying schemes will be admitted, but the idea of the paper will thereby be strengthened, not destroyed. For what we desire is not a paltry party program, but a renaissance. It was not the first time that he had demanded a revolution, but as the depression hit our country and big business seemed less and less capable of coping with it, the demand became more understandable and the fight against monopoly more urgent. A thinking man should always attack the strongest thing in his own time, for the strongest thing of the time is always too strong. The great outstanding fact and feature of our time is monopoly. April 25, 1925. I've already referred to a debate on monopoly between Chesterton and Mr. Gordon Selfridge, in which Selfridge, with the familiar unreality of the millionaire, maintained that there was no such thing. Anyone was free to open a store in rivalry of Selfridge's or to start a paper that should eclipse the Daily Mail. The only real monopoly, he added gracefully, was that of a genius like Chesterton, whose work the ordinary man could not emulate. The graceful compliment Chesterton answered by offering to share his last epigram with Mr. Selfridge. But as to the main contention, what could he say? It was at once too easy and absolutely impossible to answer such a speech, or more truly such a speaker. Only in a country of the blind could he have won a hearing. But Chesterton persevered. Even in 1924, the shadow of large-scale unemployment had begun. That this singularly inappropriate time came the Empire Exhibition at Wembley. In the failure of its appeal, Chesterton saw hope, for he believed that from a frank facing of truth his country might yet conquer the coming perils. That was the real weakness of Wembley, that it so completely mistook the English temperament as to appeal to a stale mood. It appealed to a stale mood of success, but we need to appeal to a new and more noble mood of failure or at least peril. The English no longer care to be told of an empire on which the sun never sets. Tell them that the sun is setting, and they will fight through the battle, go against them to the going down of the sun, if they do not stay it, like Joshua. We seriously propose that England should take her stand among the unhappy nations. It is too dismal a fate to go on being the happy ones. We must be as proud as Spain and Poland and Serbia, nations made more dear to their lovers by their disasters. Our disasters have begun, but they do not seem to have endeared us to anybody in particular. Our sorrow has come, but we gain no extra loyalty by it. The time has come to claim our crown of thorns, or at least not to cover it any longer with such exceedingly faded flowers. March 21st, 1925. Always Chesterton was haunted by the present war. He had seen the Prussian peril conquered. He saw it rising again. Even before the advent of Hitler, he knew that the tribe, which had stolen from Austria and Denmark, had invaded France and crushed Poland, was without repentance. He feared that again the stupidity, or the greed behind English and American policy, was giving it another opportunity. Those sturdy Teutons, he wrote ironically, from whom we were descended up to the outbreak of the Great War, and from whom we are now showing signs of being descended again. The misfortune was that Englishmen had ceased to try to get free from a secret government conducted by we know not whom and achieving we know not what. The real national life of our country is unconscious of its own national policy. The right hand of the Englishman, who holds the plow or the sword, knows not what his left hand doth with the pen and the checkbook. Man is man, and Monde is master of his fate. For our government he apologized to France. He saw it as one in the same fight, against the heathenish money power and heathen Prussia, and the beating of the dark wings of enemy airplanes sounded in his dreams. As early as 1925, he wrote a Christmas play of St. George and the Dragon, in which the Turkish knight embodied his vision of Prussia and St. George spoke prophetically for England, St. George. I know that this is sure, whatever man can do, man can endure. Though you shall lose all laws of fight and fashion, a torture chamber from a tilting yard, though iron hard as doom grow hot as passion, man shall be hotter and shall be more hard. And when an army in your hellfire faints, you shall find martyrs who were never saints.
They wound each other and the doctor comes to help the Turkish knight, princess. Why should we patch this pirate up again? Why should you always win and win in vain? Bid him not cut the leg, but cut the loss. St. George. I will not fire upon my own red cross. Princess. If you lay there, would he let you escape? St. George. I am his conqueror and not his ape. Doctor. Be not so sure of conquering. He shall rise on lighter feet, on feet that vault the skies. Science shall make a mighty foot and new, light as the feather feet of Perseus flew. Long as the seven league boots in tails gone by, he shall bestride the sea and ride the sky. Thus shall he fly and beat above your nation, the flashing pinions of apocalypse. Ye shall be deep sea fish in pale prostration under the sky foam of his flying ships. When terror above your cities, dropping doom, shall shut all England in a lampless tomb. Your widows and your orphans, now forlorn, shall be no safer than the dead they mourn. When all their lights grow dark, their lives grow gray, what will those widows and those orphans say? St. George, St. George for Merry England. He saw the airplanes in vision, and he saw courage and patriotism. I think he must rejoice today that betrayal of the Allied cause has not been at the hands of an Englishman. He had said many hard things about the English aristocracy and gentry, but these two virtues he had always granted were theirs. And in his vision, he saw hope. England may soon be poor enough to be praised with an undivided heart. We are not sure that the ruins of Wembley may not be the restoration of Westminster. It is when a nation has recovered from the illusion of owning everything that it discovers that it does not stand for something. And for that something, it will fight with a lucid and just tenacity which no mere megalomania can comprehend. We are not so perverse as to wish to see England ruined, that she may be respected. But we do think she will be happy in having the sort of respect that could remain even if she were ruined. Patriotic as the English have always been, the patriotism of their educated class has seldom had this peculiar sort of extra energy that is given by a conscience completely at rest. If that were added, they might well make such a stand as would astound the world. All their other virtues, their humor and sporting spirit and freedom, from the morbidities and cruelties of fatigue might enter into their full heritage when joined to the integrity and intellectual dignity that belong to self-defense and self-respect. We are far from sure that the world has not yet to see our nation in its finest phase. What may be in the womb of night, we know not. What are those dim outlines that show on the horizon? In truth, he wrote, no man knows how near we are to death or to dawn. I'm not sure whether I'm making this speech from a scaffolding or a scaffold. It's easy for the young to undertake hard things. They never know how hard they are, and they are certain of success. The lessons of experience signify to the young that other men have failed. Their own experience shall teach others the meaning of success. But to begin again at 50, with the special spring of youth gone, and with the sad lessons of one's own experience in the mind, this calls indeed for a rare courage. Gilbert knew all the cost and time, energy, money, and reputation that he would have to pay, but he did pay, and he stood increasingly alone. Cecil's had been the irreparable loss, and others of the old circle were dropping out and their places were not filled. Jack Fillmore's death in 1926 was a heavy blow. To his memory, Gilbert dedicated the Queen of Seven Swords, published the year of his death. You go before me on all roads, on bridges broad enough to spread, between the learned and the dunce, between the living and the dead. The gulf between the socialist group and the distributist had become far more obvious than of yore. Shaw and Wells would still write for GK, but only because he was their friend. And if F.Y. Eccles or Desmond McCarthy today contributed, it would, too, be chiefly from affection for Gilbert. One article by Mr. McCarthy described the old days when the original eyewitness was in being, and he, Cecil, and Belloc sat around the table editing it and sticking triolets thrown off in hot haste into those nasty little spaces left by articles that did not quite fit, or supplying three or four articles 
in a ballad or bane while the printers waited. We have to print a triolette. When space is clamoring for matter, we try to put it off, and yet we have to print a triolette. It is with infinite regret that we admit the silly patter. We have to print a triolette when space is clamoring for matter. Such joyous scrambles are proper to youth, and now none of them were young. All authors worthy of the name have found their platform and made permanent engagements by middle life. Professional men are absorbed by work and life. They simply had not time to give as of yore to build up this new old venture. The names of Shaw and Wells continue to appear among the contributors, often enough in a religious debate. Reading the files and visiting the two men to talk of Gilbert, I made one discovery that is curious from whichever side you look at. Two able and indeed brilliant men betrayed not only an amazing degree of ignorance concerning the tenets of Catholicism, but also a bland conviction that they knew them well. Wells, in conversation, based his claim on the fact that he had long been intimately acquainted with an ex-nun. Shaw, I fancy, felt he must know all about something that had surrounded him in infancy. For as the reader must have noticed, he is much preoccupied by the thought of his Irish descent and education. But what seems to me even stranger about the situation is the absence on the Catholic side of any effort to explain to these men the doctrines they misconstrued. When Wells, for instance, gave a crude and inaccurate statement of the doctrine of the fall, Bellick laughed at him. Chesterton and Father McNabb both wrote long and picturesque articles illuminating to a believer, but as instruction to an unbeliever, quite useless. The correspondence that seemed like to drag on forever ended abruptly with Wells asking about the fall. Tell me, did it really happen? To which Chesterton briefly replied, yes. I imagine he thought that he and the other writers had said this several times already, but in fact they had not. Perhaps they did not realize where the beginning must be made in instructing otherwise instructed men on the subject of Catholicism. It is all very interesting and curious, but it largely explains why Bernard Shaw found it hard to believe that Gilbert believed in transubstantiation. Has any Catholic ever explained the philosophic meaning of transubstantiation to the great old Irish man of English letters? Even Gilbert was perhaps too much inclined simply to play the fool in high-spirited fashion with those who attacked the faith in his paper or other papers. But then, how well he played it. Here are some imaginary interviews on the recently discovered traces of an actual historical flood, a discovery which has shaken the Christian world to its foundations by its apparent agreement with the book of Genesis. The Dean of St. Paul's remarked, I do not see that there is any cause for alarm. Protestantism is still founded on an impregnable rock, on that deep and strong foundation of disbelief in the Bible, which supports the spiritual and intellectual life of all true Christians today. Even if dark doubts should arise, and it should seem for the moment as if certain passages in the scripture story were true, we must not lose heart. The cloud will pass, but we have still the priceless possession of the open Bible, with all its inexhaustible supply of errors and inconsistencies. A continual source of interest to scholars, and a permanent bulwark against Rome. Mr. H.G. Wells exclaimed, I'm interested in the flood of the future not in any of these local floods that may have taken place in the past. I want a broader, larger, more complete and coordinated sort of flood, a flood that will really cover the whole ground. I want to get people to understand that in the future we shall not divide water in this petty way into potty little ponds and lakes and rivers. It will be one big satisfying thing, the same everywhere, a primois le deluge. Bellic, in his boorish, boozy way, may question my knowledge of French. I fancy that quotation will settle it. March 30th, 1929. On the favorite topic of modern advertisement, having read an essay which said that good salesmanship made everything in the garden beautiful, Gilbert again thought of Genesis. There's only one actor in that ancient drama that seems to have had any real talent for salesmanship. He seems to have undertaken to deliver the goods with exactly the right preliminaries of promises and praise. He knew all about advertisement. You may say he knew all about publicity, though not at the moment addressing a very large public. He not only took up the slogan, eat more fruit, but he distinctly declared that any customers purchasing this particular brand of fruit would instantly become as gods. 
And as this is exactly what is promised to the purchasers of every patent medicine, popular tonic, saline draft, or medicinal wine at the present day, there can be no question that he was in advance of his age. It is extraordinary that humanity, which began with the apple and ended with the patent medicine, has not yet become exactly like God's. It is still more extraordinary, and probably the result of a malicious interpolation by priests at a later date, that the record ends with some extraordinary remarks to the effect that one thus pursuing the bright career of salesmanship is condemned to crawl in his stomach and eat a great deal of dirt. March 23, 1929. The relation between Belloc and the paper, as between Belloc and Gilbert himself, was a unique one. Not indeed its online begetter, it was equally with Cecil begetter of the original paper and its first editor. He was Gilbert's chief guide in the historical and political scene of Europe. Both men had shared, had fought all their lives for, their ideas of freedom, the family, restoration of property, and all that is involved in Catholic Christianity. And Belloc said repeatedly that he had no platform for the continuous expression of these ideas. Such books as his Cruise of the Nona still found a wide public, as had the path to Rome a quarter century earlier. And in those books his philosophy may be read. But he had, too, urgent commentaries on foreign affairs and current policies, and for these GK's Weekly became his platform as completely as the new witness had been in the past. To Gilbert, this appeared one chief value of the paper. In an article from which I quote in the next chapter, he gives it as one of the two reasons for which he toiled to keep GK's weekly in existence. Week by week, Belloc on current and foreign affairs wrote of what was happening and would, would presently come of it. And who can say, reading those articles today, that it would not have changed the defeats of this war into victory at a far earlier date had our statesmen read or heeded the analysis of instance of the peril of the aeroplane, of the threat of the empire from Japan, the importance of keeping Italy's friendship in the Mediterranean, the growing strength of Germany, and the awful risk we took in allowing her to rearm and failing to arm against her. Whether he was right or, as many held, wildly wrong about what underlay our failures of judgment, his views must be briefly traced because of their effect on Gilbert and others. In the financial world, he saw England in the first years after the war dominated by the international banking power, which made us, as it were, a local branch of Wall Street. In his view, it was the bankers both of America and England who first insisted that Germany could not pay her reparations, and later made England repudiate her own war debts to America, though she had, he showed, already paid in interest and principal more than half of what she had been lent. The banks did this because they had lent commercially both to Germany and England sums whose safety meant more to them than monies merely owing to the nations, which would not benefit the banks. England thus became subservient to the United States and had to follow American financial policies. It was these policies that led to the abandonment of the unwritten alliance with France, and especially to allowing Germany to rearm, helped by loans from these same banks to reoccupy the Rhineland and remilitarize the Ruhr. Next in Belloc's view came a worse stage, yet in which the banks had given place to big business, which was increasingly controlling Parliament. The plutocracy that had bit by bit eaten into our aristocracy and gained ascendancy in the government was not, like our ancient aristocracy, trained for business and was utterly uninformed, especially in foreign affairs. The one remaining hope Permanent officials, especially the Foreign Office, were less and less listened to. Laterally, he held too that even the Foreign Office had lost its old, sure touch. Hence, a constant vacillation in our policies, which weakened England's position and made certain some terrible disaster. This fear is ever present in Belloc's articles and ever brooded on by the editor. He rallied his forces to urge, week after week, the possible alternative to disaster the recovery by the people of England of power and freedom, the restoration of England to its place in a restored Europe, freed from the German menace. Despite the natural high spirits, a certain gloom and more than a touch of fierceness marked the work of these years. Summing up the 20s of the century, Chesterton saw them as singularly bankrupt spiritually and intellectually, and he foresaw from their sowing a miserable harvest.
Thank you. 